So COVID infection is known to cause reactive arthritis. And upon a literature review, I could find around 22 case reports in a case series. So the median age of onset of uh, infection was uh, 50 years. Age ranged from 21 to 73 years. And the male to female ratio was 3 years to 2. The median time to onset of infection was 18 days, ranging from 7 to 90 days after contracting the infection. So in this case series, about 10 patients presented with monoarthritis, knee joint and ankle joint being the predominant single joints involved, and five patients presented with oligoarthritis, other five patients had polyarthritis. In this case series, no, none of the patients had ductilitis, enthesitis was also not present. So radiological evaluation was done in only 17 out of 22 of these patients, and out of which 12 showed radiological involvement in the form of juxtaarticular osteopenia and joint space narrowing. So how were they treated? Most of the patients had responded to short course of NSAIDs within less than a month, and few required oral and intraarticular steroids without any recurrence of joint pain or stiffness. And those who did not respond to NSAIDs and steroids were managed with sulfasalazine. So in this case series, none of the patients had required any small molecules, and only one patient required being treated with sertolizumab. So the learning points we got from this case is that post-COVID reactive arthritis can be severe and protracted, and a treat-to-target approach must be employed in order to prevent long-standing disability. So when the patient is having persistent pain without any reduction in disease activity for two months, I think we should take a call to uh, start with more newer therapy rather than waiting around for the response of uh, existing treatment. So the key questions that I'd like to put forward from this uh, uh, case is that how is this post-COVID reactive arthritis different from other post-viral arthritis and other reactive arthritis due to GI or, gastro or uh, genitourinary infection? And how long should we wait before deciding on treatment with DMARDS? And where can we, if at all, we should put JAK inhibitors in the therapeutic plan for treating post-COVID arthritis? Yeah, we Thank you, sir. Yeah, we'll ask the audience to answer the I mean questions. I mean ask the questions and Sapan will handle for the further discussion on this patient. Uh, I'm surprised why actually uh, we, we have collected about eleven patients where HLA B twenty seven positive. And since your patient is classical uh, human dectylitis. Yes, sir. So probably the HLA B twenty seven you have not mentioned, probably X ray chest you have not mentioned. Uh, actually, I have mentioned, sir. It was As negative. you have mentioned. It was negative. So, uh, we have seen, this is just to share, and we are sending for publication. After vaccination, uh, the, the the reactive arthritis, whatever we label it, uh, she and they were all actually B27 positive. So, just wanted to ask views of others if somebody has seen like this. Uh, we do by PCR, sir. I don't have a question. I'm just uh, making a small comment. Can you show the clinical photograph again? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah. If you look at it, it's not just one middle finger showing dactylitis. Look at the toes. You see? So as a physical sign, it should not be ignored. Look at that. Even the toes are showing dactylitis, and this patient has a lot of dactylitis. And HLA B27 definitely becomes a very important uh, you know, parameter. It was negative by PCR, look. sir. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was this sulfasalazine. You said you just started 2 gram a day, and after one month, there was no response. I think that's a fallacious kind of impression you are giving. First of all, sulfasalazine is never started like this. It has started at 500 milligram and we escalated okay. over. So if you have uh, taken time to escalate, then in that one month, how much uh, response, response do you expect yeah. anyway? It is a slow acting drug. Yes. Sir. So you can't discard it straight away after one month. So it should be slowly be started and then probably takes two, three months to Six. kick in. So, so sulfasalazine, either you should not have chosen. If you wanted a quick response, you could have gone to tofacitinib straight away. Straight. If, if that was the yeah, preference. Yeah, because. Okay.
I have a question. That is one of the key questions that I had put. Sir. Unless I have missed the point completely, have we decided to discard methotrexate altogether? Uh, yes, we sir. seems to be jumping from, yes, sir. you know, since yesterday I have been watching, we seem to have a very low threshold now for JAK inhibitors. And there's enough data to show that methotrexate has not been surpassed by the small molecules. Methotrexate still remains your point. If you're considering a psoriatic arthritis kind of a picture, even if you call it a spondyloarthropathy in the long run, that's still psoriatic arthritis is a spondyloarthropathy, right? Yes. Sir. And your drug of choice for years together yes, has been methotrexate. But you jumped from sulfasalazine at a short interval, as Dr. Mm -hmm. Ashok Kumar said, to tofacitinib. And I didn't, maybe I just missed the gap as to why have we, dis since yesterday I've been watching, we seem to be skipping methotrexate altogether. And we have a very low threshold for JAKs. Now, JAKs are not so safe that we play around with them. Yeah, we'll make it sure. Professor Amita, please. Ashok and uh, he has said that we are just one month is not a not time for any drug to act. And if we discard drugs like this, we can discard in six months all the drugs which we have in our armentarium. And none of them will work. So I mean, the students should not go with this wrong message that we can start tofacitinib within one month. I mean, what would have happened? Nothing. You could have changed NSAID if we didn't respond. It will take some while, no? Uh, yes. Everything takes time to act. And if person has waited for these many months, he can as well wait for another two months. And or if you want to go, I would not ever use tofacitinib in such a situation. These drugs are not that safe, as Kaushik was saying. You see enough side effects. And that is the time when these patients come to the government hospitals. Once they develop side effects, yeah. that is the time they come to these big hospitals to tell us that they've been prescribed tofacitinib. Now they've got herpes zoster, they've got tuberculosis, they have max such a severe transaminitis. And that black fungus, one more thing. <laughs> Sapan. I'll just... Uh, uh, yeah. I just had an academic yeah. question. How do uh, we establish the relationship, cause and effect relationship between COVID and uh, this arthritis? Because COVID was very, very common. Every second person was getting it. And now how do we say that this is a reactive arthritis yeah, due yes. to I'll, COVID? I'll, I'll take that up. I'll just sum yeah. it up um, in, in two minutes. Uh, I got a chance to review literature, which I had not previously. So thank you for the case. And uh, so you showed those cases and the range of uh, ages that have been published. Most of these cases have been uh, uh, for a very short period. So none of them have really shown chronicity. In uh, We are still, uh, we still have time for chronicity for COVID. but. I don't think I saw any report which had shown chronicity. Number one, the second thing was that what you said, that all of these are based on temporal association of the time that from seven days to 13 days to 14 days to 20 days. My own colleague, uh, Dr. Tarat Parikh had written a manuscript of six cases, but those cases, I saw his cases yesterday, read them and they were one or two months after COVID. So that's why it probably did not get accepted. So that's the problem. We don't know if, if this is, you know, you know what, due to COVID itself. None of the cases showed uh, uh, the, the virus, uh, either the PCR in the synovial fluid, they did all of that also in some cases. B27 was negative in all, CCPRF was negative in all, AN was positive in one case, but that was just, they did it for the heck of it. All of them were managed with NSAIDs and intraarticular steroids. None of them really needed DMART, so that's another thing. So I wonder whether this was really psoriatic arthritis which got precipitated by COVID. We don't know that again association. You have to carefully look for psoriasis behind the ears and here and there and maybe some patients might not have psoriasis also. So that's the thing, I think. And uh, regarding DMARDs and all, yes, as you know, in 10 days for the con for the deformities to go is very odd really for, I don't know, if there is inflammation to first, it acts really early. But as everybody said, if you need DMARDs, one would think of uh, the common ones first and then go to, if at all, you know, in most of these cases don't need any DMARDs at all. That is what I read in literature. Thank you. Uh, one point that I want to say, you said the average interval between uh, getting COVID and arthritis was two months in say Tarel's cases or? Yeah, that is what he has yeah. written, so I yeah, don't know if it was. Fine. Some of COVID patients have got steroids, you know, so that probably, you know, just delayed it. The For COVID, the patients uh, received steroids and it was not just for, you know, during one week of COVID. People have received it over uh, three weeks or something. 
so that is one that could be one reason you can tell, you know suggest to covid how many uh, i mean to taral how many patients really were on steroids well, and that, that the, is why the, the delay may be i think the question is whether it was a chance thing that you know we yeah, don't yeah, really got, know whether it was got it yeah but the yeah. time yes. interval longer time interval one reason could be the patients could have got steroids for covid yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing just i want to say is that uh, we have always all of us see reactive arthritis commonly and uh, post covid maybe post covid may not be post covid the point is uh, we give uh, one uh, uh, nsaid they don't respond some of them are present with functional class 4 mm -hmm. so uh, one way of using these effective therapies maybe it is anti tnf or maybe to as a as a bridge therapy till the sulfur cells act instead of nsaids i have tried in few of my patients and it was beautifully because uh, we should use these drugs in an effective way tofacitib causes toxicity in a long term if you and anti tnf also similar so it can be used as an injection therapy if the patient is not responding to two doses of nsaids then what do you do you give anti tnf for a short time and withdraw it and maybe sometimes what happens is sulfur cells can maintain it or sulfur cells also can be stopped in uh, 7 to 8 months that may be the real place one question was there you have asked yes. so yeah i think that was a very great uh, case thank you so much thank we'll you, move on to the next um, presenter uh, this brought out a lot of uh, discussion on uh, post-COVID arthritis and its management and how to use the molecules. To Dr. Ramia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Ramya, from a fellowship resident from KIMS. So, uh, a 25-year-old male, a bolus constable with no significant past medical history, he presented to us uh, to ER on 20th of February 21. So before this, uh, he had a history of fever for 10 days, skin rash of three days of duration. Alter he was he presented to ER with an altered sensorium of one hour. Initially, he was admitted under general medicine. So according to his history, on 8th of February 21, he received Covishield vaccine. On 10th of February, he developed fever, myalgias, fatigue, uh, which continued until 17th of February. On 17th, on 17th of February, he was admitted to a local hospital at Kamu, a district from Telangana. So on admission, according to as per the records, there was thrombocytopenia. So he was treated as uh, febrile thrombocytopenia with IV antibiotics and due to worsening of his situation, he was uh, referred to Kim's on 20th of February. He had no history of any recent travel, drug abuse, smoking or alcohol. On examination, his JVP suggested irregular pulsations, temperature was 101 degrees, pulse 122 beats per minute, irregularly irregular, high, BP was 100 by 60, SpO2 98% on room air, uh, CVS variable S1 and S2, Lungs were clear, per abdomen there was no organomegaly. He had this uh, purpuric lesions on his forearms. VBG was suggestive of severe uh, metabolic acidosis. ECG suggested atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate. CT brain, normal. CT chest, he had just passive atelect active bands uh, in bilateral lower lobes. COVID rat, negative. His CBP suggested leukocytosis with severe thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of 16,000. RFT, normal. LFT, mild transhumanitis with albumin of 2.1. His CRP was elevated, procalcitonin elevated 7.73, ESR was 58, NT-pro BNP was 10,035, TROP T was all as well mildly elevator, elevated, D-dimer 1,706, ferritin was 6,524, PT-APTT normal, fibrinogen was normal, 229. His 2D echo suggested dilated LV, uh, LALV with global hypokinase of left ventricle with EF of 25%. So our initial DDs were probably it could be acute febrile illness with thrombocytopenia or is it septic shock or possibly vaccine induced. We managed him initially with IV antibiotics, meropenem and doxycycline hydrocortisone 50 mg IV BD, amiodarone infusion for uh, AF, inotropes as well supportive care. 
Over the next three days, the thrombocytopenia was the same. We were giving him platelet transfusions. But his rash progressed with gangrenous changes of right second, third, and fourth digits. He had uh, ischemia on his ear as well. The rash was retiform purpura. Meanwhile, his condition deteriorated. His G GCS dropped. He developed bradycardia, intubated, CPR, and was revived. His APS workup was negative, ANAIF, ANCAS negative, complements were low, C3 was 54 and C4 was 16, cryoglobulins were normal. CSF analysis unremarkable, dengue IgM IgG, wheel felix test, scrub typhus we performed because a similar uh, kind of rash uh, with gangrenous changes uh, usually present along with scrub typhus. Leptospira IgM negative, blood cultures more than two sides negative, urine culture negative. Skin biopsy suggested subepidermal bulla with uh, small microthrombi in his vessels with mononuclear infiltrates. So after all exclusion, our closest differentials were either purpura fulminans or cryofibrinogenemia. We couldn't send, uh, we sent cryoglobulins which were negative, but we couldn't send cryofibrinogens as his condition was worsening and we had to take a decision on his treatment. So. In, according to, in purpura fulminance, what was not matching was the biopsy should suggest of epidermal necrosis, which was absent in this patient. And in cryofibrinogenemia, as well, dermal necrosis should be present, which was absent. And it should be uh, eosinophilic infiltrate, but, but here it was mononuclear. So coming to the discussion, overall the patient's clinical features and biochemical markers were consistent with CDC's definition of MIS. Although the CDC criteria for multi-inflammatory syndrome requires presence of current or recent infection with SARS-CoV-2 infection or exposure, though our patient had received uh, Covishield vaccine, Chadox-1, just two days before his illness, hence his patients meet the criteria drawn recently by the Brighton's Collaboration <coughs> Network definition of vaccine-induced MIS. There was no alternative diagnosis to explain our patient's symptoms. So according to this criteria, age more than 21 years, there should be fever more than equal to three consecutive days, more than or equal to two clinical features involving mucocutaneous, which was present in this patient as rash, uh, shock or hypotension, and neurologic, he presented with altered sensorium. Laboratory markers of inflammation, there was elevated CRP, ESR, ferritin was very much elevated, as well procalcitonin. More than two or equal measures of disease activity, his BNP was elevated, Drop T was mildly elevated. There was significant neutrophilia, thrombocytopenia, and echocardiographic evidence suggestive of heart failure. ECG changes consistent with myocarditis, he had AF. So uh, either along with all these manifestations, there should be uh, either uh, COVID, recent history, or SARS-CoV-2 vaccination. So in this case, it was vaccination. So in SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, complement activation actually plays a key role in vaccine-induced MIS. IVIG and steroid therapy would be appropriate to prevent the endothelial dysfunction and support endothelial integrity. So vaccine adjuvants uh, cause venous endothelial dysfunction due to complement activation, further causing venous endotheliopathy, and can present as uh, inflammatory pathway activation causing cytokine release and multi-organ multi inflammatory syndrome or can present as my, uh, strokes, CSVT, and, or either as epiphenomenon. So we treated him uh, on, with, when ferritin was 6,524 after four days, and with uh, thrombocytopenia of 19,000, with IV steroids, uh, 500 mg, followed by IVIG. On day two, his platelet count was 46,000, and after day three of IVIG, after day two of IVIG and pulse steroids, platelet count improved to 1,29,000 and ferritin also lowered to 2,000 Along with this, uh, for the gangrene, we have given him alprostadil infusion over five days for distal ischemia. Patient's rash healed. This was it after one month of his uh, discharge. His myocarditis improved. He recovered well. After a month, he had to undergo amputation of the right second, and th right, second third, and fourth fingertips due to this. So my key questions to the panelists, is lifelong anticoagulation warranted in post-vaccine induced thrombotic events? 
Is there a role of any immunosuppression in vaccine-related MIS? And role of prostaglandin E1 in ischemic digits? Thank, yeah, thank you. you. Now the audience can fire their questions. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Oak, then Dr. Amita Oak. Dr. Jotsna Oak, then Kaushik. I mean, uh, sorry, Sandeep. Oh, Sandeep. So, the possibility of a TTP, a thrombotic, yeah. thrombocytopenic He had no schistocytes. He had no schistocytes. He had no schistocytes. Okay. And DCT was also negative. Dr. Amita. Cryofibrinogenemia is very easy to do. You just need to take anticoagulated blood, separate the plasma, put it in two vials, keep one in the fridge at 4 degrees centigrade and keep one at the room temperature. And you can easily see cryofibrinogen in the sample which you have stored in the fridge. Can be done in the ward itself because okay. that can exactly present like this. Yes. This fibrinogenemia can cause the same kind of skin necrosis. Patients are really sick, can have digital gangrene, can follow an infection and management will be similar. Yes. You have basically doused the fire by giving IV, IG and steroids. Whatever he had, that will improve. But we really don't know, is it really MISC post-vaccine? Is it cryofibrinogenemia because of infection? He must be on many antibiotics, I'm sure. Because we have, we only, it's not that he must have received only steroids and IVIG. No. Yeah, can, can you pass the mic to the Dr. Oak? Well, I was just thinking about TTP only at AdamTS 13, but I think his histocytes were not there. Not there. And the other DI, DIC is another differential diagnosis but in such a situation. And APTT and yeah, was that normal. was done. Yeah. So we ruled out that. Yeah. Can I say something? So, uh, is it too early for the uh, post vaccinal MIS to occur within two days of the vaccination? So is it an idiosyncratic reaction or is it really an immune-mediated reaction? That's point number one. Second, I did not see the reports of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibody nucleocapsid or anti-spike protein antibody titers. Do, did you have that? Actually, after IGM, we did a CMA, uh, I mean, COVID anti PCR, which was negative, I forgot to mention here. No, that's and the, not the uh, IgG antibodies. No, that's for the acute infection. Yes. I'm see, asking for the antibodies. No, madam, we didn't do the antibodies later. Okay, so then how do we know that, I mean, how do we say that it is mm. post vaccinal? Absolutely. So, and for the third thing is for the this MIS. The, there are a lot of patients who can actually fulfill the classification, I mean, the, the, the algorithm. But I think it has a lot of exclusions attached to it. So unless we go through the exclusions, many patients with sepsis admitted in ICU in this era will fulfill the uh, MIS uh, uh, class, I mean the algorithm. So I think we should go more carefully into the exclusions rather than the inclusions of this. And it should rather be a diagnosis of exclusion rather than off on a we regular basis. We did the basis. same, madam, after excluding no. everything. Yeah, what yeah. will we be your suggestion case. in such yeah, a so critical was, condition? Yeah, will you coming, have time to do all this exclusion? So I'm coming to that. We've seen a couple of patients who have come with impending gangrene of few digits. Not this bad though and coupled with even myocarditis. And uh, we have also done the almost the same thing, giving steroids, giving IVIG. Those who are not sick have actually not responded to steroids, have not responded to anticoagulants, but they have responded to vasodilatory therapy. Okay. So alprostadil is the one which has worked rather than the immunomodulatory therapy. Yeah. Yeah, like recently yeah. there is one uh, yeah. six-year-old uh, child admitted with me. Uh, he is COVID IgG positive, came with digital gangrene, no response to uh, steroids, um, uh, anticoagulants, let us heparin, and alprostin but beautifully responded to uh, IVIG. Chennai? Yeah. So uh, we also had a very similar patient. Ultimately, what we should understand is no immune stimulus can cause this devastating complication in two days. It takes some time. And uh, as uh, Vinita Madam suggested, she was pointing to a fact that most probably he had a COVID in the background, which was there previously. And only way to differentiate between these two is anti-nucleocapsid. If uh, COVID shield is a vaccine which was given, uh, COVID shield usually doesn't produce uh, nucleocapsid antibody. So if you do a nucleocapsid antibody, you can very clearly differentiate whether it's a COVID infection induced or it's basically uh, vaccine induced. So mo my bet is, uh, and the other patient who was basically came to us, his uh, nucleocapsid antibodies were positive. He was a doctor. And ultimately we treated his, uh, he received COVID vaccine. After five days, he fell sick. 
and he had all uh, most of uh, he didn't have gangrene but he had predominantly myocarditis and other manifestations and his nucleocapsid was positive ivig again he responded to ivig he had a stomach cold and he survived so what the point is the problem with la uh, giving a label of vaccine induced mis i am not i don't i don't say it doesn't exist it may exist and wit also exist that uh, uh, gi giving another shot of vaccine at a later date if they require that, that kind of complications come in. So nucleocapsid antibody is really helpful. And uh, always, whenever you say COVID antibody, always specify which antibody, whether it's a anti-spike or nucleocapsid. I think that is the one thing. And uh, in retrospect, when people uh, like us sit in gallery and comment on this, very easy. But when managing such a stormy course, I think we have to hit hard with everything possible. And you have done a good job in managing this case. There's no doubt about it. And you have done the right thing. Thank you. So if the patient asks you whether he should go for second dose or booster, what are you going to advise? What about Chennai, this platelet factor for… Uh, uh, that's another thing I was… Uh, uh, WIT is another thing which you should have… Uh, uh, but the problem is myocarditis is very unusual in WIT. Vaccine induced thrombotic, uh, thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. And uh, anti-PF for antibodies will help. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, Madam's question is asking giving second dose of vaccine, the, uh, the patient, even if you say, go and take, patient will not take. Will not so, there is no confusion. <laughs> and second thing, more importantly is, uh, look at their antibody titers. They, they will give you a cool. If anti-spike antibodies are in thousands, it's unlikely that they will require another shot and uh, booster dose may not be required. So, it's, it'll be. So, you can take recommendation you can actually take the but nobody will take it. <laughs> no, no, definitely. Yeah, please, Sapan. I'll just add that I think we are uh, perplexed between what we call VITT and what you call vaccine-induced MIS because MIS-C, as far as I know, was picked up because of the events occurring almost three to four weeks after the infection. And they saw in that, cap in that graph that there were events occurring one month after the… and that's how they picked up the first MIS-C cases. And from that, we had the MIS-A. So, it occurs later. VITT is a specific time between 7 to 14 days, I think, within the first dose of the uh, more likely than a virus vaccine. So, I think let's not get confused between those two. Uh, and there are obviously inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. But having said that, all of us have seen cases and I think all of you will agree uh, because I have an ID uh, counterpart who, um, who is, who is the, in the COVID task force of the state. And there were cases with just fevers after one month and joint pains and not fooling full clarity. After ruling out everything, we had to really give them steroids because we could not understand what's happening. After having ruled out all the infections, he was an ID specialist, he ruled it out. So I think we have seen those isolated cases, but those are more isolated uh, than, you know, uh, it's more exception than the rule. So. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ramya. Uh, just one, one, yeah. Uh, yeah. one. Yeah, go ahead. Thing. What she will actually uh, advise to the patient or what her consultant would advise to the patient is apart. But we all feel that this is not vaccine related. It possibly three, four weeks back, the patient had subclinical COVID. And if they had done IgG antibodies, they would also agree that, okay, those IgG antibodies have definitely come up, haven't come up within two days of vaccination. So it's COVID, which is three, four weeks before. Now this patient, that means has more danger due to COVID. Should we? The was not done, eh? and they had not no, done. But done. if they had done, I'm just hypothesizing. Okay. So because you all would agree that this is, most of you feel that this is not vaccine related. So this is related to COVID. Say, suppose IgG antibodies are positive. Let us take a situation that this patient they had done IgG antibodies and they are positive. Now whether the patient should go for second vaccine or not, because he has more danger of COVID, and he would be protected by vaccine. Say right. by 85 to 90%. So, I will share our latest data, ma'am. Those, uh, so, somebody who has an infection followed by first dose of vaccination, they are called, hi have hybrid immunity. So, whatever latest data we have communicated to La Lancet last month. So, it will be, uh, uh, what it shows is, those who are having already hybrid immunity, by giving a second dose, actually their neutralization comes down and immunity comes down. So, it's a very clear message that uh, if your antibody levels are quite high, giving a booster is not useful. Either it doesn't work or the, your anti-spike antibodies which are circulation clear all the antigens. So, we should not give. If it was a, uh, already he has got an infection and got a single dose of vaccine, that is much better than giving two doses of vaccine. So, in that case, he should not take a second dose. What about that? Yes. I have uh, an exact corollary, so I beg to differ. 
because like Sapan, I also work with an ID specialist for such cases. And we now have about five patients who, uh, the number is very small, but this is very clearly shown the nucleocapsid is negative. Patient had a vaccine. Five days later, the patient had fever. One patient had polycirrhositis. Two patients presented with an acute Takayashu kind of a syndrome with large vasculitis and, in fact, DVT. And then we realized that this is what has happened and there were inflammation everywhere. So there is possibly an entity because the nucleocapsid were negative in all five. And this ID specialist had done due diligence before calling me into the picture. And all of them, the temporal profile, five days was the earliest and 11th day was the maximum and there was only a vaccine and no preceding COVID infection. So I just thought I'd let you know that there is some entity which we need to identify. Something is happening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I think we'll have to… Thank you. Yeah, Thank we'll you. close up this one. Thanks for… Uh, your case for, uh, created a lot of discussion. Thank you so much. So we move on to the third case by Dr. Joseph T. Anthony. Good morning. I am Dr. Joseph, third year postgraduate uh, from Sri Ramayandra Medical College. Uh, my topic of presentation is COVID, the great masquerader. So I am presenting the history of a 32-year-old farmer from Chennai with comorbidities of systemic hypertension, dyslipidemia, chronic tophaceous gout. He underwent a PTCA to the left circumflex artery one month back and was on dual antiplatelet therapy. He is a smoker and an alcoholic. He presented to the general medicine department with dyspnea, edema of both feet, and reduced urine output of three-day duration. And in examination, his right radial artery was not palpable. BP was reco recorded from the left upper limb was 80 by 60. And on general examination, he had an impending gangrene of the there was an impending gangrene of the fifth uh, little toe, and there was an infected torphus of the left second toe. On further examination, bilateral torphi was seen in both the MTP joints, and the patient had synovitis with torphus on the, um, with multiple torphi on the PIP joints. On further examination, the right upper limb was cold and pale, and the right radial artery was not palpable. System examination revealed normal vesicular breath sounds with an elevated JVP. So summarizing at this point of time, we have a 32-year-old male with comorbidities of coronary artery disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and tophaceous gout, with critical limb ischemia, acute right heart failure because of the elevated JVP with normal vesicular breath sounds, and acute kidney injury. Investigations done at uh, admission revealed elevated creatinine, and LFT showed that SGOT and SGPT were in thousands suggestive of ischemic hepatitis with low albumin, urine routine showed protein 2 plus with elevated urine PCR and urine myoglobin being positive. A CPK and LDH was also in thousands, suggestive of uh, rhabdomyolysis secondary to acute kidney injury. The other investigations done was uh, ECG showed sinus tachycardia and a 2D echocardiogram showed an injection fraction of 33% RV dilated and clot in the right atrium. You can see the first image where there is a, a free floating uh, clot in the right atrium and a further echo was done three days later which showed that the clot had migrated to the RV. His uh, Doppler of the right radial artery showed no flow and ABG revealed type 1 respiratory failure with lactic acidosis. So uh, summarizing based on the history clinical findings and investigations at admission. We had a 32-year-old farmer presenting with AKI, rhabdomyolysis with metabolic acidosis, transaminitis, probably due to ischemic hepatitis, with an RA clot uh, with biventricular failure with critical limb ischemia. So we progressed, uh, the progress chart of the investigations revealed that the platelet initially at admission was 2.6. And from day three onwards, there was a slight do downward progression of the platelets. And also hemoglobin also showed a, down, uh, a downward trend from day three onwards with an elevated retic count. So we summarized that there was an ongoing hemolytic anemia with probable consumption coagulopathy. 
The initial peripheral smear was normal at day one, but on day five it showed thrombocytopenia with neutrophilia. And by day 11, the patient had 11 day course. Uh, the, by the day 11, we were able to demonstrate 2% cystocytes in the peripheral smear. His creatinine was uh, improving and his uh, liver function tests were also going on a downward trend along with the CPK and LDH. So at this point of time, the patient was still in the general medicine department because of the low C3, C4 count, then admission was put to the rheumatology department. And because of the unvaccinated status and uh, because of the other autoimmune workup, we found that the ferritin was in thousands, 17,556. And the initial fibrinogen was normal, but on day three repetition, it was 186. And the COVID-19 IgG, SARS-CoV-2, was 949, highly elevated. The further APLA workup, which was sent on day one, had turned out to be negative with a low C3-C4, and the other autoimmune workup was negative. So on progressing, we were able to find, in addition, the patient had microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with thrombocytopenia, high fertin levels, low complements, COVID IgG highly positive with a negative APS workup. So this is the further progress, uh, progress of the patient. The, this image was taken on day six. On progressive, we can see that the uh, impending gangrene on day five, on, on the fifth toe had further increased, and it is also spread to the third, third toe on the left side. And also the patient had developed cutaneous infarcts. So this is the course in hospital of the patient. On day one, the patient was intubated, ventilation, ventilated and put on hemodialysis and anticoagulation because of uh, type 1 respiratory failure, acute right heart failure, critical limb ischemia and rhabdomyolysis. On day three, we noted the very high fertin levels with COVID-19 IgGs being very highly positive. The patient was started on pulse methylprednisolone for three days. On day five onwards, the patient started developing consumption coagulopathy with hemolytic anemia. In view of the possibility of catastrophic apla and thrombotic microangiopathy, the plasma pheresis was initiated. But at this point of time, the peripheral smear did not show cystocytes. On day seven, due to severe thrombocytopenia, because the patient was undergoing HD, the first option was plasma viruses. On, uh, because of severe thrombocytopenia, patent of 19,000, the plasma exchange was stopped and patient was initiated on IVIG, continuing alternate day hemodialysis while continuing steroids. On day 10, the peripheral smear showed 2% cystocytes, IVIG was continued, and on day 11, the patient developed pulses, dietary activity, and even with the CPR and resuscitation, patient could not be revived. So we formed like four differential diagnoses at this point of time. One was COVID-associated coagulopathy because the COVID antibodies were I mean, like four differential diagnoses. One being COVID-associated coagulopathy. The second one is catastrophic APLA. Third one is chronic DIC. And the fourth one is primary TMA, T, uh, TMA with TTP. So there were points in favor of and against of all four conditions. For COVID-associated coagulopathy, there was actually involvement of all vessels, small vessels, medium and large vessels, which goes in favor of. But usually microangiopathic hemolytic anemia usually does not occur in the setting of COVID-associated coagulopathy. It's one of the differentiating features. But high CRP, ESR, fertin go in favor of it. And COVID antibodies were highly positive. For catastrophic APLA, the APS antibodies were negative. Whereas in chronic DIC, it actually is something that goes in parallel with coagulopathy, coagulopathy, but usually the ESR, CRP, and fertin usually not very elevated unless in the setting of chronic infections. And usually microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is also, uh, also less occurring. That is how we differentiate from acute DIC. The other possibility is primary TMA and TTP, but usually it's a small vessel disease, but this patient had involvement of radial artery, so that was a point against this, and also the COVID antibody levels are still like a question mark. So the key message, the key, the key messages I have at this point, questions I have at this point is chronic associated, uh, COVID associated coagulopathy, chronic TIC, DIC, TMA, and CAPS is still a diagnostic dilemma. It's always prudent to look for COVID-19 as a precipitating risk factor and uh, see whether serial peripheral examination was, is important to identify cystocytes and early initiation of plasma virus and IVIG should be considered in suspecting CAPS and TMA. Thank you. For audience interaction. <clears throat> Nothing, yeah. So it seems that even uh, TTP and other diseases like this are sort of uh, evolving as viruses evolve, our diseases are evolving as well. But on a serious note, it's likely that some of the large artery manifestations may have happened because of peripheral uh, tophi or some yes, you know, tissue-specific reasons. And it's, it's easy for us to you know, put diseases in, in a block, but it's very likely that all these are probably happening all together. Yes, sir, we don't calling, actually uh, know actually, sir. Like what? what? Absolutely, right. 
Any any other comment or uh, yes, Benita? I think I missed it, but did you mention whether the patient was getting statins or any drugs which could have yeah, Ma'am, for the past eight years, patient had all these comorbidities, but patient was on irregular treatment. So initial thing was that patient had underwent a PTCA one month back, was apparent at that point of time, but on admission there was no thrombocytopenia. Patient came with uh, critical limb ischemia and hypotension. And you have very elegantly shown that the uh, M, the clot in the uh, heart was moving from LA to LV, right? Yes, sir. So yes, do you think that it was just embolism or atheroma which had embolized from one place to another? Maybe Which was responsible for the limb ischemia? I am not Maybe sure. Maybe there was a shower of emboli from the heart which has... Yes, ma'am. That was plus complications uh, uh, which were already. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this uh, patient was admitted in medicine only, so initial thought was that only, ma'am, because of the high ferritin, low C3, C4, and all the. No, I think. Uh, Doctor Vinita, I think he spoke about the clot being in the right side, not the left RV side. Or right or side. Or oh, okay. I registered it as LA. Yes. It's RA to RV. Uh, uh, this, uh, he was unvaccinated, right? Unvaccinated. And his anti. Uh, uh, whenever you say COVID, not, I, just, I don't. I'm not sure, sir. Like, huh? sir, I don't know what the antibodies are. Like. I always uh, specify that uh, because, yeah. As far as the treatment of TTP is concerned, I think the moment you get cystocytes, you should start plasma pheresis. Otherwise, yeah, we have started yeah, before. So this patient had multiple other comorbidities. Yeah. And that is why uh, the only other literature which we found was that C3, C4 was low. Whether we should start eculizumab was only the so doubt. What you have uh, is absolutely correct. That uh, fabulously managed, but we were just not here. Multiple comorbidities. It is. Yeah. So, Sapan, with yeah, all so these uh, yeah. inflammatory markers, hi, how are you going to discuss? Yeah, so this? again, thank you. I got a chance to review TMA in COVID. And uh, there is one, two papers, one very good paper in research and thrombosis 2022 by the second author was Sanat Fatak. Yeah. Today happens to be his birthday. I saw on Facebook, so all of you wish to, we can wish him. It's a very elegant review on TMA. And there are reports of, uh, the, most of these reports are post-mortem of COVID with TMA or TTB, you know, those cases. And um, there are kidney biopsies and there are lung biopsies which have been done. Most of them have found what, what you showed, you know, sort of fibrin thrombi and aggregated erythrocytes and those. Uh, the mechanism is believed to be um, either of these. It could be, uh, in, in, the, in the case of coagulopathy, it could be viral direct induced, but in these cases, it could be uh, lupus anticoagulant, I mean, Kapla, one of the things, as a mechanism has been described. The other is acquired inhibitor of ADAMTS. And the third is complement mediated, as you showed. So, and the commonest has been complement mediated in all of these, as as was in your case also. And so, um, coming to the therapy part, the only thing, as you yourself said, uh, there are two. Uh, one, of, you've done everything, and there are reports for and against everything. Um, steroids, people have tried in these cases. People have tried plasma uh, exchange, as you did. Uh, that's that's number one. With as everybody said, with schistocytes and those things. People have tried rituximab also in the setting of, it's difficult in the setting of COVID-19 infection or immediately following it, but people have tried that also. And eculizumab and one more, caplacizumab or some other drug has come which has been FDA approved for use in uh, TMA. I also saw that new, it's, it's supposed to be bivalent antibody which binds on the domain uh, A1 of the von Willebrand factor with, and inhibits it from binding to the platelets. And that's how it prevents that cascade. So even I found that new, but that has been FDA approved. So. In one case, they tried that also, and eculizumab has been tried uh, with success in a couple of cases, only two or three cases, but most of them actually died. So, and they've also looked at pulmonary vasculature and biopsies uh, there. So that was the only thing which you could have done, I thought, uh, you know, eculizumab, somebody has used in our country, I think Vishad gets it, otherwise I'm not aware, it's a very costly drug. But otherwise, these are bad cases, most of them died, despite with such high levels of, uh, as you saw, ferritin and AST, ALT and those things, it is going to be very difficult to, uh, you know, and then, uh, Trophaceous gout, comorbidities, uh, there was one case where this is a risk factor for this kind of rhabdomyolysis and you know such presentation. There was one case, very similar case reported in literature after COVID. So I think these are uh, unique cases that people have seen but uh, you try your best and so uh, if anybody has anything to add. If you see in the most of the post-mortem uh, reports we got from Italy, the first wave, second wave, on the first wave maximum number of post-mortem done in Italy. In the first wave, we don't know what, what to give, what not to give. Second wave, the postman results, there was intravascular coagulation. They didn't define myositis. All skeletal muscles, there was a thrombus. So that has caused ischemic uh, uh, myopathy. So this all, you see, 
gout, old coronary, already state of hypermetabolic syndrome. Uh, COVID has caused intravascular coagulation. Everything explained that. And uh, after that post uh, reports, we started giving steroids, anticoagulations, and sometimes biologics. That has definitely made the difference in the first wave, second wave mortality. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, shall we go to the next? Yeah, case? Yeah. yeah. We'll move on to the last uh, case to be presented by yeah. Dr. Ramya. about anti-MDFI rapidly progressing ILD. We do not know is it because of vaccine induced or due to COVID. Initially, uh, she presented to us a 55-year-old female, a resident of Hyderabad. She was asymptomatic. Uh, she, her family, nobody had history of any COVID in uh, April or March. So she presented to us with polyarthralgias of three months, erythematous skin rash, papillopustular lesions for three months of duration, Exertional breathlessness, MMRC grade 3 for two months, non-productive cough, fever, and a weight loss of more than 5 kgs. She received her co-vaccine co on 24th of uh, April 21. Immediately, uh, she had fever the next day, followed by myalgias, and this painful erythematous papillar rash on the digits. Her husband had captured this image. One week post-vaccination, she developed erythematous rash on face, B area of the neck, erythematous papillopustular regions on both the ears and arthralgias. Two weeks later on, she developed progressive exertional breathlessness. On examination, uh, there was pallor, tachypnea, uh, temperature was 99, tachycardia. She had bilateral coarse crepitations on the lungs. Uh, skin examination, there was rash in the V area, v area of the neck, gotran sign, erythema around fingernails, digital ulceration and elbow ulceration, auricular papillar pustular lesions, few with necrotic base on both the ears. According to investigations, her ESR and CRP elevated, and HP of 9.6, ANA was one plus speckled, ANA profile negative, RFT, LFT normal, anti-CCP, rheumatoid factor negative, infective workup negative. Uh, she actually carried uh, COVID IgG antibodies report which was evaluated elsewhere that was negative. And uh, CT chest was suggestive of subplural increased reticulation with GGOs, NSIP, ILD. Myositis panel was strongly positive for MDFI. So we diagnosed as uh, MDFI rapidly progressing ILD. We do not know the cause, very vaccine induced. So before her presentation, we had three or four cases of rapidly progressing ILD, which worsened in front of us. So we decided to treat her with combined modality therapy as per the literature. So in July, uh, we started her on uh, cyclophosphamide, 500 mg fortnightly uh, with pulse steroids. We gave her 500 mg for five days. Uh, still, there was no improvement. In August, we had taken a call for rituximab. She was okay. Uh, her saturations used to maintain around 94 or 93 when she used to come to the OPD visits. We had two weekly visits for her. In September, again, she had a exacerbation of ILD. So according to Japanese protocol, we added tacrolimus. Again, September mid, uh, second week, she finished her cyclophosphamide. Uh, high ILD worsened. Infective parameters were negative again. So in October, off cyclophosphamide, we had to decide on a DMARD uh, or biologic what to continue. So we thought, to, uh, meanwhile, there were good review of literature on tofacitinib. So we started her on tofacitinib 5 mg BD. Meanwhile, uh, in September to October, she complained of hoarseness of voice for two weeks. Video laryngoscopy was done, which revealed a small ulcerative, ulceroproliferative lesion of focal cord. As per literature, this is also mentioned in few cases of MDFI YLD. In mid-October 21, her cough and breathlessness worsened. On minimal exertion, she had an SpO2 of 84%. We thought probably due to sudden worsening some embol pulmonary embolism, but CT angiogram was negative for it. Six weeks later, she presented to ER again uh, with 74% of saturation on room air. 
Interestingly, what we noticed her noticed was she had these uh, deep fissuring scars on her feet and these ulcerative nodules. In, a, in July, when she presented to us, she had this. Again in October, when she had a flare, we noticed this. And repeat CT chest showed worsening, severe worsening of ILD. On ABG, there was severe metabolic acidosis requiring an FiO2 of 100%. And uh, her ferret CRP was elevated, D-dimer elevated, ferritin was 381, PCR was negative. I we decided to start her again on methyl uh, prednisolone, 250 mg for three days, and IVIG. A total of 100 grams over five days was given. There was no significant improvement in SpO2, and she was requiring 15 liters on NRBM with intermittent an, uh, NIV. Due to this, she even uh, developed surgical emphysema. Her ferritin and D-dimer showed no improvement. So with worsening of ILD, we had to take a call on uh, plasma exchange. Here in this visit, uh, at Kims, we do uh, IgG nucleocapsid, which was negative. And uh, we, started her, we decided to treat her with plasma exchange. So after two, uh, it was uh, first plasma was done on 1st of December. By second plasma exchange, she improved, and there was a rapid improvement with uh, decrease in her O2 requirements. After one week or so, she was discharged on oral prednisolone, mycophenolet mofetil 1 gram, along with tacrolimus, nintinanib, and uh, cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. Her respiratory condition improved gradually, and the patient was dependent on 2 liters of home oxygen upon discharge. Now again, she, came, she brought a challenge to us. It was a non-healing vaginal ulcer, which gradually increased in size with no response to topical ointments. Suspected initially herpes, uh, treated her with temporical acyclovir, uh, oral acyclovir as well as uh, ointment. There was no response. Uh, then we had to take a call on biopsy also. In January 22, third week, her SPO2 dropped again to 85% on room air. Vaginal ulcer was worsening, and she complained of mild blurring of vision in the both eyes. Now, like you say, think of the devil, it appears. Every time we were uh, searching for CMV, uh, so this time CMV DNA PCR was positive. Vaginal ulcer biopsy uh, su was suggestive of ulcerated squamous epithelium with leukocytoclastic vasculitis and thrombosis of underlying vessels. No viral inclusions or IHC on CMV was negative. So provisional diagnosis of and uh, we started her with uh, Valgan cyclovir. On, treat on treatment, her left eye vision uh, worsened, and she also developed leukopenia. So our diagnosis was probably this is drug-induced leukopenia. At this point, again, ANA was repeated, which was negative. Or vaginal ulcer. Is this ulcer because of CMB, or is it disease activity? We do not know. So we stopped Valgan cyclovir in view of leukopenia. We gave her febrile neutropenia management. Again, second, she received her second monthly IVIG. So due to worsening of left eye vision, we had given her uh, intravitreal GAN cyclovir, one mg twice a week, followed by once in a week for four weeks. Her leukopenia improved gradually after stopping of Valgan. After six doses of intravitreal GAN cyclovir, uh, she had a complete eye resolution. Her vaginal ulcer also improved. So, uh, now she's on SpO2 of 95% on room air. She received her IVIG in December, Jan, Feb, and March on uh, MMF 1 gram, tacrolimus 2 mg, and intidanib. So interestingly, these kind of lesions she gets whenever she is in flare, this deep fissuring scars on the feet, these ulcers, and the uh, erythematous papular lesions on hand. Coming to discussion, MDFI poor prognostic signs. Uh, erythematous auricular papules that may be linked to fatal outcomes. It's most commonly misdiagnosed as discoid lupus. This is from the article I've taken, Understanding and Managing Anti-MDA-5, Including Potential COVID-19 Mimicry, by Dr. Pamukti Mehta, Pedro M. Machado, and Latika Gupta from SGPGI. Cutaneous ulcers and palmar papules are distinctive cutaneous findings in 30 to 80 percent of Asian population. Ulcer most commonly occurs over the elbows, knee joints, lateral nail folds, or over the overlying the Gottron's papule. Mimicking Po mechanism postulated is because of uh, either underlying vasculopathy and microvascular injury related to poop prognosis. The palmar papules are unique of the subtype found on palmar as aspect of MCP joints and IP joints. In anti-MDFI positive patients, the 90-day mortality was significantly higher in patients with lower lung consolidations or GGO pattern than in those without this pattern. 
So strategies to improve survival was early recognition of the disease phenotype based on the clinical clues, imaging, biomarkers, early intensive combination treatment, surveillance and management of infectious complications. This case emphasizes that the incorporation of plasma exchange as salvage therapy in refractory anti-MDFI ILD, ILD cases despite aggressive combined modality therapy to increase survival and attain clinical remission. So key questions. So see to the panelists, CMV reactivation and how often do we monitor and the role of CMV prophylaxis and how to go about uh, prolonged monthly IVIG maintenance because it is very costly and how long do we continue and how about in low socioeconomic groups. Role of rituximab maintenance and how after how many days of CMV infection because now we have treated her and then Ritux next would be if she comes in flare what to do. We should, should we give rituximab or not? And if she relapses again, next better treatment options. A very good case, I think. Yeah, something. Right after the picture that the lady was about to poke the gentleman's eye, the husband's eye, that you're not taking good care of, sort of smile there. But on a more serious note, much of what is happening in, in uh, the, the COVID era is, is almost like dropping a bomb in an already choppy uh, sea or, or a stormy sea. And you sort of set off a tsunami there. You, you probably have something that's going on in the background. And, and it almost, uh, in the background, you start to see that there was a, a, a COVID or a COVID-related injection. And that's what is happening to a lot of our rheumatology patients, patients who have been in complete remission for ages with, with their rheumatoid or whatever. Then they start to have symptoms again. And this could be 10 days after a COVID injection or a COVID inf uh, infection. So it's all, all uh, uh, you know, related to the, to the immune activation, sort of. Just yeah. a comment. Yeah. Uh, uh, just one. Uh, uh, this thing, COVID antibody were positive. That's what you told, no, day two or day three. From outside, it was positive. From outside, it was negative, and even in the yeah, yeah. Yeah. October yeah. admission, we did that also. Nucleic capsid yeah. was negative. Both and the spike also was negative. We don't do spike in Kims. We only do nuclear capsid. Three days after COVID. Yeah, yeah. I think I can be heard anyway. So, uh, <clears throat> at what point did you stop the tofacitinib and switch therapies? Because you seem to be showing that the patient was improving over here. In October, and then th sir. Exactly. And that time there was this hoarseness of voice. Switch to the next slide. Shut up. And somewhere here, you've written mid-October her cough and breathlessness worsened. So initially you she was improving or she wasn't improving at she all? She wasn't improving. Yeah. Just so there was no response to TOFA. Is that, that's what you meant? Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, there any data anyway for an MDA5 dermatomyositis ILD with TOFA? Yes. yes. With that good a response in such a fulminant case? There is COVID anti MDA5 ILD. There is, there is uh, Dr. What is her name? Abel in in birth in grid. She has a very good article. It came in other rheumatology also where they've shown that early on. Uh, if you give uh, the start of the ILD, um, no, they're not late, early on, then early on then it actually uh, dampens the interferon signatures which lead to the ILD. So in MDFI, if you start early, tofacitinib may abort the ILD. That's that what was my said. point. This was a fulminant case. That's exactly what I was underlining, that you already had something which wasn't working and you're intervening after four months of seeing poor prognostic markers with tofacitinib, notwithstanding the fact that it acts relatively fast. But could we have, at that point in time, done the, you know, the other, uh, the PLEX or the IVIG and then considered TOFA? Because you're already five months down and it's a progressive deteriorating picture. So actually, it's a patient decision. Yes, it was a patient's decision. <laughs> so actually, you know, when we get yes. patients to the corporate, they go to multiple doctors, multiple consultations. So th somehow they got in touch with uh, Dr. Uh, Latika Gupta online. And uh, because there is a good data on TOFA, so she advised TOFA. So we had to give and uh, we were not happy. There was no improvement. Then we changed that protocol. Uh, uh, sir, uh, we also had a similar experience with uh, 
a male patient at NIMS. Uh, he was primarily managed in pulmonology. So he had a rapidly progressive course of ILD and we tried the triple therapy and followed by plasma exchange. But in his case, uh, he got COVID in hospital and then maybe succumbed to the rapidly progressive ILD and COVID pneumonia. But I just wanted to ask one question. Uh, are we incriminating uh, COVID and uh, vaccines too much into our illnesses? Because in this case, she received the vaccine just two days or one day before and the COVID antibodies were negative. And we have given uh, so many vaccines so far, like in the history, and uh, we've never heard uh, such uh, uh, stormy courses with other vaccines. Why with COVID vaccines alone is my question. Uh, yeah, excellent question. So I'll just take it up uh, and I'll say why, what, is, what has been our experience. See, first question is why we have not seen other vaccine, never in the history of mankind such rapid, short, sure. one, 200, 300 billions of vaccine has been delivered in such short course. And uh, that may be the reason we are seeing if any if a uh, reaction happened one in one million, there would be so many vaccines have been given. So we had two cases of uh, COVID vaccine, myositis followed by COVID vaccines. So one case, first lady came to uh, see COVID sheet after eight days, or 10th or 12th day, she developed myo uh, severe myalgia, muscle pains, and CPK were in uh, 25, 30,000. At that time, we biopsied, it was our first case, that then we biopsied, which was polymyositis kind of picture. And we gave her IVIG, she is perfectly fine, we could, uh, on mycophenate now, maintenance, she is being tapered off. Second case was another lady, old lady, 75, 80 year old lady, uh, she had received COVID, she generalized aches and pains, and CPK was in 700, 800, but pet showed extensive myositis. So we were overconfident, although we biopsied, we thought we will give IVIG straight away. But to our surprise, when the biopsy reports came, it was vasculitis, not myositis. So, and ultimately she responded to tofacitinib. We, we couldn't say 75, 80 years, I was not confident to give cyclops. Tofacitinib, she did, she's doing extremely well. So what I'm trying to tell you is, whether COVID vaccines can cause autoimmune disease or flare up autoimmune disease or whether in a pre, uh, uh, what is that? Somebody who has been about to develop a disease, whether it will shorten the course to development of disease, who has a, already a genetic tendency is there or environmental factors are there, autoantibodies are formed whether it will precipitate a autoimmune disease, all these things, questions cannot be answered fully with any confidence. But yes, there are uh, definitely it induces some kind of uh, uh, immune response and autoimmunity also, especially with COVID shield. With Covaxin, our own data shows that more than 45 to 50 percent of them, it is not immunogenic with first dose. So Covaxin inducing anti-MDA5, I will be really, really doubtful. With, it's a less immunogenic, inactivated vaccine causing an autoimmune disease is less likely when compared to COVID shield and other uh, mRNA vaccines. So, uh, whether it is a uh, vaccine induced, I don't, I'm not sure. But another very, very important point we brought out is whether we want to treat the CMV, especially in myositis. I would like to, ex uh, because when we send a CMV titer, most of the time we get a CMV titer of 30 or 40. In some patients, it is very high, 25,000, 30,000. So, should we preemptively treat or not? That's a very important question which is yet unanswered. There are people who give valgancyclovir as a maintenance, uh, as a prophylaxis therapy when, because uh, once you give a triple therapy, there's a 75 to 80 percent risk of development of CMV. So people give valgancyclovir along with it because 85 percent is quite high. And is, uh, so, but the problem with that is that is giving inadequate treatment of valgancyclovir, sometimes they can develop a resistance. And second is leukopenia because of these drugs. So uh, my question if to more uh, experience with somebody presents with myositis, some, uh, we have given all this, or lupus, whatever. And if we give, check a CMV titer, CMV titer is 50. The symptoms are not very suggestive. There is some fever, some lung infiltrates. Should we go ahead and treat that CMV, or should we just observe? I would, uh, because there are not set guidelines. If somebody has an experience, it would be great. In this patient, I think she had CMV retinitis also. Yeah, she had high so, titer. This case is no doubt, sir. What I'm asking is generally. Uh, no, the idea is. We are not blaming vaccination, but you should be aware of but I have, such I have complications a here. for practice. Um, see, pre to the previous question, and all these patients are otherwise healthy. Either soon after the COVID illness or the vaccination, suddenly they present with something. That is the reason we are, we are uh, you know, discussing on this platform. We had horrible experiences. So uh, with all no. this secondary infection, would you still continue with uh, that amount of immunosuppression as maintenance? What is your take home point on that? Oh, okay, sorry, yeah, no, Now the patient is still on. Uh, Mycophenetomophytal uh, and yeah, two, two yeah, probably I, I wouldn't give, give Rituximab. Okay. Uh, she has been stable. 
She she's doing quite well now. Okay. Because regarding the, the the vaccine temporal relationship, we had uh, very you know bad experiences. Uh, to begin with reactive arthritis, and uh, you saw this you know man with gangrene, and a uh, lot of MDA5 related, and uh, like a sudden surge, maybe eight or nine cases. We lost one case, luckily all the rest of them recovered. Sorry, sorry. And uh, a TTP, we lost him. Uh, there's so many, you know, something, you know, triggering the autoimmunity. Some patients had lupus-like lupus -like symptoms. Yeah, Some patients classical immune mediated RA-like immune. symptoms. Okay, I think we should yes, ask. Uh, can I have a last comment? Yeah, the last question. This uh, CMB you asked about, the, we were discussing about the CMB, when uh, should we consider it to be significant? So ID specialists believe that if we can document rising uh, DNA copies, that is what is most indicative of acute infection. They do not consider anything else as, uh, you know, acute infection. The second thing is about the post-vaccine. So myself and Dr. Sharat, we were looking at our second wave uh, data from Karnataka in uh, autoimmune rheumatic disease patients. And we had about 3,000 odd patients, out of which about 48% of them had received one dose of vaccine, uh, either Covaxin and Covishield. And we did not find any significant, uh, you know, flare of autoimmune diseases or them changing their spectrum from one disease to another. Similarly, now we are looking at uh, patients who had received tofacitinib during, towards the uh, second wave of uh, COVID, who were on background therapy with tofacitinib. And so there are about 600 odd patients, and in them also, about half of them have received the vaccine, and uh, about 10% of them have also received a uh, two-dose vaccine. I mean, their vaccination was complete for their uh, time. And again, in that, we are not finding any, maybe just one case who had a flare of their underlying disease. And we're not really seeing in autoimmune rheumatic disease subsets a flare of their underlying autoimmune disease or a change in the spectrum. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I we think, have not found. Yeah, we have, we not have found. to close this session. We have to give some time to Raj Kiran. Yeah. So my final question, if she relapses yeah, again. Yeah. So can I just if have one small? If she again, what would be the better treatment next? But final question, sir. If she relapses again. <laughs> Which one? If she relapses again, what is the next better treatment? If she relapses again, what is the next better treatment? Oh, you want a question for the audience to answer or the panelist? If anyone can. relaxes, what is the next best treatment? will be the Rituximab. best. Sir, shall I there just... Are, there are reports with mRNA more of these uh, mRNA vaccines. And I had an anti joe one, one week, two weeks after uh, I think the mRNA Rituximab from Dubai, Muscat. So. Rituximab will be safe also. Yeah. I mean, I think MDA5, Rituximab is the only thing which might work or so, uh, Sapan, in this patient, we will have to target both inflammation and fibrosis. So we have to give monthly IVIG. You are on the right track with that. Probably a little longer than uh, what you are planned, probably six cycles. Maybe you can go for nine cycles. Plus, you have to target the fibrosis. So she is already on internet. I have one similar patient and recently reviewed if he could use a combo of yeah. perfenodone and entadenib. So in, there are some MDA5 lung fibrosis, IPF, and even post-COVID fibrosis where you can probably yep. look in such situation a combo of perfenodone and entadenib. We actually tried perfenodone, but she couldn't tolerate combo, it. Combo, combo. combo Start slow she and stopped. then go. Dr. John, then Benicita. Just one comment. Uh, well managed, excellent response for the treatment. But I would just want to read like in August, she gets cyclophosphamide. In September, she gets rituximab. In October, she gets uh, tofacitinib. Uh, probably, I think any of, many of her drugs, as we commented yesterday also, you need to get some time for the response. Uh, so maybe that's one thing we always have to be careful because a lot of registers also around. So probably, you know, uh, we might be impulsive, but still we have to yeah. give time. Yeah. Just one comment actually, based on the mechanism of whatever the kind of vaccines that we have, don't you think, Dr. Now it's counterintuitive that you're saying that with uh, co-vaccine, because when co we look at co-vaccine, it has... Hello. Ah. Co-vaccine actually has an adjuvant, whereas when you look at Covishield, it's an adenoviral-based vaccine. So if you really have to look at it immunologically, don't you think you would expect more... Uh, autoimmune or immunological phenomenon with covaxin rather than covishield i'm just saying based on the immunology vaccine immunology 
So, yeah, very, very interesting question. So, we have a look at our data also. Covaxin doesn't produce any immune response. That is to be the much, okay. much, the immune response is much, much less severe. We have uh, looked at the breakthrough data also. We have not been gaga about it because of a lot of political reasons. And I am, moreover, I am sitting in Hyderabad. So, I have to be careful. So, <laughs> so what, what basically, Covaxin, uh, the immune response in autoimmune disease is hardly 40 percent. 60 percent of them don't develop any antibodies or T cell response after two doses. And, uh, in looking at the general population, we have general population data also. Of you take 100, around 35 to 40 percent of general healthy adults of 20 to 40 years do not develop immune response. So whether the really this adjuvant works is a right. matter of thing. Right. Uh, we don't know. It's a uh, as because there are previously described that there is an Asia syndrome to which a lot of uh, yeah. phenomenon are actually related to adjuvants. Yet with uh, so much of Covaxin, the pandemic has come down, isn't it? That, that is the wrong thing, sir. It is not so much of Covaxin. India has used just six percent of its adults to be vaccinated with Covaxin. Okay. Ninety-four percent is Covishield, okay. and China is suffering because of inactivated vaccine. There is nothing wrong with Covaxin. It's basically, inactivated vaccine. Shall I? No, I think that's, uh, May I just answer Benzita's point? Benzita, I'm a big fan of Yehuda Schoenfield, so I follow his webinars every week, and I've been studying the Asia syndrome. Now, right. most of the times, the Asia syndrome, the adjuvant has to have aluminium. The yeah, funny part is it's aluminium or heavy right. metal, and I don't think Covaxin has no, Yeah, Covaxin, so I, the adjuvant is different. Yeah. It's not an alum containing. Yeah, regarding your question, that's why I was saying the maximum case is actually with mRNA. If you look at published literature, mRNA yes. has the maximum. And regarding uh, what Vinita ma'am said, we also looked at our data, and I think Mira is around at uh, at our uh, both at my own center and also at the government hospital we go to. And I think Anuj had also got his data published. Uh, that uh, and there were about uh, there were flares with vaccines, but it has been seen in literature also published literature that's because patients tend to st uh, stop their drugs when they take the vaccine. So the flare of disease is due to stoppage of the the drugs, and it was more I think in our series with connective tissue diseases than with arthritis because they were on azathioprine and MMF and so they stopped on their own and that was probably the reason why they, so we saw those kind of flares in our patients. Yeah, Just last comment sir, yeah. uh, regarding this flare, very interesting data, we have two RCTs running and both are finished. So what, in one RCT we had stopped methotrexate during the first dose and the second dose and in the second RCT we have just stopped during the second dose alone. Surprisingly, if you stop methotrexate during the second dose, the flare rate is not high. But if you do stop during the both dose, the flare rate is very high. So uh, flare, if you want to, and immune response is equal in both. Even if you do stop during first dose and second dose, or only during the second dose, immune response is achieved. So I think uh, it is ideal to stop only during the booster dose, because only during the second dose, because it will not cause flare, and you are going to achieve the almost the similar immune response. So that is the reason uh, we are, our analysis is going on, but this is the larger picture. Yeah, we'll go to Rajkiran to sum up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Krishnamurthy, sir. I think both uh, Krishnamurthy, sir, and Sharath have given me signals to quickly wrap up. So just I'll not take much time. And I think most of them uh, have discussed the most important points. Yeah, I am audible now? Yeah. yeah. So most of the things have uh, already been discussed and it has been a lot of repetition of discussions also. So just uh, for the interest of postgraduates, uh, I'll, I'll just mention few points in a couple of minutes. Uh, the first case is uh, about the post-COVID arthritis. It's more of a simple musculoskeletal symptoms related to COVID. And uh, next three cases are related to more of a systemic uh, manifestations and uh, thrombotic manifestations and gangrene are related to COVID and COVID vaccination. The important thing in uh, first case is the, uh, regarding post-COVID arthritis, we treat with steroids and NSAIDs initially to begin with. If they don't improve, you can add uh, sulfasalazin. But again, the takeaway message is don't quickly stop the DMRs. So DMRs, if you start, give it some time, especially drugs like sulfasalazin may take two or three months time to work. And if uh, NSAIDs, one NSAID doesn't work, you can switch to another NSAID. And don't jump into newer drugs, newer fancy drugs like jack inhibitors quickly. You have other conventional drugs like methotrexate to add with. So this is a message uh, for the first case. And coming to uh, 
case uh, 2 and case 4, both of them uh, were attributed to COVID vaccine induced uh, coagulation problems. But again, both of them had a very short duration uh, post vaccine. They have developed symptoms only two days, three days. So, uh, as Dr. Sharad sir said, what we have observed is in the last one year, either patients have taken uh, COVID vaccination or either patients have had uh, COVID disease. So most of them are some or other way associated with COVID. So it's not uh, like it's, it should not be like we immediately jump into conclusion that it could be related to COVID uh, disease or COVID vaccination. But having said that, most of the house believes that uh, COVID or COVID infection will cause immune activation. So these events can trigger an underlying autoimmune disease or it can worsen the uh, existing autoimmune disease or it can transform into new autoimmune disease. Again, there is a mix of opinion in house. Uh, Dr. Vinita ma'am told that in Karnataka data, they have said that most of the, almost 48% of the patients who have uh, taken COVID vaccination, they didn't had much change. So we need to observe in the future. We need to see uh, like how it goes in the future. The other thing is about uh, the MIS. Uh, like whenever we diagnose MIS, as it was said, like it has a long list of exclusion factors rather than immediately jumping into whether it's post COVID or COVID vaccine, try to look at other uh, exclusion factors, whether it is caused by uh, any other uh, uh, things other than COVID or COVID vaccination. And most of these, uh, most of these uh, uh, MIS type of symptoms, they have lots of complement activation, cryofibrinogema, and the complement levels might be low. And there is a similarity between, uh, in the presentation, there's a similarity between this COVID-induced MIS or MIS and TMA and CAPS. So there is always a confusion. At the clinical outlook, I think now most of the postgraduates, they can immediately diagnose uh, if this kind of phenotype, any patient, if they see with this uh, kind of phenotype of digital ischemia, low platelets, and high DDMR and high ferritin, low complements, they can think of these differentials like uh, uh, TMA, CAPS, and MIS. So, so we need to look carefully in peripheral smear for cystiocytes to demonstrate. And the treatment more or less is same for all these things. Uh, you IV methylprednisolone, IVIG, and uh, plasma exchange, uh, in some cases, uh, rituximab, so this, and cyclophosphamide. So these, these are the things to be kept in mind. And uh, the uh, and last one is an interesting case where uh, anti-MDA5 uh, uh, like, uh, symptom, uh, syndrome had developed in a patient who had an association with uh, co Covaxin. Again, we really don't know whether it is Covaxin induced or not, because as Fashenai was telling, it's very weak immunogenic with the first dose. And uh, having said that, most of the uh, uh, like uh, consultants in house, they, are, they, are also, they have also experienced this, they have seen these uh, cases of uh, dermatomyositis type of presentations following COVID and COVID vaccination. And Sharath sir and myself, we had seen in Hyderabad some of the cases who had anti-MDF5 uh, post-vaccination. We really don't know whether it's related to that or not, but there are some cases definitely increased. And the SS for uh, uh, myositis profile has also increased significantly. Last one to two years, we have been increasingly doing myo profiles rather than earlier. And we are picking up most of these cases. So we really don't know what's the temporal association. But uh, again, the treatment uh, already has been discussed extensively. We try everything with uh, steroids, IVIG, reduximabs. And finally, to conclude, I think COVID has taught us uh, a lot of things in last one year. And I think, uh, at least for me, I think um, my internal medicine has been significantly brushed up in last two years. Otherwise, uh, before two years, I think most of us, we were feeling like an orthopedician. So then I think with COVID, generally with a lot of discussion has been brought out and most of them uh, felt like a true physicians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to, any, anything to be presented? Yeah, before I sum up, I would like to thank my expert panelists to my left and the dynamo to the right, uh, master of summing up. Over to Sharath and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Please uh, come over here. Uh, the winner of this session is Joseph T. Anthony. Congratulations.
So now we move on to the next session. We've already had one case of myositis discussed in the last session. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Pooja Srivastava from Ahmedabad. And we have Dr. Vinita and Dr. Liza, who are the panelists. And the rapporteur is Dr. Benzita. So it's all women's show, in contrast to the first session where it was all men's show. Thank you. So with the very happening and interesting uh, disease COVID, which has perplexed us in last two years, we move on to another disease, which all of us see. And probably uh, as compared to COVID here, we need little more patience to treat because it's a long disease. Uh, and to discuss our cases, we have two leading researchers in myositis. Dr. Lisa Rajshekhar and Dr. Vinita Shoga and Dr. Benzita will be summing up our case. So uh, we know that overall course of myositis is disease onset. Uh, and it's a generally a subacute disease which tends to happen over a, uh, which tends to develop symptoms uh, over weeks to months. It takes, there's a lag in diagnosis, and then there's treatment and different outcomes. And we have hurdles all over in diagnosis, in treatment, and uh, there are a lot many problems like comorbid illness, intercurrent infection, and complications of disease which make it difficult. So we have four presenters who will be discussing their very interesting cases. So with that, we move on to our first case, which will be discussed by Dr. Challa Madhuri from uh, Nizam Institute. Welcome, Dr. Madhuri. A very good morning to everyone. Um, so, having heard that interesting rapidly progressive ILD uh, in the last session, I would like to present another interesting extramuscular manifestation, again in MDFI dermatomyositis. So, this uh, case is about a 48-year-old lady who was symptomatic since April 2021. And she reports that all her symptoms have started after a couple of weeks of undergoing DNC for her menorrhagia. And then uh, she went to a lot of other doctors and finally she presented to us in July 2021 with uh, generalized pruritic skin rash for four months and difficulty in getting up from squatting positions suggestive of proximal muscle weakness for three months and interestingly yellowish discoloration of her eyes for one day. So on examination from top to bottom there was loss of hair with exfoliation and scaling on the scalp there was heliotrope rash, V sign, shawl sign, and on the buttocks and thighs, there were multiple paniculitis-like lesions. And there was this interesting ulcerated inverse Gottron sign and an ulcerated Gottron sign. And she had generalized pruritic papilloulcerative rash on the legs, elbows, and over the back. So with this, uh, interesting cutaneous manifestations and her uh, muscle weakness. We suspected myositis and uh, on examination we also found deep ictris, mild pallor and there was no pedal edema. And on systemic examination there was uh, hepatomegaly 4 centimeters below right costal margin which was firm, non-tender and a smooth margin. There was no ascites, no flaps. There was wrist, elbow and shoulder arthritis. 
and mild muscle tenderness over the arms and thighs and she had muscle weakness predominantly uh, the hip extensors and the hip abductors with an MMT8 score of F59 out of 80. So with this we went ahead with the myositis profile and no doubt her MDA5 was strong positive. So all this was interesting as a first year trainee but the real challenge came up with the hepatic enigma, the jaundice. In April 21, when uh, she was first being evaluated for her uh, menorrhagia, her LFT was almost normal with an SGOT of 51, SGPT of 49 and ALP of 168 and normal bilirubin. But when she had come to us, the SGOT has climbed to 240 and the ALP had increased to 314 and there was uh, hyperbilirubinemia of 8. So, suggestive of a cholestatic picture. And in the course of illness, the enzymes rised also the ALP and the bilirubin remained almost static. So this uh, elevation uh, was confirmed because of the liver origin, the GGT was elevated and her CPK was normal, LDH was mildly elevated. Her albumin was 2.7 and there was no coagulopathy. And given her uh, picture of hepatitis in the background of uh, autoimmune disease, we also suspected any overlap uh, so, ANAIF was done, which was negative. Complements were normal. Interestingly, her fasting lipid profile, which was normal in April 21, had uh, drastically changed by July 2021. And on further workup, we had done a USG elastography, and which had shown hepatomegaly with grade 1 to 2 fatty liver with mild to moderate fibrosis. Uh, thanks to our uh, medical gastro colleagues, we got an MRCP done too, uh, with showed that the pancreas, CBD and gallbladder was normal. So there was no uh, extra hepatic obstruction. So this uh, differential diagnosis of this hepatic dysfunction, we kept a uh, few DDs. Uh, the viral hepatitis, all the serologies were negative. Autoimmune hepatitis, uh, her autoimmune hepatitis panel done twice uh, was negative, once by the gast gastroenterology specialist and once by us and her ANA also was negative. And NASH was kept as a possibility because of the fatty liver. However, her BMI was 26, little over a weight, and HbA1c was 6, and there was no other features of metabolic syndrome. However, NASH is known to occur in lean people too. And drug-induced liver injury, yes, that was kept as a differential. Uh, she uh, gave history of use of uh, alternative medicines, mainly topical, and uh, that was uh, for five days, almost a month before presentation. And other differential of Wilson's was kept, but the workup for the same was negative. And then we came back to dermatomyositis, whether this hepatitis was associated with dermatomyositis. So we went ahead with a CT abdomen, um, and a PET CT also was done uh, later down in the course uh, to rule out other malignancies. So that was suggestive of hepatomegaly. We can see the clear distinction in the uh, 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 hyperdensity of the liver compared to the spleen, hypodensity of the liver compared to the spleen. And uh, there is increased uptake in the liver. And HRCT done uh, uh, to rule out ILD showed just early ILD. So then we were uh, thinking whether a liver biopsy would help us. And yes, we did it. Uh, this had shown extensive macrovesicular uh, steatosis and on um, higher magnification there was balloon degeneration and there were very occasional foci of lobular inflammatory infiltrate which are not present in this slide. So it was primarily fatty degeneration. So the final diagnosis that we considered was liver dysfunction, steatohepatitis attributed to MDFI dermatomyositis or a combination of MDFI dermatomyositis and NASH. Then we were perplexed as to uh, what to give her for the treatment. Uh, when she first came to us, we had started her on 1 mg per kg steroids. And then we were uh, just monitoring her for the next uh, week or so. And then we had to start her on some immunosuppression. So we uh, started her on low dose tacrolimus. And then uh, after a, a week or 10 days, 
there was a decrease in the transaminitis and the bilirubin remained static. Then we slowly added mycophenolate, one gram, and then we just monitored her over the next few weeks. And uh, vitamin E, saroglitazar, s adenosyl methionine were added by the gastroenterology counterparts suspecting NASH. So, as we can see, the hepatitis was recovering over the next uh, two months. And in October, when she came to us, the SGOT was 108 and SGPT was 82. And the bilirubin had come down to 2 and 1. So, but here, uh, uh, in the last week of October, when she had come to us, she had this painful buttock paniculitis with fever and chills. This was increasing in size and was bothering her. She could not sit, she could not walk. So we had to readmit her uh, here. And uh, again, we had extensively evaluated both for infection and inflammation. So uh, a skin biopsy was done here, which uh, from the buttock paniculitis, which showed interface dermatitis which was mild and basal cell vacuolation and pigment incontinence. Uh, the pigment incontinence. So, uh, at this point of time, because of the ongoing cutaneous inflammation, uh, which was very severe and debilitating, we had planned to give her rituximab two grams, two weeks apart, one gram each. So, after this, we can see over the next uh, two months, uh, the Hepatitis was recovering and she was doing well. Actually, by March, the size of the lesion had come down. And then she ca came to us in the last week of uh, Feb, March first week, uh, saying that her uh, uh, paniculitis size had come down, but there was some persistent pus discharge from the skin biopsy site, which was not responding to multiple courses of antibiotics. So uh, we had taken plastic surgery opinion and uh, this was the ulcer which looked quite superficial, but once uh, they have started the debridement, it was quite deep-seated. And then uh, we sent all the cultures and H HPE again, just to be sure and just to not forget TB in the background, given so much immunosuppression. And then uh, the tissue gene expert was positive. And obviously the uh, skin biopsy had shown a necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. So. Then, uh, in the first week of March, we had started her on ATT and MMF uh, 2 grams per day was continued. Till date, she is doing well. Her hepatitis uh, has completely resolved and uh, her muscle weakness has improved. Uh, her MMT8 score currently is 62 out of 80 and uh, she is doing well on the current therapy. So, uh, my questions would be, is NASH and MDFI dermatomyositis in this case just a coincidence or is liver dis dysfunction really described as an extramuscular manifestation? And what precautions or prophylaxis should we plan uh, before initiating immunomodulatory treatment for patients with metabolic syndrome? And what are the treatment options for IIM in the setting of liver dysfunction? Thank you, Dr. Madhuri. Uh, uh, so now we open this case for questions from audience. Yes, sir. Sapan, sir. Well, madam, AGOT is more than AGPT with al increased alkaline phosphatases. So there are some drugs which cause a cholestatic damage, phenothiazine derivatives, NHAD, even tacrolimus also. Uh, but tacrolimus cholestatic hepatitis uh, is self-limiting. It just require the dose to stop for some time, it will become normal. And, uh, but uh, this um, scan, fibro scan, uh, there may be some intrinsic liver disease that may be better precipitated. Coincidentally, uh, before these antibodies were available, uh, I had seen one case of rapidly proliferating ILD in myositis, and I lost that lady. I think Sir had also seen. Uh, she had been referred to senior mean cirrhosis and there she, there was extensive steatosis in the liver and uh, first time I saw that steroids uh, can actually cause that and can be a culprit there. So I don't know if it's a coexistence with MDF or there are other reports, number one and number two is uh, I don't know if steroids are the right choice in these patients, maybe you should give, we should give something else. You did give eventually but I think one should try and avoid steroids in these cases. 
The other thing, panicleitis in India commonest cause is tuberculosis. So uh, with that, I invite our panelists to discuss more on this. Uh, Vinita, ma'am. So the, uh, regarding the first question, uh, whether NASH and MDA5 is just a coexistence, uh, so to me, it appears that it just just a coincidence, coincidence that the two diseases were picked up uh, almost silent, uh, simultaneously. And when we try to look at the uh, liver dysfunction uh, in MDA5 uh, dermatomyositis patients, again, there are very few case reports which have talked on this uh, extra muscular manifestation of MDA5 uh, uh, related manifestations. So I think we just landed up with uh, rare manifestations and rare comorbidities, uncommon comorbidities together in this uh, patient. But uh, the immunosuppressants which have been used, I think the first line, uh, despite whatever is happening in the liver, the liver biopsy showing uh, steatohepatitis, the first drug of choice has to be steroids, probably more guarded and carefully monitor what is happening to the, uh, the let's say, the size of hepat liver clinically and also the liver enzymes and then take a call about uh, uh, whether to escalate the steroids or to downscale the steroids based on what we find. With respect to the second line immunomodulators, uh, the best choices are of course the tacrolimus and uh, mycophenolate, both of them are safe uh, in patients with liver disease and so is azathioprine. So I think tacrolimus and MMF in uh, conjunction or sequentially how it has been used in this patient is the best way forwards uh, for this patient. Uh, the only other thing, if it was not a myositis patient, let's say it was a RA patient and you were planning to use TNF inhibitors, then TNF inhibitors have been shown to reduce the liver fibrosis. Um, and that, that could be a very good choice, but that's not relevant in our patient. And uh, what else? That's about it. So <clears throat> I would like to add a few things here. Thank you, Dr. Sappan, for that extra case because we've searched literature and not found evidence of such significant liver disease in the setting of MDA5. Uh, and, but you say that it was after steroids and you're advising that steroids should not be used. But if you looked at this case carefully, I mean, there is no steroids before. Correct. It is disease along with the cut extensive cutaneous inflammation and very little muscle, which uh, is she's shown. And then the use of steroids and the immunosuppression and the expected uh, time frame in which they would work fell in line with the improvement in liver dysfunction. So I think despite no evidence in literature, I think that these are uh, pathophysiologically related. The final proof I think Madhuri will come when we can repeat a liver biopsy on her now and show reversal of this extensive uh, steatosis that you have shown. What is also very interesting, and I am not the best person to comment on this, is the findings on elastography, which is used extensively because it is non-invasive, which showed fibrosis, but you did not demonstrate any fibrosis. Now, will this extensive steatosis turn into fibrosis, or will it reverse, or has it already reversed? I think it would have reversed because she is showing such good liver function now. So that's my take on the liver dysfunction in this in this particular patient. Um, if we move on to next, yeah, Amita ma'am. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, because ma'am, I have also seen two cases of MDA5 steatosis uh, with a severe liver dysfunction. One of them biopsy showed the same thing. The other patient around uh, two to three weeks later developed macrophage activation. Uh, so, and we lost that patient, that macrophage action. And steatosis patient, as you said, tacrolimus and mycophenolate, it comes down automatically. So, it is seen. I am not sure why they say causal. So, in that time, we also reviewed the literature. We couldn't find anything, but yes. So, uh, Madhuri, there was a doubt uh, that the first biopsy on paniculitis, which you did, was it, did it include enough of the subcutaneous fat? And it's a recommendation that whenever you do a biopsy, especially when you're suspecting paniculitis, you should have the fat but you showed us only the superficial part. So did it have fat? Uh, yes, ma'am, it did have fat, but no finding was there. So I just wanted to highlight that. Because the doubt is whether the, it was tuberculous paniculitis from yes. that time. Yes. Again, I think the way that she improved with then f another excavation suggested that it was a 
uh, infection of the paniculitis. So the yesterday when uh, we tried to review the uh, tuberculous myositis, so in that we figured that there were a series in which uh, about 10 percent from, it was from Taiwan, about 8 or 9 percent of patients had uh, in what was called in insertional, not insertional, procedure related uh, tuberculosis. So following a biopsy, they have developed tuberculosis. So I, I am not sure if that is what is the case here. No. So can I add, in those cases where you get biopsy associated tuberculosis, it's generally non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So that is generally negative on gene expert. So this is most likely to be mycobacterium tuberculosis. We have also seen two patients of myositis who came with myositis flare. And when we did a repeat muscle biopsy, they actually had mycobacterium tuberculosis inside the muscle. So that can happen because of immunosuppression which these patients are getting. What Lisa said regarding this association pathophysiologically, before these, all these antibodies came, a lot of these patients would get admitted in gastroenterology with jaundice. And when we used to give steroids, they would all improve. So there is a link and steroids are recommended to be given to them, you just follow up their LFT. So I just have a suggestion for this patient that are we following up her fibro scan regularly. That will tell us if the fibrosis has improved after using this therapy or not. Yes, this area needs to be explored. There are only two, three case reports when we reviewed the literature. There is not much data on uh, this. Pooja, just I have a small question and possibly a learning point that I've picked up in Mumbai. The fibro scans. So I work with a very senior hepatologist in Mumbai, possibly the first man to actually do exclusive hepatology in the country. And he just kind of throws the fibro scan out of the window because he says the RFE cannot differentiate between your fibrosis and the fat fraction. So all the RFEs that I do and send to him, so I've stopped doing the RFEs now, I send the patient straight to him. Because what he does is an MR elastogram and he's kind of shown me data to say that you can actually avoid a biopsy because it tells you how much fat fraction is there. The MR elastogram, of course, is an expensive investigation, but then you are avoiding the cost of the bio and the morbidity of the biopsy. And so he just says that, look, I'll admit for a day and I'll give a biopsy. Instead, I'm spending 8,000 rupees on an MR elastogram, but I'm giving you the percentage fat fraction. And that's what he does. I thought I'd just bring that out for you people. That's a very important... Uh learning point because we also found that if you do uh, this elastogram from two different centers on two consecutive days there is a there's quite a lot of variability and we don't know which one is right and which one is wrong yes sir yeah uh, excellent case very well presented what was the inr uh, of normal. this patient it normal. was normal. normal okay so i think you know just uh, one uh, very common learning point Liver has got enormous reserve. So when we see this type of liver abnormalities, there is still a time to sort of uh, do a thorough workup as you had done rightly in this case and try to eliminate uh, the root cause of the problem. And this is completely opposed to what we see in the renal involvement in many diseases. Thank you. I think we'll take Actually, up two quick comments, Dr. Rochika and Dr. Varun, and then we'll move, up, uh, move to the second case. We would like one comment from a panelist about the management of uh, patients with underlying metabolic syndrome and non-alcoholic fetal liver disease kind of the spectrum where we have to initiate uh, for our postgraduates, where we need to initiate high-grade immunosuppression. What all precautions we should uh, do before. So first, we'll ask Dr. Ruchika followed by Dr. Varun and comments from a panelist and we move on to second case. I just wanted to add on this fibroscan thing only. Uh, even our center also, the hepatologist, when the LFTs are very high or when the patient has a decompensated liver disease, sometimes they just uh, throw away these RFE scan values and they, because they don't trust those in the setting of uh, highly deranged liver dysfunction. Just uh, two questions. Uh, one was that is uh, now MDA-5 only being, uh, most of the cases which were presented, these are all uh, by uh, uh, this euroimmune immunoblot only, that's the only one or is there any ELISA also? I just no. wanted to know all and second was uh, the fact that uh, there were some comments made about using rituximab in COVID, but do we have enough data to say that in a sick patient that, you know, as regards to COVID, cyclophosphamide or uh, CNIs are safer? or they're all the same. We know that some drugs are safer, the conventional DMARDs and all, but uh, when we say rituximab is bad, I think, 
I at least felt that we don't have enough data about endoxin and uh, CNI, or are they known to be safer? So I want to take you back to the KRA data which I was referring to. So in, during the first wave, we have uh, data of about 9,000 changed patients, which has gone for publication. And during the second wave, we have data on about 3,000 odd patients. And when we did the analysis, we did not find that rituximab, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, tacrolimus, any of them influence the, uh, the, uh, the occurrence of COVID-19 or uh, the impact on mortality. The parameters which influenced uh, occurrence and outcome were diabetes, hypertension, elderly age, male sex, underlying lung disease, and one more that was smoking. These were the only parameters which influenced. Methotrexate, those who were using methotrexate had a lesser incidence of COVID-19, but uh, we could not finally, it, it didn't work out in the final statistic analysis. This, this was our results. Ma'am, on small half a second comment, because uh, somebody talked about macrophage activation syndrome, I feel instead of invoking Nash in a thin lady, we should always keep a rumbling type of uh, macrophage activation because she had so much of inflammatory myositis and uh, triglycerides were high and it settled with immunotherapy gradually. So we can't invoke NASH which is usually progressive. Agree sir, this, this was probably manifestation of disease itself. So we move on to the second case which will be presented by Dr. Nam, uh, Naman Jain. Good morning everyone. Today I'm going to present a case, SGS PN-like presentation in dermatomyositis complicated by hepatitis C. 35-year-old female presented with two-month history of gradually progressing symmetrical proximal muscle weakness of both upper limb and lower limb associated with myalgia. She also has erythematous photosensitive skin rash over the interior chest, nape of the neck, dorsum of the finger, and extensor of the elbow. There was no associated history of fever, weight loss, night sweats, joint pains, oral or mucosal lesions, sicka symptoms or uh, any other CTD features. No significant past history and family history. On examination, general physical examination and vitals were uh, normal. Local cutaneous examination is described. Musculoskeletal examination, there was no synovitis. In the central nervous system examination, on motor examination, bilateral upper and lower limb proximal power was 4 by 5 uh, with retained distal power 5 by 5 and no truncal weakness. MMT8 was not done because of the severe myalgia. The patient could not, was not able to lie. On investigations, uh, when patient present, uh, presented to us, he has some uh, investigation which was done outside. In the, in the uh, hemogram, the platelet was uh, slightly in the lower range. Transaminitis was there, SGOT more than SGPT. CPK was raised. Hepatitis B and HIV was done outside, that was negative. When she presented to us, we uh, did a couple of investigation. In this, CPK was raised. Hepatitis C virus antibody came out to be positive. Then we uh, <coughs> further evaluate, and the viral load was uh, high. And the inflammatory markers were also high. CRP was 21.9, and uh, F13 was high. ANA was done, uh, that was negative, and myositis panel was negative. So a provisional diagnosis of dermatomyositis was made based on the proximal muscle weakness, characteristic cutaneous rash, and elevated CPK. On evaluations, he was incidentally found to, uh, to be seropositive for hepatitis C without any features of any jaundice or any chronic liver disease or any hepatocellular carcinoma. So he was charted on high-dose oral glucocorticoid of dose of 1 milligram per kg per day along with the antiviral sofusovavir and valdasvir uh, as per the gastroenterology advice. So two weeks later, uh, she presented with progressive blistering cutaneous lesions over the anterior and posterior trunk, armpit, both thighs, perineal regions, and lesion ruptured um, to form superficial erosions. We can see the lesions here. Uh, there, there was no mucosal involvement. The, uh, her palms, soles uh, were not involved. Lesions were uh, associated with severe pain. There was no itching. No history of any other uh, fever or any constitutional symptoms. Uh, no history of any over-the-counter over -counter medications. Uh, when she presented to us, we have done the uh, following workup. The CBC was normal. CPK has came down from the past. Uh, albumin was low and the swab culture shows uh, pseudomonas species. So uh, we have think, uh, thought of this three differential diagnosis. The femphigus vulgaris, 
uh, drug induced uh, TEN because she was started on an antiviral drug and TEN related to dermatomyositis. So, Femficus vulgaris, <laughs> it is more of uh, uh, seen in uh, middle aged female more than male, uh, have uh, autoimmune etiology, uh, have, they have uh, mucosal involvement. Uh, histopathology will show uh, extensive progressive acanthosis and uh, supravasal vesicle formation and the DIF, DIF will be positive. In to toxic epidermal necrolysis, necrolysis it is, there is no age and sex predilections. Uh, there was, uh, the exact pathogenesis is not known. There is thought to be delayed hypersensitivity reaction, mostly secondary to drugs. Mucosal involvement is seen in most of the TN cases. And there is extensive sloughing. And the histopathology shows extensive keratinocyte necrosis or dermoepidermal suppression. DIEF is negative in most of the TN patients. In our patient, our patient is middle-aged female, uh, case of dermatomyositis with hepatitis C. There was no mucosal involvement at the presentation. Uh, there was more than almost, uh, more than 50% body surface area which was involved. Uh, we have done the biopsy of the skin that was uh, not suggestive uh, of any keratinocyte necrosis or any dermoepidermal suppression. The, there were more of non-specific changes, and DIF was negative in this case. This is the biopsy in the right si right hand side, which shows uh, there is a hyperkeratosis with uh, irregular acanthosis, and uh, so there is so in a perivascular infiltrate, perivascular and interstitial infiltrate also. So. We have made a diagnosis on the basis of, skin, although skin biopsy was inconclusive, but the distribution of the blistering lesions were same uh, in the areas that were previously erythematous. And there was no mucosal lesions, there was no relevant drug history, and DIF was negative. So we made a diagnosis of TEN like cutaneous flare, secondary to dermatomyositis. We started the IVIG. Uh, at 2 gram per kg over 5 days and the lesions uh, improved. We can see this is a pre-IVIG and the post-IVIG uh, therapy. The lesions almost re -epithelized. Patient is better and is in regular follow-up. So toxic epidermal necrolysis is a potentially life-threatening condition characterized by widespread erythema, necrosis and bullous detachment resulting in exfoliation. It can lead to sepsis and death. Most common causes are drugs. Other potential etiology include infection, malignancy, and autoimmune disorders. TN-like cutaneous lupus is well described, but TN-like manifestation in dermatomyositis is very uncommon. Only few case reports are available, and that, uh, that too is uh, associated with anti-MDA5 antibody. The exact pathogenesis is not clear, as I mentioned. It is thought to be delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So TN is basically a clinical diagnosis. Histopathology just assists the diagnosis. And management comprises of supportive care and pharmacological therapy. Thank you. Sir. Okay. So uh, with that, we invite questions from the audience on this case, or comments from the audience. And what were dermo There were any. No, no, because uh, Steven Johnson syndrome involves yes, dermo epidural junction. Yes, I have not seen a single case without uh, Steven uh, dermo epidural junction. Whereas 10 will not involve dermo epidural junction. Um, you haven't explored enough the relationship between the start of antivirals yes, and the tent. Yes, so sir, can you tell us? We have explored. There was very few case reports. What were the antivirals used in this case? Sofosobavir and Velbodazvir. And both of them have no association with tent. Uh, uh, there are very one or two QF in just case reports, ma'am. No consistent association. And we have continued the medication. And the lesions were uh, already in the old erythematous lesions. Okay. And we continued throughout the day. and. Uh, there was no exacerbation of the lesion. So another thing is like you spoke about differentials of pemphigus vulgaris. Yes. So that's basically a mucosal disease. So the brunt is on the mucosa. Mm. Here you say that there was only no cutaneous mucosa. involvement. Yes, no mucosa. No mucosa. So the other blistering diseases, the pemphigus foliaceous, which involves skin and which can be very superficial yes, because it occurs in the stratum corneum, which is just very close to the surface. 
and and in that pemphigus foliaceus when you do a biopsy because the epidermis is so fragile if you don't include it in the biopsy and take care to send it with the sample then you will find uh, information like this non specific inflammation so looking at the biopsy in a proper orientation so that you can see the epidermis and see the cleft in the subcorneal layer is an important uh, learning point which dermatologists teach uh, figures foliaceous we never get it to treat but that's an important point to keep in mind however uh, i think the absence of any uh, uh, if yes. uh, which would have been positive in uh, pemphigus foliaceous suggests that this is 10. Yes. So uh, we can discuss this, how should we manage or treat patients with myositis who have positive viral markers, how to go about it. Vinita uh, ma'am? So from what I understand is that, I mean, we've seen very few cases in whom uh, they, we find that uh, the viral marker, especially hepatitis C, is positive at the time of diagnosis of myositis. So I have not encountered such a situation, at, at least in my cohort. So when we looked up, they say that uh, you can start the uh, immunosuppressants as per whatever you would need for the myositis along with the treatment for HCV. And currently there are very good antiviral drugs which require treatment one protocol says 12 weeks and another protocol says 8 weeks. So they say that you can, you don't have to wait to start the immunosuppression and you just do whatever you need to uh, treat for myositis. I think our third question has already been addressed. Lisa ma'am answered that. So we move on to discuss more about management. So uh, generally we expect improvement after we start steroids. So can our patients with myositis worsen, actually worsen after starting treatment? Uh, Lisa ma'am. Um, I mean, there are subsets who will not respond to your therapy. So, if I can take this question as what would define a refractory myositis. So, um, in the RIM trial, I was just reading that, uh, they defined refractory myositis as uh, no response to 1 milligram per kg steroids after one month. And uh, no response to DMRs, you use anyone, whichever you use, after three months. So that is, if there's no response, it's called refractory. Your question is, can it worsen? So that, yeah, so which just means that your disease, your therapy has not worked and your disease is ongoing. So it's not start worsening after starting treatment, it's just non-response to therapy. And that is a subset where everybody gets nervous. And that's why we've seen in many cases that there's a lot of polytherapy which goes on that needs to be monitored on a day-to-day -day basis. With that, we, can, we have time uh, for this case. So, uh, what is the average timeline of expecting response after we have started a treatment? We have seen yesterday also and today also, sometimes we become too impatient. So, in myositis, generally we require patients. So, what, what, should, we, uh, what should we expect uh, the timeline of improvement? I can, we can discuss that. Lisa ma'am and Vinita ma'am both can comment. So, I find that steroids work very f quick within a couple of days is what I look at and not in hours for sure and usually by the end of three days, five days, we do tend to see a decline in the muscle enzymes and we start finding that the patients have uh, improvement in their uh, um, muscle power. Uh, IVIG also works very fast, couple of days, usually by three days we can see improvement in their muscle power, their muscle enzymes start declining. All others take couple of weeks. So, um, as Pooja rightly pointed out, myositis is a disease which requires a lot of patience. So, if you're not patient, we tend to keep switching therapies and uh, land up in uh, trouble. Along with this, it is very important to remember to uh, give uh, exercises. The early institution of uh, exercises, rehabilitation, that is a very important key to good uh, outcome at the end of four weeks, three months, six months, one year, five years. So I think that's exercise is something which we forget. We focus mainly on therapy and we forget the ancillary parts. So, so uh, I would say, I would just talk about IVIG and when to start it. I think all of us who are experienced in treating myositis would like to send this message that it, 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 you could wait, not do polypharmacy. Having said that, 
if you find the patient is on the edge, like you have a pharyngeal weakness, he's aspirating, you have a respiratory muscle weakness, and then two weeks have not shown a response, that's where we would start considering IVIG. And uh, as we all were discussing yesterday before this panel, uh, IVIG has now found a FDA approval for treatment of dermatomyositis. And looking at, and that's only as an, uh, what I could find was only an abstract but, uh, presented at the uh, ULAR. And uh, the data there, uh, there's a beautiful graph which shows that, uh, which shows uh, response over 16 weeks in uh, two arms, IVIG arm versus the placebo arm. And the maximum response is happening around four to eight weeks after institution of IVIG. And uh, there is objectivity in assessing response that we all know that IMAX has published uh, how to assess response in myositis. And there is a, uh, a six core set criteria which you have to measure. And in each of them, you have to demonstrate that there is at least a 20% improvement. If you have 20% improvement in two out of these six, then you say that you have achieved minimum improvement of the myositis. Now, this is okay. I mean, but as clinicians, we can easily make out at the bedside whether you are experiencing a response with the therapy that you are giving. And I think uh, if you know your pharmacokinetics of drugs very well, and you know your patient's resources very well, that's the best way to match when you would go in with expensive therapy or even if it is expensive, it is absolutely mandatory because based on the clinical. Ma'am. Amita, ma'am. I would like to disagree with Vinita that very rarely would you see a response at two to three days. What you get at two to three days is a euphoria because of the steroids. Actually, to see objective and these, the things which really, what I mean, whatever I have seen, I don't have, I mean, published data or review, but whatever two, three hundred patients I must have seen, is that it depends on what is the duration of disease the patient has come to you, how severe is the weakness, and what are the other associated factors. Few patients would definitely show you a response within a week's time while the patient is in the hospital, but most patients would not show you a substantial response. The CPK levels may show you a decline at a time of, if you repeat after a week or so, there may be a decline. But that doesn't go hand in hand with the muscle weakness improvement. And really, as what Pooja was saying, you need to be patient. Because if we say it responds in three days, then three days later, somebody will start another therapy. It hasn't improved in three days. No. It takes weeks. Sometimes it takes about four to six weeks. And you obviously have to balance. If patient is very sick, you will take a call much faster. If patient is having a moderate weakness, can be sent home. You call the patient back after a month. And as Lisa said, the definition, what has been taken is four weeks. That if you don't have response to one milligram per kg steroids at four weeks, then you take a call to add something more. I, mean, I would go slow and steady. So, uh, ma'am, uh, we have been seeing, we have yeah. recently been reviewing our literature. And we are finding that there is a subset of especially dermatomyositis patients. And maybe our center is seeing more of overlap myositis rather than uh, polymyositis or NAM. And we are finding that there is an early response. You get a, as you're saying, it might be just a euphoria, but you do see a decline in the muscle enzymes, uh, which happens as early as 72 hours. Now here the question is if the IMAX is looking at 20% improvement at four weeks. And that is, I feel oh, maybe it's not right even for RA to look at ACR 20 at 12 weeks, which is from patient perspective, it's just not on that we look at only 20% improvement at four weeks. So I think we need to work around, uh, because the, we are set, the muscle atrophy is setting in at all these times, and the recovery becomes that much more difficult for our patients. So I think what we have been traditionally doing, we probably need to change the way we have been treating myositis. And it may not be entirely wrong uh, to switch early rather than late, but we have to have guidelines, or we have to have pa parameters which have to be defined, and based on that, we make a switch rather than based on our whims and fancy. And Dr. Vinita and Amit both are right. My concept is, it is the duration of myositis and severity to myositis. Muscle which is lost involved is first to respond. Which is the first involved, lost to respond, this one. Uh, second thing, uh, the drugs we use, like uh, uh, um, Salomedrol, effect starts instantly, peak has come to within hours. Whereas hydrocortisone effects starts after three to four hours, peak effects to six to eight hours. Each steroid can offload the drug, 
and uh, their kinetics excretion, so many things are there, peak levels. The peak level is still right and peak plasma levels and both are different. And uh, the dexamethodone, betamethodone effect comes after 24 hours, peak effects are 48 hours. Coming to DMRD, methotrexate, sulfur salicin effect starts after one month. Peak effect is two to three months. So each drug has a to the off-life, the effect starts and peak effect. These are the parameters we have to take before taking a clinical decisions. Maybe the next uh, couple about of patients. IVIG, about IVIG, effect starts within hours and peak effect will be there in 24 to 48 hours. And rituximab, effect starts within hours again. Peak effect will be there in 15 days, uh, two to three weeks. Maybe uh, some, we are, some of us can form a group uh, for myositis in research. And maybe my residents and Lisa's residents, we can do daily assessment following starting methylpred pulse and uh, look at the muscle enzymes daily and do a daily MMT8 and objectively document it, let's say next 10 or 20 patients and see where it takes. Yeah, okay, so what all the points I told, they are mentioned in Kelly's. Yeah. So last question from ma'am there and then we move on to the uh, next case. So generally we see a response, partial response in 4 to 12 weeks and a complete response by 3 to 6 months. There can be variation according to the disease duration with which the patient has come to us. So ma'am's comment and, uh, or question and then we… Since most of our patients cannot afford IVIG, so keeping in mind drug interaction between the antiviral and the immunosuppressive agent which should be preferred. Uh, so, as Vinita said, for hepatitis C, you can start both together. That's not a concern. We have the model in uh, HCV-induced vasculitis also. So, unless you have a very difficult uh, uh, liver dysfunction due to HCV, it is no problem. You could start both. Same is the case with the hepatitis B positive patient. Vinita, uh, would you like to take up that hepatitis B? I had reviewed it, but I don't remember. If hepatitis B whenever there, if antibody to hepatitis B appeared, still we can go for immune modulation. When antibody to hepatitis B are not there, we have to be careful. No, we have to look at the anti-HPC and we have to look at the uh, viral DNA loads. And based on that, we have to uh, take a call, which was a first line drug, TAF, and, uh, and No, I think, I think with hepatitis B, it would all, see, with both of these, it would depend on whether you are in the setting of a chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, or it is just an infection. It, it is comp uh, the only drug with which the caution is more with hepatitis B is definitely rituximab. With, even with, if you have a core antibody positivity there, that would still, you should really think before in that situation whether, especially if you have an alternative drug that you can use. On the other hand, for hepatitis C, you could go ahead with most drugs without much issues, except when you come to DMARDs, then anti-TNF, secukunumab, those would be a bigger issue than rituximab. So in myositis, uh, the drugs that we commonly use, methotrexate, tacrolimus, MMF, azathioprine, and rituximab can easily be used without much trouble in hepatitis C. And similarly, hepatitis B, which is just a chronic infection and uh, not a CLD, you can go ahead with most drugs except rituximab in which there is caution. Both hepatitis active, myositis active, a difficult situation. I did come across one there. I did use interferon at that time with the help of gastroenterology. So interferon is a treatment for both, it is effective, but it's very slow. Thank you, sir. With that, we move on to the third case from Chipmar Puducherry, and I invite Dr. Aishwarya to present it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, a very good morning to the respected uh, teachers and my dear friends. I'm Aishwarya from uh, Jipmer. I'm a final year DM resident. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our case in this forum. So my patient is a 46-year-old female with no prior comorbidities with a total duration of illness of eight months. In April 2020, she had presented to another hospital with clinical features of myalgia, proximal and distal muscle weakness, and there was documented photosensitive skin rash and Gordon's papules. This, uh, these findings were supported by elevated muscle enzymes an ANA was done by the treating physician. It was 4 plus homogeneous. Line immunoassay of 19 antigens showed positivity for MI2. So with these uh, clinical features, uh, she was diagnosed as a case of dermatomyositis and uh, she was started on high dose steroids, prednisolone 1 ng per kg and methotrexate. And over a period of time, methotrexate was uh, optimized to 25 mg. 
So in November 2020 is when she presented to Jipmer. She was referred in view of worsening of her muscle weakness. So when we looked at her old records, her muscle enzymes had been decreasing. But however, there was no consistent improvement in her muscle weakness. So when she presented to us, she had uh, features of worsening muscle weakness. She had profound uh, proximal and distal muscle weakness with an MMT8 of 8 by 80. She had pharyngeal muscle weakness as well as truncal weakness. She was bed bound. So these uh, findings were supported by lab features of elevated muscle enzymes. So since she had not responded to uh, fairly uh, standard initial treatment and uh, uh, so we uh, wanted to reconfirm that MI2 positivity. So we had done a line immunoassay for myositis specific antigen, which again showed a strong positivity to MI2. So since she had distal muscle weakness, we had also performed a nerve conduction study, which came out to be normal. And we had also done an EMG, which showed a myopathic pattern. Current, concurrently, she also had a urinary tract infection, which grew E. coli. So we did an MRI thigh, which showed diffuse muscle edema, as uh, seen here in the t 2 stir sequence. So uh, with the background treatment that she already received and, uh, uh, and a point to note is that uh, although she, there, were, there was documented photosensitive skin rash and Gorton's papules, at the time of presentation to us, she had no skin lesions. So uh, with the current manifestation and her uh, previous treatment, we uh, considered her diagnosis as a case of refractory dermatomyositis. Uh, as part of evaluation, we also did uh, an age-appropriate malignancy screening, which was non-contributory. We also performed a muscle biopsy, and HSAT thorax was normal. So we uh, treated her with uh, IVIG 2 gram per kg, and after her uh, antibiotic course for UTI was over, we escalated prednisolone to 1 mg per kg, and uh, uh, we gave her two, gross, two doses of 1 gram rituximab. Physiotherapy was initiated, and she was admitted with us for almost a month, and she showed consistent uh, improvement and at discharge she was, uh, her MMT8 was 24 by 80 and she was uh, able to walk with support and she was able to swallow semi-solid food at the end of admission during her discharge. Two months later, she presented to us in February 2021 with high-grade fever, severe myalgia and worsening of her muscle weakness after a period of uh, improvement. At this time, she also had difficulty in swallowing. On examination, her gag reflex was absent. MMT8 was eight by eight, 18 by 80. However, this was confounded by her myalgia. Uh, when we did uh, the basic investigations, uh, we found that she had uh, normocytic nomochromic anemia with leukopenia. Her muscle enzymes were normal. Uh, procalcitonin was 4.36, urine examination was normal, uh, uh, chest x-ray at admission was also normal, 2D echo was normal, her blood culture and urine culture came sterile. So her current issues being dermatomyositis with acute worsening with possibility of sepsis and the initial DDs that we kept for cytopenia was a concurrent viral infection, a possibility of macrophage activation syndrome or uh, a remote possibility of drug-induced cytopenia secondary to rituximab. So the treatment initiated at that point of time was broad spectrum antibiotics to cover sepsis. We had also given IVIG 2 gram per kg in view of her worsening of muscle weakness. And in view of uh, uh, suspicion of active infection, prednisolone was decreased to 0.5 mg per kg. So during the course of admission, uh, she also developed breathlessness when, she de when we de uh, did the HRCT thorax, which showed a right lower lobe consolidation. And uh, to our surprise, there was uh, multiple randomly distributed centrilobular nodules with tree in bud appearance, suggestive of tuberculosis, even though the initial chest x-ray at the admission was fairly normal. So uh, we had actually planned for a bone marrow uh, biopsy in view of the cytopenia, but in view of her poor general condition, we were unable to do it. And within two days, uh, in spite of starting ATT and uh, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, she rapidly deteriorated. And unfortunately, she expired due to aspiration pneumonia and sepsis. So here uh, we can see the first CT, uh, which was done during her first admission, which showed uh, a normal uh, lung parenchyma. And during the second admission, we can see bilateral uh, uh, centrilobular nodules with tree bed appearance over uh, bilateral lung parenchyma. And the right lower lobe uh, segmental consolidation suggestive of aspiration pneumonia. So now uh, we had done a muscle biopsy in the first admission. So uh, due to some technical issues, this muscle biopsy was not available to us for a long time. And uh, we were also not chasing it because uh, she had uh, shown consistent improvement with treatment. During the second admission, when we, uh, uh, when we were able to procure the muscle biopsy report, we found that uh, there were uh, multiple epithelioid granulomas with Langhan type of giant cells. 
and uh, azelni silt stain was done uh, to see for acid fast bacilli and it came out to be negative so after her uh, demise uh, with uh, the consent of the attenders we had performed a post mortem lung and liver biopsy at this point of time it showed uh, multiple caseating granulomas in both the liver and uh, lung biopsy specimens and this time it was positive for acid fast bacilli consistent with diagnosis of disseminated tuberculosis now coming to her primary diagnosis uh, after the looking at the muscle biopsy report of granulomatous myositis uh, we had uh, two questions in mind one thing was whether the whole thing was a case of dermatomyositis initially she had received some immunosuppression whether she developed uh, uh, granulomatous myositis uh, after immunosuppression and later after uh, again we had also given a lot of immunosuppression and it uh, flared up and uh, went on to develop disseminated tb so uh, whether this was a possibility so uh, the, the features for dermatomyositis that she had was diffuse muscle weakness with documented photosensitive skin rash by her previous physician with strong positivity of mi2 with diffuse muscle edema on mri but a few points against this diagnosis was a granuloma in muscle biopsy and lack of classical uh, biopsy findings of dermatomyositis although she had received a lot of uh, treatment before uh, <laughs> another possibility that we uh, were thinking uh, retrospectively was whether the whole thing was because of tb because uh, her muscle biopsy had granulomatous myositis but uh, the few things that were glaring against this uh, considering this diagnosis was her weakness was very generalized and there was diffuse muscle edema in mri and uh, she had strong positivity for mi2 documented twice and uh, it was difficult to consider this as an epiphenomenon and we were also not able to explain her photosensitive skin rash which was documented by her previous physician so when we reviewed some literature uh, we found that uh, dermatomyositis is uh, uh, tb is not so uh, uncommon in dermatomyositis and uh, in this systematic review published uh, by latika madam and her uh, colleagues so uh, it was dermatomyositis that was the most common subset among tb infection and the, the pool prevalence was uh, 3.58 and the muscle involvement was as high as 24% so we had also performed a, a gene expert of the post mortem lung and liver biopsy specimens which which had also come positive for uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis although ntm is also uh, uh, commonly observed in uh, cases of granulomatous myositis and uh, this was another uh, case report and systematic review uh, published by uh, aman sharma sir and his team where uh, they found that uh, in 67 cases 88% actually presented with localized swelling and multi site involvement was not uncommon it was uh, 24% who had multi site involvement and almost half of them had an underlying pre predisposition out of which nine cases uh, were idiopathic inflammatory myositis and despite intensive treatment uh, there was a, a poor prognosis uh, in these patients and the factors predicting mortality as analyzed by uh, in this paper was presence of an underlying disease and concurrent immunosuppressive therapy and involvement of multiple sites so um, before i conclude uh, with the key questions i would like to sincerely thank the patient and their family for giving us the opportunity to learn from this experience uh, and uh, my key questions are whether uh, tb can present as generalized muscle weakness should muscle biopsy with the advent of myositis specific antibodies the uh, the frequency of performing muscle biopsy has definitely come down so should muscle biopsy be strongly considered especially in refractory cases of muscle uh, inflammatory my myositis especially to rule out mimics and the third question is is there a benefit of screening for latent tb before rituximab therapy especially in endemic countries thank you thank you uh, audience yes uh, sir can i start uh, that was an excellent case very well presented congratulations thank you, thank you sir uh, just couple of points of clarification what was the cause of this patient's death sir uh, she had uh, aspiration pneumonitis septic shock and uh, that was the cause of death sir okay uh, the second question is if the original biopsy report was available to you at the right time manage would there been a change in the patient's management and would there been a difference in the outcome as a clinician uh, we were actually very uh, clear with the diagnosis of dermatomyositis in 
initially sir because there was clear cut uh, uh, the previous physician had documented uh, classical find uh, cutaneous features of dermatomyositis and we had also reconfirmed uh, the uh, mi2 positivity and alternate diagnosis at that point of time uh, during our workup was also negative and uh, the treatment we received uh, we gave her also showed some consistent improvement so i personally do not think we would have changed our management sir yeah, I mean, Although I we would have considered ATT initiation at that point of time. The reason I'm saying this is whether it is an institutional setup or anything else, biopsy is a priceless, absolutely priceless. So it is absolutely paramount for any stage of our career that if we had done the biopsy, we had to see it. If there is any doubt, we are, must engage with the pathologist. Yes, sir. Kaushik, sir. Yeah, thank you. But uh, one thing to remember is, unless I am mistaken, you also spoke about distal muscle weakness. Yes, sir. And that was your that was caveat. It. Yes, sir. That is that where you will unusual. not rely on serology anymore. Yes, sir. Because by definition, the only place where you will have a distal muscle weakness is inclusion body myositis. So if you want to rule that out, once again, this is not the correct picture for that. You need to have a male and so on and so forth. But then also you would do a biopsy, isn't it? Because you exactly. want to look at inclusion bodies. Definitely. Sir. So your biopsy will remain a gold standard when you have one variable to your typical clinical picture. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing in this case, like MI2 positive myositis, we generally believe are very responsive to treatment. So if MI2 confirmed twice strongly positive, if those subset of patients are not responding well, probably we should think of alternative, alternative diagnosis. If, if, we, if at all we believe our serologies. Papa. So last question by Sandeep sir. Puja, one, by one, one moment. This MI2 is written as textbooks as it is a very uh, steroid responsive kind of uh, autoantibody. But in our clinical experience, we are finding that MI2 is not behaving in a benign fashion. And we are finding that these patients are having uh, lung disease, pharyngeal weakness, and uh, so we've stopped uh, going. Uh, we've, we've stopped thinking of this to be a benign disease, and especially when it is with coexisting with row 52, we are finding that the uh, the response to treatment, the clinical phenotype, is very much different from what is written in the textbooks. So given the clinical spectrum of what you've presented, where it started off with fever, rash, muscle weakness, and a normal CT to begin with, tuberculosis, especially disseminated tuberculosis, would not have been the first, uh, should not be the first diagnosis. Subsequently, if you develop tuberculosis when the patient has been treated with rituximab, it's likely that the patient has some underlying T cell uh, immunity related problem. She probably is, uh, you know, if, until you go into very great details of some kind of uh, immunosuppressive, immuno um, uh, testing, you will not be able to know if she really was, uh, you know, uh, susceptible to this kind of infection. So technically, the fact that you make a case for a BD differential of uh, this being a first TB scenario, I don't think it, it carries much weight. And I believe every one of you also agrees. And, and just as a parting... Uh, uh, don't don't uh, put a muzzle on a, a woman. Uh, hell hath no fury like a woman's scorn. So even if you use that word, use muscle. Guys, I found quite a few of our young ladies using the word muzzle. And that if you're doing this in a in international uh, setting, they're likely to sort of feel a little odd. And then it's it's also a very good thing to muscle. talk about other uh, clinicians or or uh, scientists who are working in the area as say so and so professor um, uh, so and so professor aman sharma rather than saying aman sir not that this is uh, bad in our setting but it might sound odd in an outside setting sorry that's sir. the poet and upadhyay <laughs> so i want to make uh, one comment about rituximab and latent tuberculosis now a lot of us are using uh, rituximab in many different uh, scenarios and whether we should really be screening for tuberculosis before giving rituximab so we, we had done our uh, cohort from Karnataka KBC, Karnataka Biologics cohort, in which we did not find rituximab to increase the incidence of tuberculosis. So I think we basically need to look at their uh, 
the background of the patient, the immunosuppression. In this patient, did we see the HIV report in this patient, uh, the last case? Viral markers were negative, ma'am, and uh, during the initial uh, presentation to the uh, outside physician, uh, he had also done a manto which was negative. So, uh, HIV, HBCG, HCV, uh, anti-HCV and manto were negative. So this is something which has come on later? Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Can, can Me Too be false positive in this case? Because we have seen many viral and bacterial infections which can cause false positive antibodies. And so uh, rather let they me turn, take that. Uh, and they turn negative later on. Strong positivity with in the clinical context with where you have uh, uh, dermatomyositis specific rash and you have muscle weakness and you have uh, the, uh, the MRI which is showing the features of myositis. I think Me Too cannot be discarded. It has to be uh, kept in the clinical picture. Uh, one last question ma'am from here. Uh, I would like to know about uh, your experience from uh, anyone's experience, senior's experience about the granulomatous myositis, granulomas in biopsy, muscle biopsy basically. I have seen only one patient wherein I did a muscle biopsy and it showed both granulomas as well as features of polymyositis and that patient was from Calcutta. So I wrote a letter to I IPGMER and sent the patient on both ATT and uh, steroids and immunosuppressant. But I don't have a follow-up on that patient. Sarcoidosis and lymphoma can be other differentials. Recently, I had a... Uh, are we, we move on to the fourth case. Uh, that is also a very interesting case, a very challenging one. Hello, ma'am. Just answer. The trichinella spiralis, a parasite, can be disseminated. Leprosy, tuberculosis, they can be disseminated and disseminated candida, this infective etiology where muscle weakness occurs. And second thing, a different diagnosis of polymer, limb girdle myopathy, they also, even after biopsy also get uh, dots. But about tuberculosis, uh, if Montel's positive, National TB Control Center of 1982, uh, public, uh, new bulletin released government of India, it will 25 years data follow-up of Montauk tests. Whenever Montauk test is uh, induration, positive more than 35 mm, bullous lesion, vesicle lesion, don't investigate, go for ATT. Because some of the post-mortem studies done at Chen Madras, now Chennai, 92 to 96 percent of them has a hidden tuberculosis, invariably extrapolum tuberculosis. So I go my practice, I follow that uh, national TB uh, bulletin. Whenever monitor positive 35 mm, bullous lesion, vesicle lesion, I go for ATT. And apart from that, whenever we go for biologics, Montauk's positive, I prefer going for ATT. Agree with sir. Uh, so TB as an uh, organ, uh, sorry, muscle as an organ is very resistant to TB, but uh, the same scenario doesn't stay with the inflamed muscle which we see in myositis. There the barriers are broken and the inflamed muscle with lot of macrophage activation probably sets in the nidus for development of tuberculosis that we are seeing in most of our cases that most of them with strong immunosuppression and multiple immunosuppressive drugs probably go on to develop TB. So with that we move on to fourth cases, fourth case which will be presented by Dr. Amirtha Gopalan from KIMS, our host institute. Good morning everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Amrita Gopalan, final year rheumatology resident from Kim Sekindrabad. Today I will be presenting a case, severe myositis scleroderma overlap with pharyngeal, cardiac and respiratory muscle involvement, a therapeutic challenge. Our patient is a 46 year old female from Hyderabad. She came to us with diffuse skin hyperpigmentation associated with tightening of skin over the hands, feet and face in 6 months. History of difficulty in getting up from sitting position and lifting her arms overhead since two months and difficulty in swallowing food both to both solids and liquids since one month. Clinical examination showed pallor, bilateral pitting pedal edema. There was skin thickening over the feet, hands and feet limited to the PIP joints. MRS score was five. Microstomia was also present. Proximal muscle weakness of both upper and lower limbs was present. 2, uh, two, out of, uh, two by five bilaterally and distal power was four plus by five. Next flexor weakness was present. She had a nasal voice and there was nasal regurgitation on swallowing. There were fine crepitations in both lung bases. Her investigations, inflammatory markers were elevated, 
Sodium was low at 120. NT pro BNP was more than 35,000. Arterial blood gas was normal. There was mild transaminitis. Her CPK was elevated at 3,885. ANA was 4 plus nucleolar pattern. ANA profile showed only a borderline positivity for O52. 2D echo, EF was 40% with moderate LV dysfunction. CT chest was suggestive of early ILD changes. We could perform only a limited uh, myositis profile which was negative. Her EMG was suggestive of myopathic potentials and PET CT was done for malignancy screening which was normal. So moving on to the course in the hospital. So based on these features, we came to a diagnosis of scleroderma myositis overlap with proximal muscle involvement, oropharyngeal dysphagia, neck flexor and cardiac muscle involvement. So we started the patient on IV methylprednisolone, 500 mg for 3 days, along with in IVIG, 20 grams per day for 5 days. The first dose of injection cyclophosphamide was also given. She was treated with ACE inhibitors, diuretics, fluid restriction with the help of cardiologist. Patient was put on Riles tube feeds. So after a week, there was good mild improvement in proximal muscle weakness and neck holding and her CPK had come down to less than 1000. However, suddenly there was a call from the ward for a code blue. Patient had a cardiopulmonary arrest in the ward. She had to be intubated and shifted to the ICU. Her ABG showed severe respiratory acidosis with PCO2 of more than 120. So her CPK had gone up to 3500. So we thought probably was the CPR related or was it an active disease. A combined decision with the help of the pulmonologist and the intensivist was taken to wait for 24 hours and reassess the disease activity. Meanwhile, the patient was started on hydrocot 100 mg IV thrice daily. We repeated the 2D echo and the CT chest. There were no interval changes. After 24 hours, the patient's CPK was more than 3000. She was requiring high ventilatory support. So thinking that it was an active disease, we initiated her on a combination of therapeutic plasma exchange and low dose IVIG, that is 10 grams per day. An elective tracheostomy was done anticipating a long course in the hospital. After five cycles of plasma exchange, there was an improvement in neck holding and respiratory effort. We could wean the patient from uh, SIMV to BiPAP mode of ventilation. We continued her, her on low dose IV steroids, nasogastric tube feeds and physiotherapy. But again, there was a call for code blue in the ICU. Patient had another episode of cardiopulmonary arrest. Uh, ROVC was established after two cycles of CPR. This time, the patient had a high spiking fever. There was an infection at the tracheostomy site. The blood culture and the tracheal site culture grew klebsiella. She was put on injection meropenem and injection lenozolate for a week, after which the fever subsided, the infection was slowly controlled, and the ventilator settings, which had gone up because of the fever, were slowly brought back to BiPAP mode. Patient was finally discharged after 45 days of hospitalization. She was discharged on nasogastric tubes with the tracheostomy tube in situ on BiPAP uh, support to home. Post-discharge, the patient was maintained on monthly endoxin pulses and tapering oral steroids. Three months post-discharge, the patient was able to walk independently. Her CPK has been consistently less than 100. Her 2D echo had also normalized. And six months post-discharge, we were able to remove her tracheostomy tube and nasogastric tube. Currently, the patient is doing very well on low-dose oral steroids and MMF 2 grams per day. So moving on to the key questions in this case. The, what is the incidence of fulminant or refractory myositis in patients with overlap syndrome? And is this a case possible of, uh, is it a possible case of necrotizing myopathy in the background of scleroderma? How do we approach patients with fulminant myositis? Uh, what is the evidence for plasma exchange, IVIG, rituximab, and other newer agents like tofacillinib? And what should be the age appropriate malignancy screening in patients with myositis? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amitra. Great outcome for the patient. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Pooja has been pushing me to ask the questions fast because we are running out of time. So my one comment is that necrosis in a muscle biopsy can be seen in many conditions. It could be drug induced, in viral induced, it could be seen in dermatomyositis, anything. So the true necrotizing myopathy is necrosis without inflammation. So not every my necrosis which you see is a necrotizing myopathy. The, uh, the evidence for IVIG we have presented in the last thing. I think the question we would like to ask you is the rationale of using plasma exchange and IVIG together because one will take away the immunoglobulins, 
So what was the rationale? I mean, the desperation was there, but what was the rationale? And why was she arresting so many times? Uh, Ma'am, the second question. So probably the respiratory muscle weakness was there since the beginning, which we might have missed. Uh, we tried to do a PFT on her, but because of the oropharyngeal weakness, she was unable to do that. So, um, uh, how that, no, you can't the, miss a muscle, respiratory muscle weakness. You can't. Okay. So, so she also had neck flexor weakness. Yeah. So, okay, first time it was neck uh, respiratory weakness. What was the second time? The, the second time was sepsis, ma'am. She had an infection at the okay. tracheal site, and probably a block in the tracheal block would have happened. Okay. And the rationale for using IVIG, she had already been in the ICU for 10 days. So we knew that plasma exchange is going to cause sepsis in her. So just a low dose, we found some reports saying that low dose IVIG may reduce the risk of sepsis when we initiate therapeutic plasma exchange. So that was the rationale for giving low dose IVIG. Yeah, but to take away the antibodies when you do a plasma exchange, so, so maybe I could just hold it. Okay. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So my question is, uh, um, non, uh, um, MI cause of uh, cardiovascular death in scleroderma is commonly arrhythmias. So in this patient, could that be something which caused the repeated arrest? Was that uh, thought of and, uh, you know, did you really uh, follow that up with the cardiologist? Yes, sir. We thought of that. Uh, we did a whole turn monitoring in the ICU after the arrest. That was normal. And both the episodes, it was more of a respiratory acidosis, severe CO2 narcosis. May I a comment can occur in myositis per se as well. Yeah, yeah. We recently lost a patient who was our hospital staff. We discharged her and she went home happy. Wow. And in the next couple of days, she just had a sudden cardiac death. So we could not, she was living close to our hospital, but despite that, we could not save her. So cardiac involvement in myositis is a very well-known phenomenon. Yeah, no, same thing. The anterior was positive. Was there something in the QT interval initially? And then she had something in the echo to begin with. The ejection fraction was lesser already or yes, something. Yeah, so maybe she already had ma'am. One was thing. Was a single breath count in her? Ma'am, it was more than 20 at admission. One thing that is, uh, at least we were taught as residents, and textbooks don't specify it very clearly, but I'd just like to for you to consider it because this is what we were taught is the fact that when you have oropharyngeal weakness to begin with, you know that your patient is going to go downhill. And at that point in time is where the IVIG might have reversed this entire process that you went through. Something that you might want to consider that this is the one place where you will not bother about steroids, methotrexate, because there's oropharyngeal weakness. Uh, sir, we started IVIG on day one, sir. She received upfront IVIG. Upfront IVIG. So you have given IVIG 20 grams a day. Was that at the rate of 2 gram per kilogram of body weight? Is that what you actually yes, sir, full achieved? Yes, over 100 grams over 5 days was given. And so what you're saying is that it didn't work despite that? Yes, sir. So we have here uh, the other thing, you know, someone asked, uh, I think Dr. Lisa asked. We have been doing a plasma exchange followed by IVIG. And we have learned the technique from our nephro people. Uh, in a difficult case, a scenario like this, brilliantly working well. So what is the interval between plasma exchange and IVIG? On the same reason? day, following the plasma exchange on the same day. Yeah, 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 you know, we, like yeah it's, it goes in cycles. Yeah, but he, after each cycle, we are giving IVIG. Okay. Yeah, it, and, and what it is looks the like, you know, you are giving and taking away. But I think there is a mechanism, I, I can't tell you right now. But in practice, we have been doing it in a very difficult case. If the patient responds to pure IVIG, no need. But despite that, uh, there is no, you know, if we are losing the response, or if the patient you think needs both, I got we are point. combining. Just, just one thing, we all will deal with refractory cases, so I want to ask you, just plasma exchange alone, if not responded to IVIG, plasma exchange alone, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, there are cases where we use only plasma exchange, we don't combine. But in, in, a, in particular scenarios we have used, and uh, it did work when, when we used it in combination. We don't, don't do that for, on a regular basis. 
with that we are coming to end of this session and uh, i invite dr benzita to summarize our session just Last one question, yeah. one okay, comment sir. i would like to compliment i would like to compliment the treating team even yes, after they two really cardiac working. arrests and you know handling so many crises in the patient's course of disease patient has gone home is well is walking is eating uh, you know on minimal immunotherapy amazingly managed case thank you sir thank you yeah thanks for my post credit sir luckily i've got you know each time i'm getting a very uh, you know good good candidates the best from the country and we have a good uh, uh, icu team and uh, uh, the success is mainly the team work in kims we we like it, though this is a corporate structure but like in you know, we like in nim the working part is like in nims or in uh, aims or sgpgi or chandiga we were, because most of the doctors here they came from institutes so we have that academic interest and work like a team i think most of our successful cases have uh, you know just few minutes ago i shared uh, we have very difficult mda5 cases rapidly progressive except one everyone recover because the team work thank you uh, so uh, i think uh, i don't know if this was intentional on the part of the organizing team that people who have the least attention span and love to speak the most have been given the role of rapporteurs so for me key learning points i can pay attention for an hour and uh, i probably i never made notes even during my md and dm so so yeah so few learning points for self these are uh, so i think we had a very interesting session of uh, myositis in which uh, i think we discussed all uh, practical points that we all see especially complicated cases in which mostly evidence does not provide the answers that we need so um, the first one was an extremely interesting case in which we had a nash related hepatitis and uh, uh, and and i think the key learning point from that was if you do have a situation in which you require to use steroids and there is a nash this should not be a contraindication and we can use most drugs with a little more than usual monitoring and uh, from we we i think we learned from the experience of our colleagues and it was as it was pointed out that we have seen that nash actually does improve with the treatment of the primary disease so i think that was one of the key learning points and uh, uh, yeah of course there is very little data and uh, uh, on this to help us but this is a point that we can take home uh, the second case was a tn like presentation of dermatomyositis uh, in which which we saw a good response uh, to uh, ivig and uh, again the discussion was also whether what are the drugs that are safe in this setting and in the safe a uh, setting of viral infection that is uh, hepatitis viruses and i think we have discussed that most uh, drugs are safe uh, um, another point that came in during most discussion and this was discussed in the subsequent sessions also is what is a good time to assess response in myositis so the point that was uh, given uh, was actually uh, uh, emphasized again and again that that we have to wait for response none of us should be in a hurry uh and biochemical uh, response is not uh, does not go hand in hand always with clinical responses and at least one should wait 4 weeks really before we can say that um, uh, even with steroids that myositis is improving and uh, uh, i think one and even with the dmats that we use in immunosuppressant so one has to be patient using validated outcome measures can help uh, uh, imax is one which madam uh, mentioned and uh, i and one was one good thing that all residents had actually documented an mmt8 score which is uh, to the credit of the residents if they are doing it in practice i think uh, some of us actually very vaguely in practice record muscle uh, uh, improvement and i think using validated measures is a very uh, important key point and uh, the third case was a, a very very interesting case of whether that was uh, and i think the title was very beautiful tb or not tb or to be or not to be and um, of course a few points that i think were important to learn from the session is when there is an unusual patient when there is a patient that does not fall into uh, what you see in routine practice a muscle biopsy will uh, could really give you a clue and i think we should uh, because i think a lot of us have gone to relying very heavily on mri and uh, 
uh, um, muscle antibodies. Of course, there is nothing like seeing, seeing something on a biopsy that really, really clinches a diagnosis. And I think in situations where you're not absolutely sure, it is a very good idea to uh, biopsy early because it's a small procedure, it's an OPD procedure. And uh, in this, uh, I think we could not really, I think it, this case continues to be unsolved and I think there can still be a significant debate about whether at what point the TB came and whether this was a primary muscle infection of uh, uh, a primary tuberculosis which involved the muscle or was this a disseminated TB, TB that subsequently went and infected an already inflamed muscle. I think both theories one could uh, go with and um, the case, uh, the fourth case was a very severe uh, involvement or severe myositis in the setting of a scleroderma and a very important point that was mentioned and I think, again, a key point in a patient with, in which you do have truncal weakness and pharyngeal weakness, I think uh, it's important to look at the respiratory muscle weakness because in this, uh, in this patient, uh, the first time the patient worsened due to a, a type 2 respiratory failure, so actually proactively looking for it and uh, uh, actually monitoring the PCO2 may have been a, a good idea in this patient. Again, uh, a, a very uh, unique form of treatment uh, combining uh, plasma exchange with IVIG which was actually told to us by Dr. Sharath and I think we could uh, uh, go and actually review this whether it could help us in difficult settings. Again, cardiac involvement was uh, mentioned which is one of the poor prognostic factors in uh, my, this patient had several poor prognostic factors which include cardiac involvement and pharyngeal involvement. And uh, again, the kind of, uh, the frustration that every clinician feels when a patient is not responding as to how soon and when is a good time to actually say something is not working. And sometimes pr probably, uh, you know, the, the oldest and the, uh, that cyclophosphamide tried and tested works best. So, and of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Sandeep Upatia's key learning point from this session, please address your seniors, not as sir. So, uh, so I, w I won't say Vinita ma'am, I will say Professor Vinita, Professor Lisa and Dr. Pooja for this. Uh, I think they deserve credit for this really wonderful session. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> Uh, a quick announcement uh, before I uh, uh, announce the winner. Uh, 15 minutes we have tea break, but reduced to 10 minutes. Okay, please come back because already people are worried about uh, you know, catching their flight. So the winner of this session is uh, Madhuri Challa. For this session is Dr. Madhuri Challa and the institute is uh, Kims, the host institute. Nizam, Nizam Institute of Men, the host city. Again, uh, my request again, my request again, please uh, reassemble in 10 minutes time. Sir, uh, <clears throat> on the faculty is on, on, on this side.
starting uh, the next session on miscellaneous autoimmune diseases. I request Dr. Moderator, so I request uh, Dr. Vinod Ravindran, who is a moderator, to come on to the... Yeah, and uh, Sandeep Upadhyaya and uh, Dr. Josna Oak. And Dr. Aarti as a repetitor. But I request, uh, yeah, I request them, you just save 10 minutes for me. Because now everybody is worried about catching their flight. I think, uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Sharath, for this kind invitation and this brilliant meeting so far. So I think we'll just uh, start the session. And uh, uh, I have my colleague, Dr. Sandeep Upadhyay, Dr. Josna Oak, uh, and uh, Kirti, um, who is our special summing up person. Uh, so to start the session, I think you have noticed that how uh, I am not able to pronounce certain complex words in English. I don't know what that syndrome is called, but our first case is a syndrome, which is both vexing and taxing. So may I ask our first presenter to uh, start the presentation. And, yeah. and I think it is, let's keep the uh, answers to the questions very brief, allow other people to answer also. And uh, residents, uh, trainees, and senior members, all are welcome to ask the question, but in that order. Thank you. Yeah, Pratik. Good morning. This is Dr. Pratik from PGI Chandigarh, a fourth uh, DM resident. So I am presenting a case of an elderly male with SLE phenotype, recurrent fevers and infection. Uh, it is a syndrome. Uh, is there a new kid on the block in rheumatology? I'll be discussing that. So the story of this 70-year-old gentleman starts from August 2019 and continues till January 2020 elsewhere. He had chief complaints of recurrent fevers, which were moderate to high grade, polyarthralgias, loss of weight of almost 8 kgs, skin rash over face and trunks, which was intermittent. He was evaluated. Anemia was found, HBF 8.2, ANA was 1 is 2, 8T, fine speckled. Complements were normal. Creatinine was 1.2, and he was found to have a left lower limb DVT. With these reports, he was started on 1 mg per kg of steroids, which were gradually tapered to 5 mg over a course of eight months. And along with that, he was given MMF, inoxaparin, and uh, prednisolone as tapering, I have told. He comes to PGI uh, in the month of February 2020, just before the lockdown. That was his first visit. He was referred. Uh, at presentation, he had fatigability, left lower limb swelling, oral ulcers, and fever. There was no history of alopecia, any skin tightening, no history of Raynaud's phenomena, no history of Sika symptoms, no history of nasal cresting epistaxis, hearing loss, red eyes, ears or nose, no history of shortness of breath, cough, no history of decreased urine output, immaturia or any altered bowel habits or melina. At time of presentation, uh, he had normal stable vitals, anemia was, pallor was there. Uh, he had multiple subcentimetric cervical lymph nodes. There was left lower limb swelling, which was probably a residue of the DVT, and an oral ulcer was noted over the heart palate. Systemic examination was normal. With these findings, our possibilities were whether it is we are dealing with a connective tissue disorder, something like an elderly onset of lupus or Sjogren's, or a vasculitis at this age, which, would, could, which could be mostly a GC or PMR-like state, or is it an auto-inflammatory syndrome or a, rare present, or a presentation of adult onset still disease? Or it is not a case of rheumatology or we are dealing with a chronic infection or a hematological or a occult malignancy. We work up, work up 
we uh, carry out his workup and on routine examination, we find anemia HBF 6.1, TLC count of 1200 and macrocytosis of 102. Platelet counts were on the low normal limit. ESR was very high, around 99, and CRP was 34 mg per liter. Uh, in the infective workup, nothing was positive. It was inconclusive. We carry out a bone marrow, and our uh, pathologist, uh, uh, pathologist uh, report it as a mild borderline megakaryocytic dysplasia despite thrombocytopenia not being there, and query intracellular granules which are noticed in the myeloid lineage. In the autoimmune workup, ANA again tests to be 1 is 2, it is fine speckled positive. There is low C3, normal C4. In the ANA blot, SCL70 comes out to be positive, DSDNA and ROLA were negative. ANCA was negative, ultrasound temporal arteries were normal, immunoglobulin profile and lymphocyte subset was normal. Since we had a possibility of malignancy, we did carry out uh, a detailed evaluation of malignancy. The flow cytometry of bone marrow was normal. MDS genetic profile was normal. Stool local blood and sigmoidoscopy was negative. Hypercoagulation worker for the history of DBT was also negative. And the PET CT whole body carried out in February was also negative. With this possibility, we kept a possibility of undifferentiated connective tissue disorder probably a lupus phenotype. And we just started patient on, uh, patient on one, mg of K, 1 mg per kg of steroids with, with which there was improvement in hemoglobin without any transfusion. However, during this period, the macrocytosis persisted. Along with that, we also gave patient hydroxychloroquine. During this time, the fever continued to be on and off and uh, patient was then tapered, to be, uh, uh, tapered on a dose of prednisolone of 5 mg. He presented to us in the month of July, or August, July uh, and that time he had shortness of breath. His CT suggested uh, suggestive of peripheral wedge-shaped consolidation and this was the finding on the CT-guided FNSE. On a neutrophilic background, it was reported to be neutrophilic alveolitis with intracellular, this arrow, uh, intracellular macrophages suggestive of a small inclusion-like cell which was supposed to be cryptococcus. This is the gymsa stain and this is the pass with HNE stain, the, since we are uh, more used to seeing cryptococcus on India Inc. on pass and HNE staining, cryptococcus looks like this. It is reported to be a kind of budding yeast type of cell. Its morphology was, according to our pathologist, consistent with cryptococcus and we initiated treatment with liposomal amphotericin and fluconazole. During the hospital stay, patient improved and during the hospital stay, after completing uh, amphotericin, he developed COVID ARDS. Subsequently, next month, he again developed a UTI and presented with septic encephalopathy, was in an ICU for two to three weeks. And we, uh, since he was having recurrent infection and intermittent fever, we continued with a lower dose of 5 mg prednisolone. This time, anemia was more, ma more, a ma more of a major issue with persistent macrocytosis and he required almost seven to eight blood transfusions. Again, in the month of November, he developed this herpes zoster infection and a second COVID infection, which was probably, uh, uh, which was probably a, a, a false positive gene expert test. So in the month of November, uh, November 2020, uh, these authors uh, from NIH uh, report a case, which was first de description of a case of UBA1 somatic mutation consistent with adult onset inflammatory diseases. They describe a new type of a genotypic driven approach. They describe the syndrome as VEXA syndrome, abbreviated as V for vacuoles, even E for even enzyme, X for X-link, A for autoinflammatory syndrome, uh, autoinflammatory syndrome. And they describe this, uh, this teaching in patients of relapsing polychondritis, GCA, myeloma, polyarthritis, Bechet's, uh, sweet syndrome, and MDS. As of, uh, I attended this journal club on a Saturday and uh, None of, none of these findings were there in the patient. However, the gist of this, uh, gist of this uh, journal was that whenever you're suspecting vexes, it should be a male, male uh, patient with more than 50 years of age, MCV more than 100, and platelet less than 2, two, th two lakhs. And with, this, with these three findings, there is 100% sensitivity of picking a vexes syndrome. However, how to test this? So, we wrote, we, asked, uh, we wrote to the original authors at NIH and they were very, uh, they were very grateful and we were, we, we were very grateful that they replied and they asked for a DNA sample which we, which we exported to US. As of the last day of 2020, they replied uh, that they, were, they had a delay in reporting say around four weeks uh, because of the holidays but they did reply just uh, on 31st of December that the patient came out to be UBA1 positive. So 
This was Vexer syndrome case, UBA1 mutation positive, who presented with recurrent fevers, persistent macrocytic anemia, and a possible SLE phenotype, which does fulfill the SLIC and ACR criteria, but we are not sure whether this patient has lupus or not. And during follow-up, he never developed any, uh, any features, other features of lupus. So for treatment, once diagnosed, the conundrum doesn't end there. It is a new entity, how to treat that? So the previous authors have continued the treatment for basic disease. As, a, as of our patient, he did have an undifferentiated connective tissue disorder. So we did continue 5 mg of Vysol and NHCQ. However, the recurrent blood transfusions were very uh, problematic. So we decided to treat uh, this, pa uh, this, patient's, this patient on 1, mg per, uh, per kg of, uh, 1 gram per kg of IVIG. Uh, on a monthly dose and to our satisfaction the need of blood transfusion immediately was stopped and uh, the hemoglobin stabilized. Despite that the macrocytosis continued and, uh, and the leukopenia intermittent report, uh, reports we did get. Fever did not occur after start, starting IVIG. So uh, I described a case uh, of Vexus syndrome, uh, a new kid on the block. So what is it? It is actually a autoimmune uh, or it is a type of a genotypic driven diagnosis to a many uh, un undiagnosed autoimmune features uh, which has been described by a genotypic driven approach and this is a new form of uh, description how to describe a new disease. So is it a rheumatological domain? Yes, it has over fe overlapping features of, yeah. uh, from hematology, some from, uh, some from infectious disease, but uh, many of our patients from rheumatology like relapsing polychondritis, uh, patients of lupus, patients of giant cell arthritis do qualify into Vexus syndrome. Pratik, uh, I think, you know, I will stop you there okay, because we can take these okay. questions. We got a in okay. very interesting uh, audience. So uh, congratulations. Thank you. It was, I think uh, we have to appreciate that this was, I think, one of the landmark publication, uh, a case report, uh, first of its kind from India. So brilliant work. So, you know, the, it's open for discussion from the floor. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering, the patient presented with what, polyarthralgias, anemia, and some... Oral ulcers. Uh, Oral ulcers. Why, uh, why did you consider 50 milligram, one milligram per kilogram of steroid in this case? I would have given 10 or 15 maximum and there was nothing, you know, alarming to so start. And then he had developed so many infections later, including cryptococcus. Uh, uh, sir, we did give a very, very rapid taper, like within a weekly taper, of, because we had very high fever at time of presentation, which initially responded to steroids, sir. But 50 milligrams? And an anemia. Yeah. I think uh, Sandeep wanted to take up that question. I think there were a, a set of problems that the patient had high uh, a set of skin lesions, those uh, nodular skin lesions, uh, which would not respond just to 10, 15. They would certainly respond to 30 maybe, and certainly would be uh, another way of looking at it. So I think it was justified, especially now in retrospect that we know that this was such a severe illness. And uh, the disease. He had cryptococcus. But was that after uh, IVIG or? Uh, sir, it was after six months of. Uh, but we did give a rapid taper, and there was history of taking steroids with MMF before to the presentation also, sir. Okay. Well, the okay. cryptococcus can be explained by the leukopenia that the patient had, and that's part of the myelodysplasia phenotype that the patient had. So, from the perspective of whether we should have given him so much of immunosuppression is difficult to define. But what is well known is that the only thing that works for this disease is uh, steroids. And it has a very high fatality rate until it really treated aggressively. Uh, so from that perspective, maybe in retrospect, it was OK. And uh, your other uh, possibilities of lupus, uh, you know, looking at the possibility of the Vexa syndrome itself, after uh, several months of the patient being treated, uh, like a lupus disease, especially the fact that he had uh, an entire set of connective tissue, autoimmune profile, had most of those features that go with, uh, you know, scleroderma-like illness or, or nodular lesions, fever. So that aspect, I, I entirely agree. And we, we've probably seen a lot of these patients and we label them as undifferentiated connective tissue or overlap connective tissue. And with this uh, new, uh, you've, you've written kid on the block. I'd rather say it's more like a, uh, elderly zombie on the 
prowl. On the prowl, actually. Yeah. Elderly zombie on the prowl. Dr. Amita followed by Dr. Sapan. So the clue in this patient was from the bone marrow report. That had shown you, vac they said inclusions, but the vac they are actually vacuoles. So if you have MDS with vacuoles, that should give you the clue. Obviously, this syndrome has been described in November 2020, so you could not have diagnosed in retrospect. Yeah. That is fine. The second thing which I wanted to know was, did this patient have autoimmune hemolytic anemia? Okay. DCT, ICT was negative? DCT, okay. ICT was so then, why do you think that IVIG will work in this situation? Ma'am, uh, because the patient was uh, having persistent infections on and off. Uh, so this so is given to reduce infections. As a, uh, because uh, he had an auto, uh, like uh, immunodeficiency phenotype. So we were not sure immunoglobulin level? You said immunoglobulin levels were normal. Were normal. So I didn't understand the rationale for IVIG. Was it to reduce autoimmunity or to reduce infection? Yeah. Isn't it, Sandeep, that the, the treatment of this entity is actually yet to be defined, isn't it? It's is yet to be defined. People are just throwing stones in every direction. To the extent that uh, auto uh, um, locus stem cell transplantation has been tried for one patient. And about 50% of the patients uh, die in the next six or nine months. Yeah, I, I, was just, I was just wondering what the mechanism here is because now in this month's uh, journal we have seven cases of ANCA web excess. So it seems that some patients with autoantibodies and autoimmunity also could have excess, uh, contrary to what we believed before. I was wondering what is the mechanism here and what arm of the immune system well, is involved? I think the gene defect which causes that ubiquitination uh, problem, it's something that's at the cellular level. But my own... Um, thought on this, I mean, I'm just throwing my thought, is that there is a likelihood of a lot of these disorders, seemingly unrelated disorders, say for example, you have an anchor related uh, problem, there are these uh, costochondritis, uh, polychondritis like patients who then go on to develop vexus like syndrome. Maybe it's, it's just, just a thought that maybe you have additional genetic uh, somatic mutations or some environmental insults that changes the phenotype from, from a single disease entity that is defined as of now into something that's the new definition of a sort of a polysomatic uh, disease. Dr. Bimlesh followed by Dr. Benjita. Uh, Pratik, did you uh, review the literature, any case series where they have seen deep-seated infection in this type of patients? Uh, yes, sir. There is a series from Japan. They have even described vexus syndrome in females also. They had uh, they had presentation of such immunodeficiency in adult onset uh, patients. But in their cohort, majorly patients were females, sir. So they have also expanded the spectrum to fe involve female pa female patients, sir. Thank you. So the message here is that the patient has myelodysplasia phenotype. He's, he or she is immunocompromised. So that's something to begin with. Yeah. And in addition has auto inflammatory features. So these two, uh, you know, extremes, uh, inflammation on one end and uh, immunodeficiency on the other, they go together, anemia with skin rashes, various skin rashes, fever, and so on and so forth. Perhaps all our patients who did not fare well, we had to go back and look at the bone marrow biopsy. Benjita? So this, uh, the same thing I wanted to say that uh, this vacuolation seems to be an important clue, right? So in, in the series that has been described, has it been consistently observed and is this MDS a phenotype in which you will not really establish anything on flow? Then maybe that is a subset in which you are suspecting MDS. You do not get an immunophenotyping with the uh, currently known mutations and vacuolation is the problem subset at least that we need to maybe retrospectively look at if this could fit into vexus. So uh, even I had an impression that this patient, uh, the MDS phenotype was uh, uh, negative for cytogenetic profile. But when I read in detail just before the presentation, they did prove vexes in known patients of having patients with 7Q and 9Q deletions as well. And uh, like, uh, for the follow-up of this patient, uh, he continued to be uh, asymptomatic for one year without blood transfusion for one year. But uh, three months back, he presented with a, a pyogenic meningitis. He died. But we were able to take out the DNA and standardize the UBA1 mutation at our lab, which, uh, which you, you all can send sample. And it would cost only 2,000 rupees. Thanks, Prati. And I think perhaps uh, as a very last question. So uh, the original paper described seven or eight autoimmune disease. We got eighth or ninth year. So, uh, what is actually the real relevance of expanding the spectrum of, I mean, eventually all the autoimmune disease will be found to be associated with this syndrome. What's your so, take on that? Uh, 
if you're implying that this is some kind of, um, you know, an equivalent of mass in uh, another set of immunological diseases, I'm not sure. But what is certain is that many of these patients who are initially being treated for PAN, for polychondritis, for giant cell arthritis, and then subsequently when uh, they were evaluated for a single gene defect. So this is gene-first approach. Uh, several undiagnosed uh, patients with autoinflammatory or inflammatory diseases at the NIH were evaluated uh, with their uh, whole exome sequencing and then about 800 of those mutations, some of those turned out to have uh, a peculiar uh, uh, mutation for uh, the ubiquitin, ubiquitin uh, gene. So technically it's like going back from, from a gene defect and looking for diseases that are similarly placed or similarly phenotypic. Uh, maybe this will happen in other diseases and maybe we'll start to realize that there are more uh, such uh, zombies, so to speak, not kid on the block. I'd say zombies on the prowl waiting to be discovered. We will probably have other gene uh, problems here. But what is certain is that uh, these expanded spectra, polychondritis is one of those very important uh, presentations and lupus-like presentations are important. So, this is the differential. And uh, patients who have myelodysplasia, have additional autoimmune features, are the ones that you'd probably want to check for, not just the MDS profile, and that comes back negative. You then check for uh, vexes as, as discussed. Yeah. So very final question from Dr. Shanmukhan. Mine is actually a question for this vexing problem. Uh, can we have a center of excellence in a particular place in India where all can be sent? Yeah. Uh, I think high time, Amita ma'am. I think high time. I mean, I think in, in, the, in the West there are several centers, uh, you know, uh, related to the rare disease or miscellaneous diseases. So, Pradeek, congratulations once again. Thank you very much. So, the next uh, is... Okay. Amrita Gopalan. Please start. Good morning to one and all. I am Dr. Amrita, the DNP resident from Kim Sekindrabad. Today I will be presenting a case, a difficult case of adult onset stills disease with macrophage activation syndrome. So our patient is a 22-year-old female, an engineering student from Hyderabad, who presented Our patient is a 22-year-old female, an engineering student from Hyderabad, who presented to the Department of General Medicine as follows. Her presenting complaint in the first admission was sore throat, fever, and rash. She was hospitalized for a week, during which there was mild leukocytosis, mild transaminitis, and her dengue IgM was positive. She was treated as dengue fever and discharged. This was followed by a short afebrile period. One week later, she came back to the hospital with fever. But during this admission, no temperature was documented in the hospital. Her CBC was normal. Her transaminitis had subsided. So she was again managed conservatively and discharged. This was again followed by a third afebrile period. And this time, she came back with fever and a generalized maculopapular rash to the Department of Medicine. This time, the investigations again showed mild leukocytosis, transaminitis. ANA and DSTNA were negative. Her complements were normal. Rheumatoid factor was negative and serum ACE levels were normal. Patient was discharged again being, after being treated for viral fever. 
and two weeks later she was readmitted for the fourth, fourth time under medicine. So at this point her presenting complaints were high grade intermittent fever, temperature touching, uh, touching 101 to 102 Fahrenheit associated with a diffuse erythematous maculopapular rash involving the trunk and extremities and she now came with a new complaint of right upper abdominal pain since three days. This upper abdominal pain was not associated with vomiting, altered bowel habits or abdominal distension. There was no history of joint pains, oral ulcers, alopecia or bleeding manifestations. On examination, there was pallor, icterus, generalized lymphadenopathy, a diffuse erythematous maculopapular rash over her trunk and extremities, hepatosplenomegaly was present and there was right hypochondriac tenderness. On, there was also reduced bilateral air entry. No focal neurological deficits were noted. Investigation showed elevated inflammatory markers. Her liver parameters were grossly deranged. Bilirubin was 1.9 and enzymes were 800 and 648 AST and ALT respectively. Creatinine was normal. Urine routine showed trace protein with microscopic hematuria. Three blood cultures were done from three different peripheral sites and all three were negative. Urine culture was also negative. Chest X-ray showed bilateral CP angle blunting. Her 2D echo was unremarkable. Ultrasound abdomen showed mild increase in the liver echogenicity, mild hepatosplenomegaly and ascites. CECT chest and abdomen showed generalized lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly and serocytis in the form of pleural effusion and mild ascites. Over the next 10 days in the ward, there was a gradual decline in her hemoglobin and a slow and steady rise in her total leukocyte count from 9,000 to over 15,000. Her bilirubin rose from 1.9 at admission to over 11. Her enzymes also continued to fluctuate with values constantly remaining above 500. Uh, extensive infective and autoimmune workup was done by the treating team. Her uh, wheel felix, lepto IgM, viral markers were all negative. ANA, ANA profile and DSTNA were negative. Serum ACE was elevated at 97. Calcium and IgG levels were normal. PET CT was done which picked up hepatosplenomegaly and generalized lymphadenopathy with a low SUV uptake. Cervical lymph node biopsy was performed which showed reactive lymphadenitis and gene expert was negative. Bone marrow aspiration and biopsy was normal. There were no granulomas noted. After 10 days of hospitalization, patient was referred to us. So keeping in mind fever, rash, sore throat, leukocytosis, organomegaly, serocytis, hepatitis and negative RF and ANA, she was fulfilling Yamaguchi's criteria for adult onset stills disease. And we did further workup for macrophage activation syndrome because of the significant hepatitis. Her ferritin was 2500, ESR had dropped from 48 to 8, AST was more than 1000, Triglycerides were very high at 657 and serum fibrinogen was low at 99. So we finally came to a diagnosis of adult onset stills disease with macrophage activation syndrome. So in this slide, I'll describe the events over the next two weeks. After we saw the patient, we started her on IV methylprednisolone, one gram per day for five days, along with empirical broad spectrum antibiotics. Patient became afebrile after four doses of pulse steroid. On the fourth day, however, she started developing cytopenias. Uh, she's, uh, we can see uh, she started developing cytopenias and her liver enzymes also continued to worsen. There was a significant jump in her ferritin from 2,500 to over 17,000. So at this point, we added a second line agent that is cyclosporin 50 BD and we also gave her the first dose of injection tocilizumab 480 milligram IV. Despite these measures, her, the patient's counts continued to drop and her liver parameters significantly worsened. Serum ferritin lost to above 35,000. We also repeated a bone marrow, which was normal. Her serum fibrinogen had lowered down to 62 from earlier 99. Clinically, the patient started developing hepatic encephalopathy. The treating gastroenterologist wanted to involve the liver transplant team at this point. So, the, in front of us, the patient was going down, her counts were going down, and her liver parameters were worsening. So at this point, the options in front of us were IVIG, cyclophosphamide, atoposide, or plasma exchange. So keeping in mind the safety profile of these agents, we chose IVIG, and she was given 120 grams over the next five days. After one week of, five, uh, after five days of IVIG, slowly we could see that her count started improving, the liver parameters settled down, and over a period of two weeks, there was a 
the count stabilized and her liver parameters settled. She was discharged with a ferritin of 937. Um, on follow-up, the patient is currently doing very well. She has been tapered and she's off steroids since the last one year. Uh, she's currently doing well on cyclosporin once a day. A short discussion. So there can be broadly two phenotypes of adult onset Stills disease, the systemic form and the articular form. The systemic form is characterized by high interleukin-1 interferons hyperferritinemia and there's a higher degree of autoinflammation and NK cell dysfunction in these patients. Clinically, these patients will have high fevers, serocytis, hepatitis, and, he and reactive hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. The articular variant, on the other hand, there's a prominence of interleukin-17, 23, and TNF-alpha. There's a lesser degree of autoinflammation and NK cell dysfunction. And these patients have fewer systemic symptoms and prominent arthritis and joint destruction. So we can label a patient to be refractory stills if there is no or insufficient clinical response to steroids and methotrexate. In these patients, it will be helpful to characterize them as a systemic or the articular form. The systemic phenotype patients may respond better to anakindra or tocilizumab. On the other hand, the articular phenotype patients may respond better to anti-TNF agents. In complicated situations like uh, mass, myocarditis, coagulopathy, or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, Agents that have been shown to be efficacious include IVIG, anakindra, cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin A or plasma exchanges. So with this I conclude. My key questions are, in a patient with steroid refractory mass secondary to adult onset Stills disease, how do we decide the choice of add-on therapy, that is tocilizumab versus cyclophosphamide, IVIG, etoposide or anakindra? Personal experiences with similar cases, and what is the long-term management and prognosis of these patients? Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. That was wonderful. So, yeah, to start off with Ranjan, and please, friends, help me out. Uh, I have not been given my faculty memento by Sharath. The condition he placed is that I must get PGs and trainees to ask questions. So, I need that. Ranjan, please. So in the very beginning, you had a transaminitis pattern, which was AST more than ALT. And when you have shown that patient transitioned into mass, you had ALT more than AST. So I yes, think sir. from the very beginning, we had some clues that there was uh, mass. Like impending mass, and that's how he, she has uh, yes, gone. So the other clue was that the ASR had come down drastically. Fibrinogen had gone down. And yes, yeah, I think in, so in, since the beginning, this patient had adult onset still disease with mass. That's what yes, I knew. Yes, Actually, regarding point number two, uh, I had one case uh, flown from Oman. She postpartum, she went into multi-organ dysfunction, subsequently developed macrophage activation syndrome. And uh, during the multi-organ function dis dysfunction, she developed acute liver failure. So the moment they called me, I just said, start methylprednisolone and uh, just take up for uh, liver transplantation and it was successful. So sometimes we may not be waiting to keep the uh, original disease, what is it? Uh, you are considering liver, liver transplantation. In this case, I, there is only one more case, that too in Stills disease. In non-Stills disease, this is the only case I know. And uh, second thing is regarding etoposide, I had given in one case, but as it was discussed, it is more for primary uh, HLH. Etoposide is very toxic. That HLH 2004 regime is very, very toxic regime. And we, with our uh, environment, it's patient usually die of infection and um, bone marrow suppression. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Can I ask? Uh, sorry. Yes, Dr. Sapna. No, please. I just said, uh, when you give IV tocilizumab, uh, and I think just a week or less than 10 days after that, uh, could you have waited for the IV gamma? Because sometimes intravenous dosing may take a little time. And you can actually repeat the IV dosing. Sometimes in stills, uh, you have to repeat it from day 15. But I've turned out, you know, you could have maybe, I, I was not sure. Uh, on the table, I think it's one week after that. Yes, sir. The patient was going into hepatic encephalopathy, so everyone was getting desperate. Desperate. Yeah, uh, and, and what is the science? I mean, uh, I think, Sapan, so w w what sort of, you know, the time period we should be waiting? So we have seen throughout the two days that, you know, we are slightly actually uh, quick, quick in changing our decisions.
these are very I difficult clinical decisions yeah. and there is clinician knows the best who is treating this crowd can't decide so we only know yes yeah, whatever can, you have done is correct yes, right? sure. you, have, you, have, you have been seeing you know the slides initially for months she has been managed by the medicine department by the time we we, we took over she already she was in you know transistase in mass and uh, she was deteriorating in front of us and our uh, HLT team came and actually counseled for transplant. So that time our call is, you know, we'll wait for a moment and, uh, and see whether this works. And luckily it worked. And uh, now, you know, after a year, she's off steroids, only on cyclosporine 50 milligrams. Recently, you know, she migrated to US, she's studying MS there. See, a small man, evidence-based management is not only data. It has got three components, patient preference, physician's expertise, and third is the hard meta-analysis. Well so, 33% each. I want each and every of you to see, even Davidson and Harrison says, principles and practice of medicine. So, it's not only principles of medicine, it is also practice of medicine. Please take that. In an index case, you do in emergency, you can go ahead as uh, that. And in, of course, in <coughs> large data RCT, it's a different matter. Yeah. Josna, ma'am, uh, can I? Uh, May I ask? Yeah, very well said. So I think in this patient, she, was al she had already progressed to a very uh, severe case with hepatic encephalopathy. I don't think we can wait. By the time the patients are referred to the rheumatologist, already the peak of the clinical manifestation has reached. So IVIG is a right thing decision I feel in this patient and simultaneous management of hepatic encephalopathy because they will go into coagulopathy and then the prognosis is very bad and the treatment has to be given for a longer period that is also something which is always missed out in treatment of macrophage if you see all the criteria are fulfilled by your patient and they have to be given long-term treatment as you have rightly done what's the long-term prognosis ma'am uh, for the mass Whatever couple of cases I have seen, there has been sometimes a very bad prognosis if it is not treated faster. If it is treated faster with cyclosporine, dexamethasone and etoposide, the prognosis is good and many patients, the mortality is not like what they used to describe it. Because the moment we used to diagnose macrophage activation, people used to say, why to do everything? The patient is not going to survive. But it is not at all like that. With the support of IVIG, cyclosporine, dexamethasone and etoposide, Many patients have survived. Yeah. And uh, when we label the patient as refractory uh, and consider other drugs, is there a hierarchy of those drugs, you know, which should be tried first? I think as for the protocol, uh, they try dexamethasone, cyclosporine. Sometimes in the uh, primary, this thing, they try etoposide. But in patients who have got very severe cytopenias, very severe thrombocytopenias, and uh, the arrangement of the hepatic function, IVIG has to be given. Um, I got I have Kaushik and then Abel. Yeah. So this is uh, a question to the panelists and to the audience. How many of us have, uh, <coughs> at least I don't, so how many of us have experience of tocilizumab being repeated? And this is partly in response to what Safan is asking. How many of us have experience with tocilizumab in the presence of hepatic encephalopathy, number one? And number two, beta, you used oral cyclosporine or IV? Oral cyclosporine. So oral. That, that was my point, that in mass, uh, when you have a case like this, you need to consider IV cyclosporine. Yes, you will have the hypertensive crises and so on. You need to be very careful with the creatinine. But IV cyclosporine will possibly tilt the balance in your favor compared to oral because time is short. We tried procuring it, sir. It is not we tried procuring it, we didn't get it. So, it is not available uh, easily. Amita, madam, wants to add something to that, please. That when you have mass, the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. So if you give IV cyclosporine, the levels rise very fast. fast. Patient can sometimes develop seizures and can have encephalopathy. So some of the centers abroad would only use oral, oral. cyclosporine. We use 
oral cyclosporine. And bioavailability of oral is very good. So, for even in renal transplant, where the levels are very much required, uh, oral is equally good. Some drugs where oral and IV bioavailability is no, good it's, is it's cyclo. very good. The reason is because this was a fulminant case. Yeah. And there you, you know, every hour saved is what you are looking at. Yeah. I think uh, Amitam Ma'am has said it nicely that, you know, so the already in a already very sick patients, I mean, you are actually endangering, endangering the life by using IV. Abel. Uh, I want to say that even in patients with uh, secondary to uh, uh, Stills disease and SOGI, we have to check for viral uh, viruses as triggers, especially herpes viruses. Nobody has mentioned because, uh, you know, you have to do CMV and EB. Virological workup and treatment of the viral infections can also be part of managing yes. mass. Actually, it was quite. It was. Yeah, it was, there it is. They, it was quite they extensive. They have done all the work PCR, the PCR, sir, not IgM. PCR, sir. Anybody has any experience of using voclosporin because it has got less renal side effects, which will be coming in the market? Voclosporin. I'm sorry, my first question. The experience of tocilizumab in the presence of hepatic encephalopathy does anybody have because have because you know it raises the liver enzymes it is metabolized by the liver so i didn't know and that's why i was asking no. anybody has any experience in that particular area hepatic encephalopathy so i have a question ah my memento please please yes uh, hello sir uh, so uh, your name? Uh, I'm Dr. Sahana Baliga from uh, Yeah, yeah, you Hamidja won Hospital the prize yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> so actually, this is, uh, uh, it's one of my doubts because these days uh, in COVID-19, they've been using cytosol uh, in cases of this excessive cytokine storm. So any role of that in our uh, rheumatological diseases, especially in this kind of a fulminant uh, uh, macrophage activation syndrome, would there be a role? Any experience from you, uh, any of you, sir, sir ma'am? I didn't get which. Cytosorb. It's a. Uh, it's it's actually a, a membrane. It's an arabinocyte. Thank you. Chahana, I think you are talking of the adsorption columns, the cytosorb. So these are adsorption columns which are supposed to adsorb cytokine out of your plasma. And they were utilized in patients with severe COVID-19 associated hyperinflammation. And some people showed some benefit, but all those things are very dubious. And when you remove these, they come back again because you haven't removed the trigger. So it's just to buy time and they're highly expensive. And plus, whenever you do any of these procedures, there is a lot of hemodynamic compromise in such sick patients that can also cause issues. Thank you. So we close this particular one. So, uh, great, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Any thoughts? More thoughts? while we are waiting. I think it's a good idea for us to be uh, waiting for treatment, especially for difficult diseases, till the point that it gets to mass. Just allow it to come to mass, then start treating. We have such good experience with mass now. I believe we've had at least seven or eight presentations in diverse diseases, all of them leading to mass and then coming out of it with you know heroic measures. So I think using mass as a uh, sort of a stepping stone Right. By rheumatologists. Okay, so uh, the third case, the one you can start, please. Good Thank morning, you. all to our faculty and other delegates. Today I will be presenting the case with the title, Is it IgG for related disease? So we had this 56 year old female who was symptomatic for the last 15 days for solitary thyroid non nodule, and it was not associated with any compressive symptoms. FNAC of this thyroid nodule was done around two years back with short coli nodule with cystic degeneration. For the past one and a half years, she started having left-sided eye swelling, which first started in the upper eyelid and then progressed to lower eyelid. This swelling was slowly progressive over the time, such that for the past six months, she, she started having left eye proptosis and left eye mechanical ptosis. Along with that, since past six months, she had multiple subcutaneous nodules, which was slowly growing 
or the nape of the neck, occiput, back, chest, and the abdomen. For the past one week pre presentation to prior to presentation to us, she had focused uh, scissors, bilateral groin pain, and bilateral shoulder pain. On probing the history, she revealed that she had left-sided breast mass for the past eight years, which was not associated with any pain or discharge. On examination, she had midline thyroid swelling, five into three centimeter in size, which we can appreciate over here. She has multiple variable size subcutaneous nodules, mainly over the occiput, back of the neck, chest, abdomen, and the back, which we can appreciate over these multiple nodules. She had left eye mechanical ptosis, left eye proptosis, and periorbital swelling in the left upper and lower eyelids. She had left sided brace mass, 10 into 6 centimeter in size, which was associated with the puckering of the skin. And on systemic examination, she had hepatomegaly, 2 centimeter below the subcostal margin, and which was firm in consistency. So, in view of these slow growing multiple masses, she was referred to us with the suspicion of IgG for later disease. So when she presented to us, we, uh, the differential diagnosis which we considered were IgG for related disease, lymphoma, and breast, and the rare possibility we kept as of breast malignancy with metastasis. So we did her serum IgG for levels, which were 410 mg per day, which is, which is around three times the upper limit of normal. However, on further evaluation and imaging, she had ill-defined hom homogeneous and enhancing lesion in the intra and extragonal compartments of the both orbits. So here on the left side, we can see this beautiful ill-defined homogeneous mass. And on the right side also, we can see all the upper eyelid. And there was a mild proptosis of the left eye. There was soft tissue encasement around the cranial nerves. So this is the bundle of seven and eight uh, cranial nerves. And we can see the soft tissue encasement around it. And this soft tissue encasement was also present around the fifth nerve and the fourth nerve. She had solicystic lesion in the left lower thyroid, which we can appreciate over here. And there was an ill-defined soft tissue in the mediastinum, which is encasing the vessels, which we can see over here. She had ill-defined soft tissue masses in the bilateral breast. She had bilateral lung nodules, which one we can appreciate over here. And she has ill-defined mass in the retroperitoneum. So this is the pancreas. And behind this is the soft tissue, which is which is encasing the aorta. And in this picture, we can also ap appreciate the bilateral hydronephrosis which the patient has. And in this, uh, in this picture, we can appreciate the bilateral hydroureter. So this patient has orbital mass, thyroid nodule, retroperitoneal and mediastinal soft tissue, bilateral mild hydronephrosis, lung nodule, skin nodule, and elevated serum IgG4 levels. So this patient presented to us with typical four organ involvements of IgG4 related disease and elevated IgG4 levels. So does this patient really has IgG4 level, uh, IgG4 related disease, and can we label this patient as IgG4 related disease? So whenever we make a diagnosis of IgG4 related disease, we should take whole picture into the account, and we should never miss the elephant in the room. So this patient was not bothered about her eye um, pro, uh, to, to say, uh, left eye mass. She was most bothered about the diffuse bony pain which she has. So uh, we, she, her main pain was in bilateral shoulder and bilateral thigh. So we did skeletal survey for this patient. We showed osteosclerotic and osteolytic lesions in the long bones. And this osteosclerotic and osteolytic lesion can also be appreciated in all the vertebra. From top to bottom, we can see that. As we know that long bone involvement is not a feature of IgG related disease. And when you have long bone involvement, you should consider the diagnosis of Erdham Chester disease. So we revised our di diagnosis for this patient as Erdham Chester disease because Erdham Chester disease can explain her osteoxerotic and osteolytic lesions, orbital mass, thyroid mass, retroperitoneal and the soft tissue, bilateral hydronephrosis and the skin nodules. A rare possibility which we kept of breast malignancy with metastasis because this patient had breast mass for the past eight years and these breast masses were bilateral. So we kept the possibility of breast malignancy low on cards. So we did mammography of this patient which showed ill-defined high density speculated masses of the bilateral breast. So this is the craniocaudal view and this is the middle lateral oblique view. Tissue biopsy has been done from this mass which showed fibroadipose tissue infiltrated by the tumor cells. So these are the tumor cells which are lying in the cords 
and these cells have hyper eosinophilic uh, nuclei sorry hi hyper uh, uh, chromatic nuclei and the moderate eosinophilic cytoplasm these cells were positive for cytokeratin on uh, ihc and there was loss of e cadherin which was suggestive of lobular carcinoma so ultimately we diagnosed this patient as breast malignancy with metastasis so i would like to uh, raise three questions for the panelist where uh, so what is the role of igg4 related disease uh, so igg4 uh, levels in igg4 related disease in which other conditions igg4 uh, levels can be elevated and when should we not consider the diagnosis of igg4 related disease thank you that was very good that one thank you <laughs> so i think while the panelists are thinking about the questions <laughs> I ask the I ask the floor for their questions and comments. Uh, uh, Ashok Kumar, sir. I think IgG4 related disease is supported by histological proof. The histology must support the uh, level. Just the level is not enough. It's quite non-specific. You have to have high IgG4 plus story form fibrosis or whatever the pathologist considers the hallmark. So you, you want to answer that, Dhapan? Why a biopsy was not? Uh, yes, sir. Biopsy was not considered. Why? Sir, biopsy we did. We did skin biopsy for the patient twice and we did breast biopsy also. But in the first sample which was reviewed by pathologists, they didn't show any features of IgG4 disease. These were inconclusive. Then we did the uh, breast biopsy which was also not suggestive for IgG4 related disease. And because th this patient had long bone involvement on the x-ray, so we ruled out the possibility of IgG4 disease that our main diagnosis which we kept for the patient was Ardham Chester disease. Because she typically had that osteosclerotic and osteolytic lesions, which is typical of IgG uh, at the disease. Yeah. You, yeah. I'm wondering, Seven. you you pick up the breast cancer, but what has been going on for all these years? So many lesions everywhere. Sis, here uh, so she was not uh, bothered about this. This breast cancer. She, she was had not for bothered. For what is our? Why did you do the name? So she presented to us. <laughs> so let me answer those questions for the audience. So we first thought when she was referred as IgG4 disease, so we thought skin biopsy is the easiest to do. So first skin biopsy was done, which showed only fibrosis, lot of fibrosis. So they were not sure. When we saw the x-rays, we said, obviously, it's not IgG4 disease. It is Wertheim Chester. After the CT report came, this has been worked up in the last one month, because she came to us only a month ago. So the radiologists also felt that it is Wertheim Chester disease, because to have lesions around the aorta, bilateral hydronephrosis. So then we did another skin biopsy. We said, if it is Wertheim Chester, it will show us the macrophages. So that next skin biopsy was stained for macrophages with S100, other macrophage markers. It did not show any macrophages. Once we ruled out those two, Wertheim Chester also was low on the cards. Then a breast biopsy was done, one biopsy. They initially reviewed, they said it's only fibrosis. They could not appreciate these uh, tumor cells because they are few and far between. So the first biopsy report was only fibrosis. Then we said, no, please do more sectioning and all. They did stain for macrophage in this biopsy. They didn't find anything. Then they looked up more sections and they could find these few cells around. When they were stained, then this came. Still, they were not confident, the pathologists. They said there are only a small number of cells. So they advised us to do a bone marrow biopsy. Then a bone marrow biopsy was done in her. The bone marrow biopsy also showed these tumors from the site. So then we could confirm that that site, the bone involvement is also because of the malignant tumor. The breast is also malignancy. And probably the rest of the thing is also by this because we've already done four biopsies. We can't subject her to do more biopsies to find out. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for that uh, explanation. I think Durban said the penny really dropped when the patient's uh, main complaint of uh, pain all over was yes. reconsidered and she had the x-rays done. Yeah. So I think the, the, the clinical sort of uh, message here is to... Uh, yeah, always pay attention to the clinical complaints which the patient has. Your comments, Sandeep? So I guess uh, what this teaches us is that any breast, breast mass should be no. you know, thoroughly investigated. and. The very reason that two or three other things are happening, um, you know, sort of set you off on a different course. But the breast lesion should have been evaluated ASAP, which is uh, especially in an elderly female. This was like 60. 
puts you off and and you start to wonder whether these two correlations unrelated events uh, malignancy on one side and igg4 related disease were well, there just to make you learn and understand what what is you know our digester what is igg4 and they are all so close together and uh, it makes sense for you to have gone the way that you did and uh, the other differentials of uh, could you could you specify some of the other differentials how does igg4 related disease pre present Can so this present as a typical classical? organ environment. So, uh, like in Western uh, series, they have shown pancreas is the most common organ involved. But whatever series which we have from India, one is from CMC, which showed the eye is the most common the organ involved. So, this typically patient, uh, present patient, are the slow growing masses, which may, may be incidentally picked up uh, on the CTs, or there is a soft tissue encasement around the aorta, which can be picked up from the CT. But if the patient having orbital mass as such, that would be the main complaint. So, in the reverse, low growing mass. Masses when we are having, so we should consider diagnosis of IgG4 so, related so, disease. So uh, you mean that IgG4 related disease can be under differential of yes. Wegener's disease, yes, Wegener's yes, Wegener's. and and there's this uh, other presentation, Nicolaj syndrome, Kutner syndrome. Yes, so you have some mandibular uh, enlargement, and, and you have, and there are these subtle differences where you, you know, in a Sjogren syndrome, you actually have a lot of sicca features, whereas in IgG4 related disease, you won't have that set. You in in Sjogren syndrome you have an ANA positive here you yeah, won't have this. Positive. Pancreatic cancer is a is a yes. very big differential for autoimmune pancreatitis and we've had uh, run-ins with the oncologist and uh, there has been a time when when the patient uh, you know pendulums between department of gastroenterology so. The biopsy is very important. Yes, uh, most of the patient of pancreas, like they uh, uh, undergo Whipple's procedure, and then when the tissue section biopsy is taken from them, then they are diagnosed with IgG4 related disease. So that is the point which we have to look at. So, uh, a practical tip for the exam: if you get a yeah. systemic so, vasculitis yeah. uh, patient and you can't think of anything else, think about IgG4 related yeah. disease. I just you know so so supposing uh, you know there is a this is a patient of uh, proven sort of igg4 related disease so uh, what's the role of igg4 level monitoring uh, i really don't know to i had, i looked this up and i couldn't really find much and i believe at least 3 to 6 months uh, should be given for uh, monitoring and there are times when igg4 is never high to begin with so how do you monitor something that's never risen and a lot of patients will show a response So I think uh, the prudent way would be to go about every three months or so in a patient who has elevated IgG4 related uh, levels, and then maybe see what's happening clinically. Most importantly, wait, sir, and then yeah. Roshik. Uh, what was the biopsy? In fact, there were so many masses. If it was not IgG4, I'm I'm very sure they must have commented. On macrophages or yes, something. Sir, sir. What so, was the biopsy proven? Biopsy of the skin only showed the fibrosis. We did biopsy twice, and the, and after reviewing after the second time, then they told us that if, even the first skin biopsy which we had done, that also showed the tumor cells. So after that probing and discussion with the pa uh, pathologist, then we finally got to know because these tumor cells were very scanty. So they have to uh, uh, do the uh, uh, like uh, cross section again, and they have to do the staining. Then then only they could find these tumor. muscles so this patient has underwent uh, the biopsy but even the first report which we got of all the three biopsy didn't reveal yes, any right. consistent finding that that madam has described very well uh, can i take a trainee question kaushik please uh, can Thank we consider uh, can we entertain two uh, two diagnoses here sir So, so the presentation is so atypical. We have oddities for all that. So in IG4, we have oddity for IgG4 related disease. We had oddity for the breast malignancy also because this patient has this breast mass for the eight years, and uh, these bilateral breast masses were there. So yeah. like to consider possibility of bilateral breast malignancy is quite rare. So that's what they were oddity for all the things. 
Yeah. We couldn't fit in. That's what I tell Th that uh, like we should take the whole picture in account and not miss the elephant. So thank in you. the room, so that was. Thank you. So have point. you reviewed uh, any literature? Hang on, hang on. So we'll, we'll take the next question. Kaushik, please. Darpan. Keep it brief. Please. Darpan, fantastic case. Just I have two questions related to your presentation. One is the fact that whatever experience I have with IgG4, yes, of course, multiple organs can be involved. But this was extensive. You gave a list of like six systems involved with IgG4. So I didn't know what the collective wisdom of the audience is in terms of IgG4 being so extensive. This is one. And second, is there any data on IgG4 coming in as an epitope over the, as a consequence of the breast malignancy. Is there any data as a reactive yes. form no, of sir, IgG4? Keep, no it, keep it very brief yes. because we are closing this. Uh, there is no data but the, the, uh, the pathogenesis of IgG4 disease which is explained as it is a, a re result of the chronic stimulation by any antigen. So either could be infection or this malignant antigen could have triggered this IgG4. That, could be, that is the pathology which, which we can put. But there is no review data for that. Fantastic. I think I'm sorry, a lot of questions, a lot of interest because this is, uh, you know, age-old connection between malignancy and uh, rheumatic diseases. So thank you, Dharpan, oh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, that's been discussed. Thank you. That was the purpose. He had two interesting slides uh, which we had discussed. <laughs> thank you. So we we'll go on to the last uh, um, case by Dr. Abhijit Agarwal. Quickly, while we, we are preparing for the the last one, and uh, we have sent a um, QR code for the quiz. I put it in the Young Romance group. Please share it among yourselves. Um, not it's only for in-person, uh, you know, presence who are in the audience, in the, in the conference hall. Uh, please uh, download it and send an email request. You get an access, okay? So as soon as, uh, you know, it is ready, the time, we will uh, start that. Okay, you be ready. Send the request now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Please uh, start, uh, Dr. Good Abhijit. afternoon to everyone present here, respected faculty members, respected panelists, my seniors, and my colleagues. I'm Dr. Abhijit from Max Hospital, Delhi. <coughs> and the proven is in fact an emphatic statement, just like this conference, on to blurring the margins between what's rare and reality. I present to you a case of 30-year-old male who was admitted on th April 2020 with right upper limb weakness, tumbling and, uh, tingling and numbness sensation for the last two days, progressive weakness in the right side for the one day, imbalance while walking and, vert uh, walking and vertigo, with a past history of smoking and diabetes with no other neurological manifestations of higher functions or any other clinical symptoms. On examination, the power on the right side was 4 by 5, DTRs were absent and planters were extensors. With this clinical background, his initial investigation showed he had a normal hemogram, KFT and LFT. The inflammatory markers were normal, ANA was negative, and serum protein electrophoresis were also normal. The tox screen and HIV also came out to be normal. CT angio and head and neck was done by the neurology team under which he was admitted, which was normal once again. Further on, the investigations like CSF showed some amount of raised proteins, WBCs in the range of 50 with mostly lymphocytes, and NMDA being positive. Following that, the patient also underwent some other neurological investigations in the form of NCV, showing demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy in all limbs, an MRI of brain showing a query infarct type kind of lesion in right parietal white, uh, white matter, with involving bilateral frontoparietal deep white matter also. The MRI spine being largely normal. Also, a visual potential was done by the neurology team, which showed bilateral anterior visual pathway defect. Now, the rheumatology team came into effect because of the ACE levels that was done, which came to be 91.4. On reviewing this case history and clinical examination, it showed no other findings apart from the already that I have mentioned before. The CCT chest and abdomen were ordered for this patient, which showed mediastinal and hyalur lymph nodes with some patchy ground glass opacities and septal thickening. I forgot to mention one point in the last slide, that the MRI of brain also showed some amount of periventricular demyelination. On the CCT, we saw the lymph nodes, the bronch, 
showed non-cheating granulomas with being negative for uh, gene expert. Finally, a diagnosis of sarcoidosis with acute demyelinating polyradiculoneuropathy with involvement of right peri peri uh, parietal infarct with central periventricular demyelination with optic nerve involvement was made. The patient already had received previous doses of IVIG as per the neurology team. And as soon as the bronch was done, the patient was discharged on prednisolone 60 milligram that was tapered to be tapered on the later months. With this background, I'll take you to the journey of the remaining of the 2020 year in which the patient has a perilous time. In the year of 2020, in August itself, just a few months later, patient had giddiness and difficulty in walking, received a pulse dose of 500 milligram uh, NPS for five days, and was started on MMF, one gram BD, along with DEFCOT. The patient was then discharged. In the same setting, a PET scan was also done, which showed that there was some amount of FDG in, uh, uptake in the hilar lymph nodes. Apart from that, nowhere in the body were there any kind of uptakes. In the coming November, the patient once again had an acute onset left-sided weakness with some gait difficulties. And in December, in the same year, the patient once again had right lower limb weakness with double vision, and this time was shifted to methotrexate and on Visolon. In this entirety of 2020, the patient has received multiple doses of pulse steroids in every admission. So he has undergone a very uh, high dose steroid regime in the entirety of 2020 year. In the same setting, in the last uh, month of 2020, patient once again had uh, a lymph node biopsy done, which once again showed non cacheting granuloma. So this was confirmed twice. Apart from that, HRCT was also repeated just to see the progression of the disease. Is there any other kind of infiltration which showed no such progression? MRI brain and MRI spine was also done in the same year repeatedly, which once again showed no progressive lesions in the CNS or spinal cord. Now, after this perilous journey in 2020, we come to 2021. In the beginning of the year itself, in January, patient had fever and jerky movements during the sleep was once again admitted and started on levetiracetam, but was continued on his other medications for uh, steroids and methotrexate. After his first consult, when we did it in April 2020, the second consult came to us in February 2021. This time, patient came with slurring of speech with tingling numbness in the left side. The MRI showed newer lesions in the form of flare hyperintensities in left internal capsule region. Apart from that, a DSA was also done, which showed involvement of both medium and uh, large vessels in the form of multifocal stenosis involving both bilateral terminal internal carotid, ACA, basilar arteries, and basilar top. Involvement of this internal carotid artery made the radiologist say that it's an appearance kind of moa moa pattern. In the same setting, the patient was once again given pulse dose of steroids of one gram for the next five days. We were reviewing this patient for these five days, and in the same admission, to our surprise, patient developed urgency, urinary urgency and weakness in bilateral lower limbs. This time an MRI spine was repeated which showed mild patchy long segment T2 weight hyperintensities in mid dorsal cord with no other significant enhancements. This is his MRI spine. So a diagnosis of longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis was also made along with the previous manifestations. We are caught in uh, a loop here that despite having uh, received multiple doses of high dose uh, pulse steroids, uh, methotrexate and MMF, this patient still is showing uh, some amount of relentless progression in his neurological symptoms, both clinically as well as in imaging. We now decide to escalate the therapy to rituximab. As the patient is on rituximab, I'll just try to uh, give you a brief introduction into what he has gone through in the entirety of year. In 2020, he had four admissions. In which, e in which each of his admissions he received some amount of uh, pulse steroids, starting with IVIG, receiving pulse steroids, methotrexate, MMF, and later on also receiving rituximab. In the year of 2021, when the patient has already undergone two doses of rituximab, patient is still showing some amount of progression in his imaging. Although clinically he's showing no other sim new symptoms, but imaging wise, what the radiologist reports is that there is some amount of progression in demyelinating areas with new areas being showing demyelination and the older areas still sh having persistent demyelination. So the rituximab is perfectly not working for this patient. Now we are caught in the loop and just for a review, this is a case of sarcoidosis with high ACE levels, granulomas showing mediastinal biopsy, malignancy being ruled out from PET because there are no other uptakes and HRCT also showing no other progressive 
uh, findings. After that, just to review on the symptoms that the patient has. In CNS involvement, patient has an infarct, medium to large vessel vasculitis, which is showing moya moya like pattern. A long segment myelitis in the spinal cord, which has come recently in the February 2021. And the uh, presenting manifestation of demyelinating axonal, uh, sorry, demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. It's not axonal. With this background, I would like to give you that this patient has an amalgamation of all that neurological symptoms one can have in neurosarcoidosis. No matter how rare it is, but this was a reality for this patient. Starting from peripheral nerves into the central nervous system, involving deep white matter, optic nerve, internal capsule, as well as moya moya like vasculitis, and also involving spine in the later course of disease as longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. We are caught in a loop right now. In May 2021, in spite of patient receiving rituximab, patient once again has newer neurological symptoms in the form of double vision. Patient once again receives a solumetrol dose of 500 mg for three days. Now, the room, as per rheumatologist, we are now in a very tight corner as the patient is having continuously increasing amount of uh, neurological symptoms with progression in his imaging also. The biopsy has proven that this is in fact a non-caseating granuloma, negative for uh, gene expert, that means it's not tuberculosis. PET scan has showed that there are no other uptakes, so there is nothing that is kind of malignancy, and no other form, uh, causes of granulomas can be found out till now. In this enigma, we sat down with the patient's relatives and the neurology team, and we are trying to discuss what later can be done, as this is in fact a case of refractory neurosarcoidosis. What other things that are left in our armamentarium to make sure that these patients are having some amount of regression, at least stabilization of his current symptoms, because it is relentlessly progressive. After a deep thought, in spite of us being in a lot of doubt because the patient has a presenting symptom of demyelinating lesion, we are thinking of a drug that we have not used till now. And that drug is infliximab. The reason we were hesitant for this is because this drug has, in fact, a rare complication of promoting demyelinating lesions. And this case, as we can see, is a dreamland for rare in, uh, presentations. So what, what are the odds? In spite of what we are saying, to our luck, the patient responded to infliximab and there were no lesions post three months of infliximab therapy, either in the brain MRI or in the spine. So my take home messages to you is, would be, neurosarcoidosis, although found only in 5% cases of sarcoidosis, can be a presenting feature. Every facet of neuroanatomy can be involved in neurosarcoidosis. An exhaustive evaluation is in fact necessary. And infliximab, though not advocated for demyelinating lesions, was the only drug that worked in our patients. With this point, I would just end my presentation with two more uh, things to say. First are the two questions that I would like to ask our respected panelists and our respected teachers. Is first, what is the uh, vision that we can have when we are seeing a patient of neurosarcoidosis and to what manifestations we have to look for? The second, would you have escalated the therapy much more quicker given the background that all these manifestations happened during the COVID era? The last thing that I have to say is to my fellow colleagues that uh, this patient, uh, had very rare manifestations and that too it was in real time. So hence do remember these manifestations and in terms do remember his name or at least the meaning of his name because although these manifestations were rare they were reality for him and they have been proved to be in present in literature and hence the meaning behind the name of my patient is also the proven. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your kind attention. Thank you Abhijit. I think that was a very clear and confident presentation. So I think uh, the floor is uh, open to questions. I'm expecting a lot of questions. So Dr. Amita to start with. Why didn't we use cyclophosphamide in this patient? We could have given it much earlier. You gave MMF, methotrexide. The patient who has such a severe neurological disease, CNS manifestation during the COVID times, I would have given it much, much earlier when the patient had the second thing. Yes, ma'am. Maybe it would have changed the course. Yes, ma'am. Avinash? Uh, what are the association of uh, these NMO spectrum disorders with uh, sarcoid? You happen to mention he had or autoimmune encephalitis with sarcoid. Patient sarcoids. didn't have any encephalitis features during the presentation or his entirety of the course. You mentioned but NMD CSF. antibodies are in fact present even in rare cases in demyelinating lesions. So yes, the commonest presentation of NMDA would be psychiatric symptoms, but it, they are also present in uh, patients who have demyelinating lesions also, although rare. And uh, we did not escalate the therapy, ma'am, because in April 2020 was the first time we saw this patient. 
and the next time rheumatology referral was taken was in February 2021. So for the entire year, the patient was not under us. Thank you. And while more questions are being contemplated, can I ask, so after you gave infliximab, what happened to the patient? I mean, what's the status now? The patient now is showing uh, continuously regression of his symptoms. And in imaging also, the previous uh, demyelinating areas have reduced with no new uh, demyelinating areas in the upcoming uh, MRIs. Sir, see, uh, that's what uh, up-to-date mentions to give anti-TNF agents much higher. So always there is, uh, we have to see the risk and benefit ratio. Though we say that uh, TNF uh, blockers causes uh, demyelination, we have given a lot. And especially with the human molecules coming, I think it will be very less. So, keeping the risk-benefit ratio, if we had given upfront TNF-alpha, uh, we could have at least, uh, yes. that's another thought, you yes. know. And I am not sure rituximab comes in the armamentarium of no. sarcoidosis because I thought it's only antibody-mediated disease. Uh, it will be more effective. Yes. Uh, you so can correct me. Just now, ma'am, to come in. Uh, yeah. Actually, right from the beginning, they have done a fabulous workup coming to the conclusion of neurosarcoidosis, cognitive function, uh, dysfunction, the polyneuropathy, and the patient uh, having lymph node which has shown non caseating I think the diagnosis of neurosarcoid did not have any problem. The problem was because the patient did not follow up regularly. Neurosarcoid has to be followed up very regularly and meticulously to see the new things. And the other one small uh, request would have been to see whether cardiac sarcoidosis was also existing, but I think your FDG pet did not show it. The pet anything. did not show any yeah, other kind of sarcoidosis. At least you could have mentioned the ECG and fine. whether the patient had any fascicular block. Considering the treatment part of it, I feel that uh, the choice would have been infliximab only. And uh, rituximab, I think you must have given because of long track myelitis and NMO positivity. Yes, so I think at that time you must have had a dilemma what to give. And uh, demyelination with TNF. It will, would be very rare yes, in such a patient. A rare, yeah, and I think rightly you have shown that there is a good response with infliximab. Yes, yeah. Many times they are not diagnosed at all because they are seen primarily with neurophysicians and who do not at all agree that the patient has neurosarcoidosis unless one biopsy is shown and if there is no lymph node because many times there is no such kind of lymph node which, which will help you. Uh, you should see for the hilar lymph nodes or reticular appearance and you should see for the associated problems which are there and uh, the CSF would show only a little raised in the protein and uh, there is no there is soluble interleukin 2 etc but they are absolutely in the experimental stages. The exome sequences that's something which you can see for what kind of neurosarcoid there could be but otherwise it's a difficult scenario to manage and I think a close observation should yes. be the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sapman. Excellent presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Vaidhi, he presented her data on rituximab and sarcoid. So there is some data from the MAO also, just like in multiple sclerosis. My question was, did you do an APLA? Because there are some associations. Yes, sir. in fact, an APLA was done when okay. we were called for the second time, and the APLA was negative. Uh, uh, infliximab, as per the American Thoracic Society in neurosarcoidosis, takes about six months to act. So it's a, don't expect like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or encouraging spondylitis. It's going to take time. Dr. Priyanka, you have a question? Oh. Okay. Anything to add? Was the maintenance, sorry, was maintenance therapy given after the solumidrol in this patient in the beginning? Yes, ma'am. The patient was Mitter continuously on decreasing yeah. tapering doses of steroids while he was off, off and the... And MMF uh, and this thing was also given? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes. Starting from MMF, then methotrexate was started. Yeah. Because of the non-responding nature of the disease, rituximab was given when we were called for the second time. So I think uh, um, what I'll do is I will uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. Aarti Sharma to present her take-home points and drill home the, the key messages onto us. And I would like to thank everybody. I think uh, this was a phenomenal session uh, with lots and lots of audience participation. Thank you. Uh, just a suggestion for uh, scientific presentations. Try to avoid negativity, the fact that you've been losing, but then saying that I've, we were caught in a loop, uh, well, take it up as a challenge. Don't say that we were testing, treating, failing, then repeat, test, testing, failing. 
so it's sort of a loop i agree but then be positive about it we, we and, and never never it. fall into the loop again <laughs> Uh, Thank just, you. Just again, one more uh, suggestion. Um, you, you have seen the link, no? I think we have circulated uh, in your phones and also physically on the paper we have sent it. Please click the link and uh, you have to ask for a request. So Dr. Ruchika will approve you, then uh, it is done. You, you, you can participate. Uh, I want you to do that before you go for lunch, okay? Sorry? Postures are... Questions live, it will come, then you have to answer. So once you start, no, then only it works. Just your, your request for access. Okay? Yes. On mail, you have to act. request. Thank you. Uh, so everyone, after the Only for in-person. Okay. So after this brainstorming and eye-opening sessions and important miscellaneous cases, it's time to wrap up zombies, kids, elephant in the bag and take them home as a take-home message. And I probably I may help you out in that and easing out the things so it's not easy to pack up zombies and elephants in the bag, but maybe some parts of them, right? So I'll start off with the Vexa syndrome. That is an eye-opener for me as well because I have not seen that case in my experience and this had been the recent addition to the list. And uh, as has been clearly said, VEXAS includes the in, uh, lipid inclusions are there being described in its uh, VEXAS uh, terminology itself. It's an X-linked syndrome and it's an auto-inflammatory syndrome as well. And uh, what is the close differential to it is the mass and the AOST and the undifferentiated connective tissue disorders. So these three things are there where you can have the similar mm -hmm. spectrum as we see in the VEXAS. So when do we suspect the vexer syndrome is when you have an elderly male, classically, though there has been case series which have been defined in the females as well, but yes, the classical one is the elderly male presenting you with the fever, the weight loss, along with the rheumatological manifestations like chondritis, vasculitis, neutrophilic dermatosis, even the eye manifestations, and along with that you have hematological manifestations as well, where you have predominantly the macrocytic anemias, the uh, neutropenias and uh, uh, platelet count may be normal, but that has to be uh, less than around two lakhs. So these three things increases the specificity and the sensitivity. Uh, as per the diagnosis of the vexus is concerned, it is done by the simple test, which is the PCR, which is not available in India uh, now, but, uh, but that can be done by the ubiquitin gene mutation test, and that is available with the PCR not in India. So uh, as per the treatment is concerned, it is a refractory disease. If diagnosed, it takes a lot of time to treat the disease. The treatment is still underway. There are no particular guidelines to that. Uh, IVIG steroids are the mainstay, but yes, and there has been some response to the JEC kinase inhibitors as well. So tofacitinib is one drug which can, uh, which can be useful in the VEXA syndrome, right? So uh, after VEXAS, I would like to discuss the important one, which is like uh, the IgG4 related disease the breast metastasis one. So whenever we have the lesions like periorbital swelling, you have ptosis, proptosis, nodules, along with the imaging findings of uh, homogeneously enhancing lesions and uh, soft tissue enhancement in the mediastinum or retroperitoneum, there are three, four differentials which come into our mind. Yes, IgG4 related diseases are there. Then you have Erdheim Chester, which has been well described as uh, in the cases. And then you have LCH as well. So Erdheim chest, uh, what is there to differentiate between IgG4 related disease and Erdheim chester is we don't have typical skeletal findings in the IgG4 related disease which we have in Erdheim chester. Especially the long bone involvement which we see in the Erdheim chester disease is classic of this disease. And uh, on histopathology, if you have certain lesions of nodules, in Erdheim chester you have find uh, foamy lipid laden histiocytosis, right? So uh, the clear-cut uh, dif uh, difference between these two is the skeletal lesions, which is commonly seen in the long bones, probably the legs. And you see a lot of osteosclerosis in the Erdheim Chester disease. And uh, if I talk about Erdheim Chester more, we have uh, certain findings in the CT abdomen as well, where we see perinephric fat being described as hairy kidney. Perinephric fat is hairy kidney in the Erdheim Chester. There's a lot of uh, fat accumulation around that. And in the similar areas, you can have bone scan. In the bone scan, increase uptake. And the regular follow-up with the pet is required in these patients. 
And the other one is the neurosarcoid, very well described and the easy one. But yes, the treatment is difficult because if the neurosarcoid occur in isolation, it is very difficult to pick up a diagnosis and start treating the patient. Usually the cranial nerve involvement is common in that, and especially the facial nerve, which is common, so the uh, is there, and the patient can have auditory and vestibular disturbances as well in these. So when we talk about the diagnosis of neurosarcoid in totality, it is not only about the imaging, it is about the amalgamation of clinical symptoms, the imaging arm, and it is about the laboratory arm as well, where you see the increased ACE levels. So it is in the totality we make a diagnosis of neurosarcoid, and as said, the treatment usually involves the infliximab and the high dose of steroids. The case four was MAS, which was seen in the AOST. MAS is actually a life-threatening complication, which is usually seen in the JIA patients and in the AOST as well. So as we see, uh, there is a uh, difficult to differentiate between the MAS and the flare of AOST, but there are certain. Uh, subtle signs or uh, there are certain things in the laboratory where we can easily differentiate between the mass and the uh, flare of AOST, like normal ESR, which we see in the mass. Then you have hypofibronegidemia and then uh, leukopenia, anemia, and hypertriglyceridemia. Similarly, you have evidence of coagulopathy as well in the patients of the mass. And uh, I would like to add that myas has been uh, classified among the secondary form of HLH as well. So uh, the primary uh, HLH is basically caused by the perforin mutation and the secondary is the mass one. So to conclude, I think the important ones, the vexers, we have message to carry that we should look out for the lipid vacuoles in that. For the neurosarcoid, it should be the combination of all the factors. For the mass, we should look out at the ESR, we should look out at the fibrinogen levels, and as far as the earthen chest and the IgG4 related diseases are concerned, we should always have a skeletal service to look out the lesions present in the skeleton. Thank you. Thank you. We are just deliberating on the winner. So, this gives me the opportunity to thank all of you once again. And I think in, in a case-based conference like this, the audience are the, the real faculty. So I would like to thank the faculty off the floor and on the floor for this fantastic session. So the casting vote is actually with Sandeep, and he's on the phone. You got it. So I think, yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. As it happens that, you know, we are uh, interested in rare and uh, new, newest and the rarest. So Vexus Syndrome, uh, Dr. Prateek uh, Dev from the PGI Chandigarh. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, so a quick lunch break, lunch break reduced to 30 minutes. So we have a rapid fire session, ultra short cases, like AK-47. There are 1920 cases waiting for you. So it will be fun watching uh, those presentations. So please come back uh, by, what's the time now? By 1.15. Please be here. Please reassemble by 1.15 p.m. Thank you. For the postgraduates, uh, please uh, see that you scan it and uh, send a request, email request for access so that you can participate in the quiz. Exciting prizes are waiting for you.
Welcome back, back to business. Good cases are waiting for you all. So before the rapid fire, again I'm requesting all the residents um, to access the link and send for the you know the, send the request for access. Uh, any issues with that scan? Again, show. Because we have kept in the, there is a group called Young Romads. I think most of your people are on that. Please help each other to access. If you don't have access, then you won't be able to part of the quiz. So now, we're going to start the rapid fire session, also called ultra short cases. Every two, three minutes, they fire one case for you. Mostly there won't be much discussion because these are like spotters. So these are the best cases, uh, best short cases in this format. Now I request Dr. Varindir and Dr. Varaprasad to start the session uh, immediately because already people started uh, leaving to catch their flight. Now over to you, Dr. Varun and uh, Dr. Varun Prasad. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Molly. And good afternoon and welcome back. So uh, without much ado, we'll just start the session. I'll request uh, Ramya to please come up as the first presenter. She's from Kim's. And uh, before she starts, we'll have it for at two minutes, I'll tell you to switch to your last slide so that you finish in another 10 seconds and maybe one comment or question from the audience. So that by three minutes, we are over because we have 19 cases. So that's the only way we can fit it into an hour. Ah, okay. Quick announcement. All the presenters should come and sit in the front seats, please. Yeah. Immediately. Thank you. Good afternoon. Today, uh, today I'm going to present about forgotten SPA mimic. So a 35-year-old year female, a village serpent from Mahbubnagar district, Telangana, presented to us with pain in bilateral shoulder joints, knee joints, and heel region for more than six years. She had early morning stiffness in her shoulder girdles for 60 minutes, chronic fatigue for three years, visited multiple hospitals with no significant improvement in her clinical status. On examination, we just noted tenderness in bilateral shoulder joints and bilateral sacroiliac joints. There was limited and painful spinal mobility with an absence of joint swelling. Based on these findings, a provisional diagnosis of spondyloarthropathy was thought of looking at her posture which was stooped. Her investigations revealed ESR was 28 and serum creatinine was 2.7 and HLA B27 not detected. Her uh, X-ray sacroiliac joint showed uh, no significant narrowing and her all the x-rays showed significant uh, sclerosis, generalized osteosclerosis. With we advised uh, x-ray uh, AP forearm, which showed uh, mem interosteous membrane thickening, which is classical of uh, fluorosis, and also her uh, uh, lateral uh, spine x-ray, which is showing posterior membrane thickening. Her serum calcium was 8.3, uric acid was elevated 9.9, .9, potassium was 5.6 milli equivalents, and she already had grade 2 renal parenchymal changes. The CKD could be attributed to her uh, NSAID abuse uh, as well related to fluorosis. Her urine fluoride and serum fluoride were normal because she was uh, consuming RO water for more than a year now. We wanted to check the water fluoride level, so we asked her to bring her village bore water we contacted NIN, National Institute of Nutrition, requested them to perform the fluoride levels, which were 1.38 parts per uh, million. Ramya, can you come to your last slide? Yes, so this is fluorosis mimicking as spondyloarthropathy. Okay, so we have one quick comment or question. Anybody with experience? Uh, can I ask the next one? Okay, uh, thank you, Ramya. We'll go on to the next uh, case. Uh, that's by Dr. Sahana from uh, PD Hinduja, and she'll be presenting two cases actually. So both your cases, present them one after the other. 
Sahana, at two minutes, we'll tell you to go to the last, and we'll take one comment from the audience. OK, thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting a, a short case under this title. So this is a patient, uh, is a rare case of nodular myopathy. It's a 39 year old male who was admitted in the surgical ward with painless swelling of the left calf for four weeks duration. There was no history of fever, trauma, or prolonged immobilization. There were no other history of other similar lesions anywhere else in the body, even prior to this. There was no history of joint pain, skin rashes, or oral ulcers. On examinations, vitals were stable. There was a firm, fixed, non tender swelling, 9 by 6 centimeter, in the posterior aspect of the left calf. The edges were clearly demarcated. There was no change in temperature or color of the skin over the swelling. Systemic examination was unremarkable. So with this, we just thought the differential diagnosis, could it be a soft tissue tumor, sarcoma or a giant cell tumor, hemangioma, a baker cyst, or the last but not the least is an infection. So the investigation's baseline blood test was normal. CPK was also normal. MRI was suggestive of an inflammatory mass lesion in the left gastronemus. CPK was done after that. And the true cut biopsy of the mass showed granulomatous myositis. Worker for TB, including gene expert uh, and PCR, was negative. Fungal and bacterial infections were also ruled out. Serum ACE levels and calcium levels were normal. CT chest showed few non-necrotic lymph nodes, with the lung panicama totally normal. Pulmonary function tests were also normal. So this is the MRI. What you can see is uh, the intramuscular nodular swelling on T2 imaging. And this is also, you can see, a clear nodular swelling. So. This is a histopathology which shows a non cachetting uh, granulomatous inflammation here uh, where the error is pointed. So we made a diagnosis of nodular sarcoidosis. We know it's a diagnostic of, uh, diagnosis of exclusion. So we started him on uh, oral steroids at 0.5 mg per kg and 10 mg per week of methotrexate. In four weeks, there was significant clinical improvement and also radiological. I'll show you the image. MRI image uh, showed significant reduction in the uh, lesion after four weeks. So this is the image where you can see the edema and the inflammation uh, in the muscle has come down. This is a, uh, the clear image where you can see over here. So that's I just want to uh, conclude my uh, case presentation here. Thank you, Sahana. Any, you. any comments? One single comment from the audience? OK, uh, if there is none, then Sahana, you can go on to your second case. Yes, sir. So I cannot find, okay, so here. This one, sir? Oh, yeah, sorry. I couldn't see that. Yet. Okay. All right. So this is another patient. Uh, I mean, it's a post-COVID iotitis. Now, this is a 61-year-old male without any comorbidities who received his first dose of COVID vaccine in April 2021. It was COVID shield what he received. Two months later, he developed episodic low-grade fever, and there were no other clinical features. Fever subsided on its own with on and off paracetamol, 650 milligram, and after which he developed dry cough on and off for the next three months. There was also an in intentional weight loss of about 8 kgs. He was seen by a physician who found the physical examination to be normal. And after an extensive workup, only thing that we found was CRP 37 and ESR of 68. They have included even the worker for TB, fungus, everything. Chest X-ray was normal, so he was treated with antibiotics. In the first week of Jan 2022, he developed mild COVID infection with RT-PCR positive, which settled with symptomatic uh, treatment and home quarantine. However, in view of his persistent ele elevated inflammatory markers and weight loss, he was advised a PET scan. And this is a PET scan that was showing a nice uh, homogeneous uh, circumferential uptake in the, uh, along the walls, um, I mean, uh, ascending and the de descending iota, as well as in the bilateral subclavian arteries and femoral arteries, which I'm, I could not show here because of the limitation of the slide number. And there was also bilateral non-specific interstitial pneumonia. So with this pet, pet report, he was referred to us. And on examination, we felt all the pulses were well felt. There were no uh, brewery. There's no temporal artery tenderness, no carotid artery tenderness. BP was normal uh, in upper and lower limbs, and there was not much of a difference. Musculoskeletal and systemic examination were totally normal. So since pulses were normal, we wanted to get, confirm uh, the PET findings with another imaging modality, and we got an MR iotography done, which confirmed diffuse edematous wall thickening in the entire iota from the arch up to the bifurcation, showing heterogeneous post-contrast enhancement. So what is this? Is it COVID vaccine or is it COVID-induced iotitis? We just uh, give the diagnosis of post-COVID 
iotitis without any particular disease. And we started him on oral prednisolone 0.5 milligram per day and oral methotrexate 15 mg per week. So, with this. Okay, uh, we'll open to the audience. Any comment from anybody? Yes, Dr. Sapa. Right, sir. Right, given actim raw, but he did not respond. The fever. I have intravascular. Uh, no, like her only post COVID out. It is another case at a dissection. So there are these cases mm. in reported. Report, sir, right. Okay, uh, Sahana, thank you. We'll have. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for the presentation. We'll have Dr. Rajat from SGPGI next, please. Uh, I thought it is. Sir, I'm. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No issues. Sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am presenting not a rare yet a challenging case of refractory granulomatous polyangitis. What should we think? So this is a case of 72 years old gentleman who presented to us in February 2022 with a one year history of nasal discharge, stuffiness, epistaxis and crusting for which he was uh, taking antihistaminics. And in November, he had high grade fever, nasal crust, broadening of nasal bridge, and the CT chest uh, was done as a part of fever evaluation, which showed 4 mm right apical nodule and subtle GGOs, for which he underwent bronchoalveolar lavage, which was normal, lung biopsy was normal, and he was being treated as hypersensitive uh, with pneumonitis with 1 mg per kg steroids. However, he had no improvement in the symptoms with big size crust coming from the nose, so uh, he underwent uh, uh, ANCA testing and only Immunofluorescence was done, which was positive for uh, perinuclear pattern, and he was being treated as GPA and steroids were continued. Then in January, he had high-grade fever, for which he was admitted in Ames Patna, although he had a urine report of uh, 730 milligram per day of protein urea, for which he underwent renal biopsy, and it was labeled as normal. So he received methylprednisolone pulse and developed pancytopenia. Uh, bone marrow examination was normal. He was referred to us as a case of steroid-resistant GP. Investigation done in SDPGI showed pancytopenia, increased uh, liver enzymes, anchor serology was negative, raised peritin, bone marrow has marked hemophagocytosis, although there was no malignancy, and all the uh, infection workup was negative. So he was labeled as hemophagocytic uh, lymphohistiocytosis and received dexamethasone and cyclosporine. We kept a provisional diagnosis of NK T-cell lymphoma with HLH. So investigation showed CT chest showing subcentric nodule, MRI showing polypoidal mass in the bilateral maxillary sinus. We sought uh, ENT opinion and it was told to be granulomatous inflammation with infection. Biopsy uh, showed uh, necrotic uh, mass and the infection workup again was negative. So we again uh, was very confident that this is malignancy. So we got PET CT done. Despite giving high dose of steroid, PET CT showed Rajat, increased uptake. So nasal mass biopsy was the, uh, again uh, reviewed, which showed malignant cell, which was positive for CD3, CD45, and CD56. And there was EBV RNA uh, staining also positive. So our final diagnosis okay. was NK T cell lymphoma yeah. with uh, HLH. OK, thank you, Rajat. Uh, any comment? OK, uh, thank you, Rajat. Uh, next would be Dr. Bhavya from Gangaram for her case. A very good afternoon, one and all. Uh, today my presentation is about two small cases. Uh, both are anchor vasculitis, which are secondary to COVID infection and vaccination. And we didn't know what it is like. Actually, is it a causal relationship or a casual relationship? So first one is a 38-year-old male who is a resident of Bihar, no, having no comorbidities, presented with complaints of acute onset breathlessness of four days duration. Uh, it progressed rapidly over a period of four days, and it is associated with hemoptysis. And there is a history of fever one day before the onset of breathlessness. And uh, uh, regarding his brief uh, clinical course, he took one first dose of Covishield two months back 
uh, before this onset of his acute illness. After 10 days of the vaccination, he developed a low-grade fever associated with pain and swelling in both the ankle joints. At that time, he was managed with NSAIDs, but after stopping the NSAIDs, the pain again reappeared with a progression of bilateral shoulder pains and activity restriction. At this point of time, he was worked up with a local physician where his LFT, RFT, uh, RF and CCP were also done, which were negative. And he was uh, labeled as reactive arthritis and he was started on a tapering dose of steroid along with sulfur salicin, for which he responded initially. After this, this acute episode, uh, shortness of breath, he presented to casualty. So on a, a presentation, he has a tachycardia with uh, tachypnea with a uh, SPO2 of 77% of uh, room air and requiring 10 liters of oxygen. On examination was suggestive of diffuse crepitations in the bilateral infrascapular infra areas and restricted movements of bilateral shoulder joints. In view of increased oxygen demand, he was shifted to ICU and uh, NIV was started. Investigation showed low hemoglobin with acu increased acute phase reactants and urine routine showed 3 to 5 RBC even though urine protein creatine ratio was normal. His uh, septic workups are all negative including uh, rapid biofire and uh, COVID antibodies were positive and immunological workup including ANA, NA profile, everything was negative, but C and was positive. So these are his radiolo radiological investigations. The first one is a chest X-ray showing uh, opacities uh, with a uh, relative sparing of the peripheries. Bhavya? And Bhavya, you'll have to, you have another case also? Short case. No, no, just move to that. Uh, so we, everybody can see this, yeah, it's very Signing suggestive of allular hemorrhage. Initially, IVIG was given after the acute stabilization, cyclophosphamide was given. And we can see the comparative x-rays. Okay, just come to the last slide. Last slide. We won't have time for the second one. Okay. And second so, one, uh, second one you, also Bhavya. same thing after yeah. COVID infection. Yeah, we'll, we'll just take uh, one comment from the house, if any. Uh, people have seen even anchor vasculitis after COVID and COVID vaccination. I think people have seen. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bhavya, for that presentation. Next, we have uh, uh, Shri Harsha from Kims. Shri Harsha from Kims for two cases back to back. Shri Harsha, sir. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Shri Harsha. Uh, the case that I'm going to present is uh, calcinosis universalis and cardiomyopathy in a patient with dermatomyositis. It's about a 26-year-old male who presented with erythematous photosensitive scaly rash over the forearms, malar area, and proximal muscle weakness in the lower limbs. Local, ex local examination showed V sign, shawl sign, malar erythema, and symmetric proximal muscle weakness. With a high CK, uh, CPK, EMG was done. It showed myopathic pattern. Muscle biopsy was suggestive of mild perimysium and endomyzial inflammation, and his myositis profile showed strong positivity to ME2. So the diagnosis was dermatomyositis, and the treatment was given with uh, oral steroids and azathioprine. Because of a transient improvement, he discontinued his medication and was lost to follow up. Over the next one year, he had flare-ups of illnesses with myalgias, progressive muscle weakness, and skin rashes. So for this, he received deep tissue massages by a, uh, by a uh, alternative uh, medicine uh, therapist regularly for uh, one year, following which he developed hard swellings over the elbows, chest, lower abdomen, bilateral anterior thighs, suggestive of extensive and deep calcinosis cutis. Here we can see the same. And there was also ulceration of the skin that was exuding chalky crystals. Calcinosis cutis, extensive, uh, was confirmed on the, uh, on the x-rays. And patient came back to us uh, with these symptoms and gradually worsening bi bipedal edema. Investigations showed that there was severe hypoalbinemia with a high CP. I, I think the interest here is uh, uh, the, the father spent two acres of money for the massaging this guy. <laughs> That's it. Today, echo showed cardiomyopathy with moderate LV dysfunction and he was managed with diuretics, AC inhibitors, and beta blockers by the cardiologist. Sri Harsha, what is the follow-up? Can you just go to the follow-up? Any... Yeah, last slide, sir. Last yeah. slide. So he was given uh, low-dose uh, oral steroids, weekly methotrexate, colchicin, retexumab, and IV yeah. pamitronate. Uh, I'll just request patients. everybody, you don't have to read each and every line. Most of the audience can read it. Just uh, give the brief. Say that he was given immunosuppression and no, just show us what's the, did his calcinosis improve? That's what everybody is interested in with pamidronate. Muzzle and weakness has been improving, but calcinosis has did hardly been okay. resistant. Next case, please, from your side.
The next case uh, I'm, be, I'm presenting uh, in, on behalf of my senior and colleague, Dr. Abhita Aliyar. Uh, an illicit scleroderma mimic. 28-year-old uh, uh, male presented with history of uh, recurrent multiple deep-seated abscesses, predominantly subcutaneous, but with occasional extension into the intramuscular pain, plane, involving bilateral gluteal and thigh areas since the last six years. He had a uh, history of uh, undergoing uh, multiple incision and drainage procedures. And he even took uh, ATT for 11 months. But uh, every time, uh, the swellings subside with treatment only just to recur again in a few weeks. The current symptoms were for two weeks. And he had history of progressive restriction of the knee and hip joint movements with hardening and uh, thickening of the soft tissues of the thighs and gluteal areas. So when he presented uh, to us, we could see on the local examination there was hard woody, uh, diffuse woody hard injuration with localized tender areas corresponding to the region of uh, abscesses in the thighs and gluteal areas. And the, thick, uh, the skin was thick and non pinchable with gluteal wasting because of disuse atrophy. There was also noted multiple depressed atrophic scars, healed sinuses, hyperpigmented patches over both the thighs and gluteal regions with his knee and hip joint movements restricted. So because of the uh, localized nature of the uh, abscesses you know, to just the thighs and glute uh, gluteal regions, we thought that some inciting event could have happened. And we also, uh, the scar shapes did not seem to have, have resembled the healed IND uh, scars. So on repeat probing, he admitted to have taken uh, multiple Fortwin uh, injections to the thigh and gluteal regions in the past for the chronic headache. It was given by uh, an OT assistant who, who is his close friend. So ultrasound uh, pelvis showed very small subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous abscesses, which were not uh, sizable. And uh, blood culture showed uh, pan-sensitive uh, acetobacter baumani. So on reviewing the past MRI pelvis, uh, it showed diffuse subcutaneous edema with thickening, T1 uh, hyper uh, intensities, and T2 intermediate uh, signals of bilateral gluteal okay, quadriceps uh, and uh, so the the cutaneous piece. myofibrosis. OK. Uh, any comment? I think many people, senior people, would have seen it, and we saw it in uh, PGI. Many people have yeah. seen it. I think uh, it's a, it, but it's really important because uh, for those who haven't seen it, it's, it can really perplex. Thank you, Shri Harsha. Uh, now we'll have uh, two cases from Dr. Mamta. She's from Jipmer, Puducherry. Good afternoon. Uh, the title is Elephant in the Room, Head or Tail. So this is a 55-year-old male patient who was referred to us as a case of uh, probable IgG4 IgG related disease after receiving high-dose steroids. So his history is uh, three months duration. He, he had lower urinary tract symptoms and back pain. On evaluation, he had bulbar urethral stricture for which urethrotomy was done. Uh, after which, uh, for 15 days, he was doing well. Then he developed uh, low-grade fever, nausea, loss of appetite, significant weight loss of 10 kgs, and pedal edema. Examination showed bilateral pitting pedal edema, and systemic examination was normal. And on fundus, he had right eye uh, non-arteritic AON. Investigation showed uh, uh, he had significantly elevated total count of 40,000 and platelet count of uh, 7 lakh uh, 24,000. RFT, LFT were normal. Uh, Almin was on the lower side and uh, ANA was negative. Uh, his anchor, uh, PR3 anchor was positive and CRP was significantly elevated to 230 and ferritin was significantly elevated and IgG4 levels were normal. His PET CT, uh, PET -CT showed a nodule in the uh, left lower lung and uh, iotitis and with the uh, surrounding mass and lesion in a uh, surrounding the head of pancreas and prostatitis so we screened for him for other large vessel vasculitis his temporal and axillary artery doppler were normal and on repeat imaging for a biopsy uh, it has showed that there was significant decrease in the size of lesions so the DD we considered was GPA uh, because of this significant constitutional symptoms, leukocytosis, thrombocytosis, elevated inflammatory markers, PR3 LS okay, of positivity. Uh, Dr. Mamta, yeah, uh, that's fine. You can come to the final. I think the diagnosis is clear. You've already shown the serolog serological tests. 
So we Can have you come a to the final slide, please. This is the final slide, sir. Yeah. So your diagnosis is final diagnosis is. We GPA. were uh, we were uh, uh, thinking of both GP and IgG4, sir. Okay, but yeah, you had a high PR3 and okay, but you didn't have a biopsy. So yes, sir. Okay, anybody has seen uh, similar cases of ANCA, which yeah, mimics? I, I presented an overlap at the SGPG, and you can have overlaps. Okay. So if there is ANCA positive in IgG4, it portends a vasculatic mm. prognosis. You have to look at them for. Okay, but the treatment, I guess, would cover both yeah, the treatment, yeah. thankfully. Thank you. Please go on to your next case. So this is a joint, tendon or nerve, what to chase. This is a 35-year-old male patient who presented with six months history of polyarthritis involving right ankle, left wrist and multiple proximal interpharyngeal joints. He had a painless uh, firm subcutaneous nodule on extensor aspect of the right arm and he also complained of paresthesia of right foot. So we can see uh, on examination he had this tuck sign uh, over the left wrist and he had a tender joint count of 5 and swollen joint count of 3. Uh, otherwise, his neurological examination was normal and there, uh, because of this paresthesia, we were thinking of uh, leprosy in the initial stages also. But there was no peripheral nerve thickening and there was no sensory loss. Differentials considered uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, turn, uh, RF and NCCP turned out to be negative. Infection related arthritis, uh, punch biopsy from the subcutaneous nodule showed uh, granulomatous lesion and split skin uh, smear was negative. And we also thought of sarcoidosis, HRCT and serum AIDS levels were normal. So patient was being treated symptomatically. Then two months later, he developed uh, multiple hypopigmented hypoastic patches over the dosum of left hand and feet, along with uh, multiple asymmetrical uh, peripheral nerve thick thickening. And repeat skin biopsy showed well-formed epithelioid granulomas and Langhans uh, uh, giant cells. So he was diagnosed as tuberculoid leprosy and he was started on multidrug therapy. So these are my key questions. Okay, uh, so I think, I think that that's also a case many people would be familiar with. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'll uh, request my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Vara Prasad, to please uh, go on from here. Mahabaleshwar. Mahabaleshwar from uh, MMC. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I shall be presenting a case series of multicentric costolysis, nodulosis, and arthropathy from MMC. 13 years male born of consanguineous marriage, presented with progressive deformities of the hand and foot since five years. Initially, it involved small joints. Later, uh, it involved the large joint pains. He later he also noticed uh, there were plantar nodules and a difficulty in walking. He took symptomatic treatment for joint pain. Two years back, he was diagnosed as a case of juvenile idiopathic arthritis (ERA) and treated with demards with little improvement. And uh, these are his, uh, on examination, he had a coarse facial features. There were contractures in the hands uh, and there was swelling of the digits. There were soft to firm nodules in the, in the foot of size 2.5 to 2.5 centimeters each. And uh, x-ray, uh, bilateral x-ray of the hand showed diffuse osteopenia, cortical thinning of the metacarpals. Carpal bones were small with irregular margins consistent with osteolysis. And his Sanger sequencing of the MMP2 gene uh, revealed a homozygous uh, revealed a uh, mutation which was uh, homozygous. Cardiac evaluation was normal. Another similar case, uh, we another 13-year female presented with progressive contractures of uh, hands since three years of age. She was, uh, she wa and later there was family history of similar complaints in the elder siblings since five years of age. Here you can see the progressive contractures and uh, there were nodules and there was osteolysis on the X-ray. Her MMP2 gene uh, mutation revealed in both, the it was positive in both the siblings. Hence, a uh, diagnosis of multicentric osteolysis, nodulosis, and arthropathy was made. It's a skeletal dysplasia uh, with progressive osteolysis, osteoporosis, nodules, and arthropathy. To date, 51 individuals have been identified with uh, this mutation. Bhavani et al. from the Medical Genetics Department of KMC Manipal reported 13 cases. There are reports from NIH and also CMC Velour. There is no specific therapy for this disorder. Bisphosphonates have been tried by two groups, but did not benefit the affected children to a significant extent. Very few data is available on the natural course and life expectancy of Mona, and I acknowledge the genetics department of Manipur. Thank you. Good case. Any questions or comments? Madam. Amita, madam. Mm -hmm. The diagnosis very early is to look at the first toe. 
first, the first yes, toe is always abnormal. So people have said that that can be used as a screening test. Yes. Thank you, madam. Thanks. We can go on to the next presenter. Uh, Tejasvi from Ames, Jodhpur. And the other presenters also, please uh, be seated in the first row, please. Prajakta, Pratik, Amrita. Good afternoon to everyone. I am Dr. Tejashvi, resident of General Medicine from Ames, Jodhpur. Today I am going to present a, one of our interesting case that is pancytopenia in lupus. Uh, our patient is a 32-year female who is a, a diagnosed case of SLA Jogren's overlap with lupus nephritis. She was diagnosed in February 21 and at that time she was also diagnosed to have a heterozygous beta dal based on hemoglobin electrophoresis report. For lupus nephritis, we have given six cycles of uh, uh, induction of cyclophosphamide and uh, we have taken her on azathioprine maintenance. She presented to us with febrile neutropenia with pancytopenia in October 21. At the time of uh, presentation, her examination findings, she is conscious oriented, vitals were stable, having paler, there is no icterus lymphadenopathy, no malar rash, having digital gangrene and systemic examination was normal and there is no organomegaly. At, this is an investigation profile of the patient. Even at the diagnosis of the lupus nephritis, the patient has a hematological manifestation with the autoimmune hemolysis DCT positive and following uh, post cyclophosphamide has hematological parameters has been improved. Later she presented with a history of dengue and uh, febrile illness. At that time she was found to have pancytopenia with a low retic count and LDH was normal. And at that time, uh, the patient doesn't have any infection-related uh, uh, markers or uh, her systemic examination was normal. There is no focus of infection. And the patient also doesn't have any uh, disease-related activity. For the causes of pancytopenia in SLE, a disease-related activity was ruled out where the patient has, has a DS DNA was negative, her C3-C4 was normal. A drug-related cause was uh, thought of and uh, uh, septran and azathioprine was withheld. And uh, infection related, the other viral infections was ruled out. And we have done a uh, bone marrow investigations which uh, revealed a hypocellular marrow with normal cell lines and doesn't have any HLH JSA picture. And uh, after that, uh, uh, in the follow-up, we had a, a bone marrow, bone marrow, all the cultures were also negative and AFB was also negative. But in the follow-up, the bone marrow MTB culture has become positive with MPT antigen detector and she was started on weight-based ATT uh, in October. Following, she had okay. uh, some Final clinical comments. improvement. Final comments. And uh, presently also the patient doesn't have any complete hematological improvement. Uh, either the uh, MDR uh, TB or underlying subclinical HLH and bone marrow fibrosis is considered or it could be a secondary at the component oh. of hemolysis due to beta dal. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> we got it. So, uh, any comments or questions? One question. Was the CT done? CT was done, sir. It was normal without any augmentation. It's normal. Thank you very much. Rajakta. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start with the case. A 45-year-old female resident of Sudan, North Africa, presented to us with ulcers over both lower limbs since four months. It was associated with pain. She was a known case of rheumatoid arthritis since 10 years and was on methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, and intermittent short cases of steroids when a non-flare. Uh, she had no comor comorbidities or any uh, significant past or family history. On general examination, her vitals were stable. She had swan neck deformities. On local examination, we can see she had two ulcers, one over left leg anterior aspect and another over right leg posterior aspect. Uh, we can see uh, it had irregular borders, <coughs> sorry, sloughy base, there was hemorrhagic and purulent exudate and unhealthy granulation tissue. On investigation, she had uh, acute, elevated acute phase reactants. Her wound cultures were sterile. Doppler study ruled out any venous or uh, arterial insufficiency. And biopsy was done, which was suggestive of pyoderma gangrenosum. So uh, for treatment in view of her active disease, uh, we started her with tofacitinib 5 g twice daily. By four weeks, we can see uh, she, uh, there, was, there were signs of healing, like there were new neovascularization and red healthy granulation tissue was seen. By eight weeks, there was an obvious reduction in the size of the ulcer and gradually it led to complete healing of the ulcer. 
Uh, so to discuss, the worldwide incidence of pyoderma gangrenosum is 3 to 10 cases per million people, where half of the patients will have an underlying systemic disease like IBD or uh, rheumatoid arthritis or any other hematological malignancy. Uh, the recent uh, population study in 2021 concluded that RA increases the odds of de developing pyoderma gangrenosum by more than threefold. The treatment for uh, this is, uh, there's no cold standard therapy. The mild cases are usually treated with tropical and uh, intralesional therapy like PRP and steroids. And moderate to severe or worsening cases are treated with systemic therapy like yeah. Dapson calls. Final. Yeah. Okay. okay. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Nice case. Do you have any comments? <coughs> okay. We'll move on to the next case. Pratik from PGI. Good afternoon. So the story of this 44-year-old middle-aged fem middle female starts from 2004. She has some history of inflammatory joint pain, low-grade fever, doesn't get evaluated, and has, has history of cam intake. In 2012, she has history of dyspepsia, upper GI shows Barrett esophagus, and was diagnosed to have a probable esophageal dysmotility. 2014, she again develops inflammatory joint pain, some shortness of breath, ANA, RF, CCP, ANGA was negative, HRCT showed early UIP changes, PFT was showing FVC of 88%, and she was started on methotrexate with low-dose steroids. After that, she was lost to follow. She walks into her OPD last year, 2021, and this time she has history of periorbital puffiness, bilateral pedal edema, and rash over the palms. On examination, she has bilateral pedal edema, active Raynaud's going on in the OPD, RS showing bilateral velcro cackles, and normal neuromuscular examination and deformities in bilateral wrists. These are the hands which showed typical mechanic hands. These were the radiology which she had showed uh, ILD, kind, ILD pattern, uh, UIP type, and uh, on uh, myositis blood tested to be anti-PL12 positive. On surprise to us, her urine examination showed 3 plus protein urea and on 24 hour urine est estimation was around subnephrotic range, 1.4 grams. This, we uh, underwent the kidney biopsy. Uh, the first is the HNE stain which shows minimal inflammation with amorphous deposits. The second is a PAS stain which shows the PAS positive amorphous deposits. Third is a Congo stain which shows apple green, positive apple green birefringence. And the fourth is the IHC for SAA protein. So it was a case of renal amyloidosis with uh, anti-PL12 associated anti-synthetic syndrome. We uh, are just treating this patient with uh, uh, cyclophosphamide. She has two, two doses of cyclophosphamide and uh, her protein urea has partially resolved. It's around 800 mg. So this is a rare presentation of an anti-synthetic syndrome without myositis and uh, uh, a myelodosis has not been reported yet. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you have any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Go on to the next presenter, Amrita from Kims. I'm presenting a case, mimicker of rheumatoid arthritis, striatal hand deformity of Parkinson's. A 70-year-old so male, a diagnosed case of idiopathic Parkinson's. She was on treatment under neurology. She was referred to us because of progressive deformities of both the hands since two years. There was no history of joint pain, swelling, or associated morning stiffness. So this was the image of, uh, this is the image of her hands. There is ulnar deviation of the metacarpophalangeal joints in both the hands, flexion at the MCP and the PIP joints. There was no joint line tenderness or swelling. And as seen in this picture, the deformities were reducible. No foot deformities were noted. So striatal hand deformity of Parkinson's. So these are uh, typically painless fixed contractures of the distal joints seen in 10% of patients with advanced Parkinson's disease. The pathology is located in the neostriatum and unlike the other features like dystonia, these deformities are seen at rest and even in sleep. So the striatal hand consists of flexion at the MCP, extension of PIP, flexion at the DIP and ulnar deviation of the wrist. Striatal foot consists of grade 2 extension and flexion of other toes. These are also known as pseudo rheumatoid deformities. Thank you. Do we have an X ray? I'm sorry, sir. X ray, do we? X ray was done, so I, could, I okay. couldn't get the image. Was it showing anything? Everything was normal. normal. Well presented. Okay. Any comments? 
Sorry, sir. It, no, it's generally bilateral. Uh -huh. They are correctable. Advanced stages, it becomes fixed, but initially they are correctable. Thank you. Next presenter, Gayatri from Jipmer. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the tale of a 18-year-old female whose disease dates back to 15 years. Since three years, she's been having episodic uh, knee pain with swelling, lasting usually seven to 10 days to recur every few months. So for this, she was being uh, treated as juvenile idiopathic arthritis since the year of since she was seven years. There was no accompanying fever or any deformities. In addition, she's been having uh, seizures of changing semiology since the age of 14 years. Now, she currently presented with NSRK for the past three months to us. On looking back, she also uh, uh, noticed uh, developmental uh, delay uh, with uh, walking only after the age of three years with poor scholastic performance. Systemic examination other than PALA was unremarkable. Her uh, baseline investigations revealed uh, normocytic uh, uh, normochromic anemia, deranged RFT, nephrotic range proteinuria. Her CRP was low. We did an MRI uh, since she did not have any joint symptoms, but her uh, main issue was the jo uh, joints, which revealed uh, met, uh, signal changes in the metaphysis. The renal biopsy was suggestive of secondary uh, uh, AA amyloidosis. Bone marrow for the anemia, which we initially attributed to the anemia of chronic disease, was actually suggestive of dysarthropoiesis. So in view of uh, recurrent uh, osteomyelitis, developmental delay and seizures, we considered inborn errors of immunity, whole exome sequencing suggestive of lipin T mutation seen in Majid syndrome. So we are presenting uh, the first case of Majid syndrome uh, with amyloidosis because this has not been uh, so far uh, 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 seen in cases of Majid. And uh, since we couldn't get IL-1 antagonists, we started on baricitinib. Uh, her proteinuria was actually on the improving trend. From a urine PCR of 25, it went down to 12, but uh, her uh, anemia worsened and uh, she succumbed to anemia. So my uh, uh, key questions are, is fever an essential component of all autoimmune uh, system auto-inflammatory syndromes? Thank you, Dr. Gayat. Yeah, please. Sharat. Thank you. Next presenter, uh, Rupali. Dr. Rupali. Okay, we'll move on to the next presenter, Aishwarya. Aishwarya. Good afternoon. The title is, When a Blow to the Belly Blew Up the Bones. So this is a story of a 29-year-old male who was a non-smoker and occasional alcoholic with total duration of illness of two years. He presented uh, elsewhere with a history of episodic inflammatory polyarthritis, which was asymmetrical, involving the knee, ankle, wrist, and elbows. It was non-deforming. Each episode lasted two to three weeks. There were no features suggestive of spondyloarthritis or psoriatic arthritis or psoriasis. He was worked up elsewhere. RF, anti-CCP, HLA, B27 were negative. Serum uric acid was normal. He was treated with NSAIDs, short courses of steroids with temporary relief of symptoms. When he presented to us, he uh, had history of inflammatory polyarthritis for three weeks duration before the presentation. He also had non-inflammatory hip pain of both hips for three weeks. He also gave history of melina for 10 days. On examination, there was epigastric tenderness. Uh, left knee and bilateral ankles were uh, tender and swollen. Hip movements were painful. Bilateral favor was positive. On revisiting the history for the cause of abdominal pain, two years ago, he sustained a blunt trauma to abdomen while playing kabaddi. He had an episode of uh, acute pancreatitis that was conservatively managed, followed by multiple emergency visits for episodic abnormal, uh, abdominal pain, which was also conservatively managed. Uh, 
on investigations, uh, there was a market elevation of serum amylase, which was in thousands, and serum lipase, which was in seven thousands. Repeat CT abdomen uh, in our uh, during the admission revealed pancreatic pseudosis with features of Hemosuccus pancreaticus. So here we can see the image uh, showing the Hemosuccus pancreaticus with pseudosis. X-ray revealed bilateral osteonecrosis of femoral heads. We can see the X-ray and the MRI. So with manifestations of episodic inflammatory polyarthritis, chronic pancreatitis with pseudosis and hemosuccus pancreaticus, and osteonecrosis of bilateral femoral uh, heads, a diagnosis of partial pan pancreatitis, polyarthritis, paniculitis syndrome was considered. We uh, took it as partial because he did not have any skin lesions. So the treatment he received was angioembolization of superior pancreatic or duodenal artery and surgical correction of pancreatic pseudosis. Pancreatic enzyme normalized post-procedure. There were no further episodes of inflammatory arthritis. He also received uh, bilateral uh, total hip replacement for the osteonecrosis. Yeah. So PPP syndrome is a triad of... Uh, Final comment. Final comment. Uh, so the learning point is, uh, despite all technological advances, history taking and clinical examination are irreplaceable skills in rheumatology practice. And they were not always present with complete triad. And co correction of underlying abnormality and multidisciplinary team approach is essential for better outcome of these patients. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nice case. Thank you, sir. Do we have any question or comment? La uh, Dr. Sudesh. Good afternoon. I'm here to present a case with rare association of systemic sclerosis and silicosis. He's a 29 years old male who is a resident in Bhuvaneshwar, uh, occupation farmer. History of working in a quartz mining one year back for two months. Now came with the complaints of progressive skin tightening along with generalized hyperpigmentation for the past four months. Significant weight loss of 13 kgs in past two months. No history of Raynaud's phenomenon, muscle weakness or shortness of breath or uh, GID symptoms. Examination wise, he is having sclerodactyly with no fingertip pitting or uh, any digital ulcers. Skin examination modified rotten score of uh, 46 by 51 and uh, salt and pepper skin appearance. Respiratory examination bilateral course crepitations are present. The rest of the system examination normal. With a differential diagnosis, we kept a systemic, systemic sclerosis with ILD. But the oddities are rapid progression with four months with modified rotten score 46 with no Raynaud's phenomenon. Then we worked up, investigations done, showed hemoglobin of 10.6, total counts at DC and platelets within normal limit. Inflammatory markers are elevated with ESR of 70 and CRP of 4.1 mg per deciliter. RFT, LFT within normal limits and uh, ANA showed 3 plus homogeneous and ANA profile showed SEL 70 strong positive, rest all negative. Chest X-ray showed bilateral reticular nodular opacity so involving bilateral lung fields. HRCT thorax showed bilateral multiple nodular opacities with calcification and mediastinal window showed uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy with uh, peripheral rim calcification suggestive of axial calcification which is silicosis, uh, we see in silicosis. The final diagnosis of diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis with silicosis is done which is termed as Erasmus syndrome. The treatment in, uh, injection cyclophosphamide first dose 750 mg was given last month on 13th and low dose prednisolone at 20 mg per day is started. Patient yet to be followed. So discussion Erasmus syndrome is a rare entity describing the progressive systemic sclerosis following silica exposure with or without silicosis. It was first observed by Bramwell in 1914 but analyzed first by Erasmus is 1957. So that's why the term Erasmus syndrome is coined. It is found in less than 1% of patients with systemic sclerosis. Okay, thank it's you for this. Thank you. Good case. One question or comment, please. Anyone? Yeah. Just one question I had is, uh, is the treatment different from usual scleroderma? You've given 20 milligram steroids in diffuse cutaneous. Uh, and the scleroderma antibodies, are they positive or negative in this? Oh. SCL 70 strongly positive. You've given 20 milligram prednisolone. 20. For which manifestation? Sir, uh, actually the inflammatory markers are elevated. Probably the inflammation is going on. So we thought... Even cyclo, we it, they had given. Yes. Cyclophosphamide, why was it given? Pure skin involvement with no ILD. Usually the first line is methotrexate, but the rapid progression of skin involvement. So we thought we have to give a strong hit. Okay. 
Thank you. Dr. Shivali from SMS Jaipur. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my title is In Vivo LE Cells and Bilateral Recurrent Exudative Pleural Effusion. Is it lupus? Uh, it is a story of 33 year old male who is a resident of Bikan and presented with complaint of dyspnea, which was gradual, progressive, and was of MRC grade third with a significant uh, weight loss of approximately 6 kg in a year. He had a past history of recurrent admission in past three years and underwent pleural fluid aspiration nine times in the past one year and was started on empirical anti-tubercular therapy for one month. On examination, uh, there was dullness of percussion note in infrascapular and infraxillary no, uh, space on both the sides and decreased uh, air entry. And uh, he was investigated. He underwent pleuro, uh, diagnostic pleurosynthesis, which was suggestive of exudative picture uh, and negative for sterile, uh, sterile for bacteria, fungus, and tubercular bacilli. Gene expert for TB was negative. The cytology suggestive of uh, mild inflammatory infiltrate comprising of macrophages without display malignancy, granuloma, and parasites. And the MGG stain cytosine preparation suggestive of uh, presence of LE cells. The peripheral smear suggestive of uh, evidence of hemolysis uh, with po uh, warm, uh, positive warm antibodies in 1 is to 2048 dilution. Autoantibody profiles were negative like ANA by FA, ACP, and DSDNA, and the complements level were normal. Echo suggestive of mean pulmonary arterial pressure of 23 mmHg, rest was normal. So uh, we kept the diagnos differential diagnosis like malignancy, RA, lupus, and infection, and the presence of LE cells in pleural fluid with negative workup for malignancy malignancy and chronic infection led to the diagnosis of lupus and prompted initiation of tra treatment. We started the patient on oral prednisolone uh, in the dosage of 30 mg per uh, OD for a month and at the 30th day a he showed a significant improvement in the symptom and infusion. So uh, the lupus pleuritis is the most common, although the most common presentation manifestation of SLE in chest, but initial presentation is only in 25 to 3% of the patient, and it is uh, typically exudate, and it can be unilateral or bilateral, uh, and the prognosis is very good, so it responds favorably with oral corticosteroids, or uh, other immunosuppressive agents like azathioprine may be used. Okay, okay Shivali, thank you. Thanks. Do you have any question or comment? Okay, okay so uh, we'll wrap up the session here. And I think we had very exciting cases. Uh, just to summarize, we had two genetic cases here presenting. One was Majid syndrome, one was Mona. And we had two cases of uh, myeloidosis as well. Again, one, both were unusual, one with Majid syndrome and one with uh, PL12 antisynthetase syndrome. Uh, from Kim's, we had a case of uh, fluorosis, which mimics spondarthritis, and uh, a pentazosine, a common uh, mimic of systemic sclerosis. We had some cases post-COVID uh, immunological phenomena, which I'm sure many of us have seen, uh, of ANCA as well as aortitis. Then we had a case of uh, uh, using tofacitinib for pyoderma gangrenosum. We had cases, uh, uh, a case of Erasmus syndrome, just presented from Jipmer, and uh, we had a case from SGPJ by Rajat of a mimic of GPA, which was NKT cell lymphoma. Uh, initially, we also had a case of nodular sarcoid, again, a very unusual, uh, proven histologically. And finally, a uh, few other cases, I think the striatal deformities of Parkinson's, which mimic rheumatoid arthritis. So I think it's, it's a bit difficult to uh, choose, uh, I just, uh, I don't know whether we should do this by an audience vote, but uh, because it's very difficult to choose a... Uh,
Thank you, Dr. Varun and uh, Prasad. You saved a lot of time. Great. So now, are you all ready for the quiz? Yes? You haven't got? Oh, have you all got the access? No? So you have to find out the reason. Because we created the Google Forms, we sent you the link. If it's not working, you should tell us. Because once you ask for access, it will be, you know, they give the access. Uh, not for faculty. <laughs> you have to join again. <laughs> so how many people haven't got the, just uh, raise your hands. One, two. Uh, yep, yes. <laughs> So you have to ask your colleagues why they haven't got it. Um, Dr. Abhishek and Dr. Ruchika, um, you know, they, they are uh, in charge of the quiz. Maybe you can uh, just quickly WhatsApp. Have you, have you ready? Yeah. Okay, so uh, again, as I said, it's very difficult. And all the cases were so unique, and I don't think, uh, I think uh, uh, we felt that uh, for a common case, which many of us will see, but are not uh, so aware of, uh, we'll give the prize to the PPP syndrome. So, uh, congratulations. Uh, Ashwarya from uh, Jip Jipmer. Congratulations, Dr. Aishwarya. Congrats to Dr. Varun Deer and uh, Dr. Varapasad for finishing it on time. Dr. Aishwarya, Dr. He, can, he will thank the server and pay. <clears throat> sir, Sharad, sir, before that, a small uh, announcement. See, when we first asked for uh, uh, case abstracts, for initially almost for uh, 12 days, I think we have got only three abstracts. So we were just tensed up, and at that time uh, we have geared up our uh, PGs. So uh, Amrita and uh, Ramya and Sriharsha, uh, three of them have uh, almost sent nearly 40 plus abstracts. Amrita and Ramya and Sriharsha, only these three have contributed nearly 44, uh, 42 abstracts together. Uh, you deserve a round of applause. But but very strange thing is they have submitted 40 abstracts, 40 plus abstracts, but uh, they haven't received a single prize. So so but 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 they, they should receive a big round of applause. Yeah. And and they have been continuously presenting the cases and at the same time they are also doing the organizational work. So great. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ramya, Amrita, and uh, Dr. Siharsha. You have done a wonderful job. Um, now we are waiting for the quiz session to start. Are you ready? Yeah. Navin, can you make it all the questions? On it? Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah, the answering sheets. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, while we're waiting uh, uh, for the quiz to start, now I request Dr. Kirti Talari. Um, she is the boss for the, <laughs> sorry. So she has taken care of the uh, posture session. 
And thanks for doing that wonderful job because uh, there are too many posters uh, have been submitted. Um, so now uh, Dr. Keerthi is announcing the winners. Each session, uh, each topic, uh, they'll get uh, uh, 5,000 uh, cash prize. For the rapid fire, though it is a small three minutes presentation, but equally we have given 20,000 uh, cash prize. Good afternoon. Um, so according to the number of uh, posters that we've received, we've clubbed certain categories and uh, I'll be announcing the uh, winners for each category. So first it is uh, rheumatoid arthritis, spondyloarthritis and crystal arthropathies. It is Dr. Pratik Dio uh, from PGIMER for his uh, poster on elderly male with long-standing spondyloarthritis with fever and joint pains. I request Dr. Amita ma'am to hand over the surgery. For, uh, for the section on uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, it is Dr. Gayatri from JIPMA. Look, look before you hit hard. For the section. For the section on myositis, COVID and pediatric rheumatology, it's Dr. Deepti Challa. She's in UK, she works in the, we watch the hospital. <laughs> yeah. She works in an NH, in a NHS trust hospital. She did fellowship from Nations, then moved to UK. She did her, again, master's in the section on vasculitis there are two winners dr pratik dio from pgi once again uh, for a difficult to manage case of small vessel vasculitis with sclerosing mesenteritis. And uh, the next uh, is Dr. Chirag, again from PGI, uh, for atypical optic neuritis and unusual neurologic presentation of vasculitis. In the miscellaneous category, again, we have uh, two winners, uh, Dr. Sahana Balika from uh, PD Hinduja for her uh, poster on a case of proximal muscle weakness, and Dr. Anna Sidas uh, from JIPMA for a uh, poster on uh, red skin rashes and renal disease. Congratulations all the winners and all the posters were very good. Thank you. So Dr. Richika is trying to fix the problem. Uh, if it's not working, what they can, they can write on the white paper, we have everything ready. You, you go no, that's fine. I think because, we, no, we, we'll do it, we'll do it. Yeah, I think they, otherwise they run away to the airport if we delay it. So, no, they do it manually. So Dr. Ruchika and Dr. Abhishek uh, 
the, the quiz masters for uh, today's quiz session. Uh, it's going to start in a minute. Uh, we have uh, 30 slides, five, 50, 30 seconds each. You have to finish it in uh, 15 minutes. Yes. You finish first. You finish first. You finish first. Done. This is done, man. I just wanted to thank everybody and uh, with, uh, because I have to leave. So it's been a great exercise for me for the last three months to go through these abstracts. I must say that we have really a plethora of a sea of cases. If we all collate, we can one, make good publications of these case series. And second, you can even write case reports, which are learning exercise for all of us. We learned, but here we have less number of people. So if you publish, you will be able to put it to more people. And the third, that all students must ask questions. If we are not asking questions, the purpose of this meeting is partly defeated. Because you got so many prizes, somebody was telling me that the, there are more number of prizes given to students than the number of questions asked by students. <laughs> so next time, we want that the students should ask more and more questions. And I would request Dr. Shara that the next time the students will be sitting in the front seats and the faculty will be sitting in the last seats. Then probably they will ask questions. Thanks for all your participation and great quiz. Enjoy your quiz. Thank you, Madam. Madam, as you know, she is a scientific chair. She steered the um, you know, conference uh, so well. That is the reason we are enjoying this academic feast because of uh, Professor Amita Agarwal. Thank you very much, madam. Safe journey. I think maybe you can, because the seats are empty, you can move forward to the front seats, all the uh, post carriers, or if you are comfortable, leave it. Well, uh, the quiz program is getting ready. Maybe I can ask the seniors and also the youngest batch can share their thoughts and uh, how to improvise further. So you want to share a few things uh, with all the young doctors? So Professor uh, Danda, sir, he wants to address the youngsters. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohli, for arranging this for the second time. And this is actually very unique to have a clinical case uh, conference, something like CCR in Florida. Probably it's a very good uh, initiative. So I have a few comments to say. Um, although, the, as somebody said, and I also agree, that uh, yeah. since interesting cases sometimes tends to be rare cases, so a lot of it is rare cases presented. So sometimes the trainees remember the rare things first. If you ask in the exam the cause of DIP arthritis, people will first say multicentric reticular osteocytosis, which you might not have seen also. So the same thing I would like to say when you go back from here, they're interesting, they're good, they're learning cases, but they're not the, they're not often the common cases. So that's to be kept. So in any clinical diagnosis, always think of common presentation of common diseases, then rare presentation of common diseases, then common presentation of rare diseases, then rare presentation of rare disease in that order. If we don't, if we don't remember this, we are, we'll be tempted to get attracted to these things and that is not, a, in real life too, the common things are only, real life exam is probably more important than the DM or DNB exam. So that is one thing I would like to say. Other thing I would like to say is uh, to all of you is that we have to learn, this is, um, I have been trying when I was, uh, leading IRA as well as uh, on other occasions, that we should know how to interpret published literature. Otherwise, we'll jump from one to other. Somebody says something, it might have come in Lancet, it might have come in Anigem. It doesn't mean the, mean the uh, in real life that is important. So you have to do a critical appraisal of, 
and critical appraisal is the way to know what is realistic and what is practical and what is true evidence. You might do a RCT with 20 cases and get some result. You might do an RCT with 5,000 cases and you might get a result. They will not be the same. So what I'm trying to say that it's very important to learn critically. Otherwise, you will say, okay, you know, somebody said today, Me Too antibody has better steroid response. Me Too antibody, also someone can say, has got no malignancy, all those things. You know, when we were MD students, there used to be one book of infectious disease called Manson's Infectious Disease Book. In that, there was a chapter on typhoid, and in that it was written there that small dose of steroids gives better outcome in typhoid. Actually, in real life, many more people died by practicing this. When you read the chapter, you see the cross-reference. There are two cases from Vietnam and three cases from Myanmar based on that the author wrote. So what the people write sometimes, the big authors, it involves a lot of personal biases and personal influences, personal thinking. You might get five cases doing well with steroids, the next 50 cases will die. So that is where you have to learn how to critically apprise evidence. So if you see whether Me Too is a more steroid responsive, it may be based on just 10 cases. It may not be more than that. You cross-reference. So make the habit of looking at the cross-reference. And that way I feel the current opinion in rheumatology is a very good way. You have cross-references on the recent things. So that is another thing I wanted to say. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Chika, it's all yours now. Dr. Abhishek, we'll start the quiz. Hi, good afternoon. So actually, we were given the task of making the quiz questions and organizing the quiz, but uh, we didn't know that along with the subject, you're supposed to know the technology very well. And we miserably failed in that, I must admit. However, it's a very rewarding session for the PGs. If I, if I was given a chance, I would have liked to participate in that. So uh, we'll move on to the quiz. Uh, unfortunately, you will have to mark the answers on the, uh, on the paper using your pen. And uh, the evaluation will be based on uh, the marking scheme which we have given. And um, it's just that you will have to swap your uh, question papers. And we believe in your integrity. So you will have to mark your friends and colleagues and then whosoever gets the highest marks would be the winner. So this quiz actually has been uh, divided into uh, sections. So we'll have, uh, it's just to, you know, to keep you awake. So we'll start with the quiz straight away. Please write your full name. Don't write, don't write your friend's name. And the first winner will get a cash prize of 25,000. Second winner, 10,000. The third winner, second 15, third is 10,000. So after finishing, you know, answering the papers, we, we will swap it for a cor corrections. Okay, thank you. And so the quiz masters, how much will they get? Nothing. <laughs> yes. Moment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, shall we start with the quiz? There are no negative markings, so please attempt all the questions. Uh, I'll just hand over to Abhishek. While I'll read the quiz, he will be the uh, person who will be keeping a track of the time. So let's move on to the section first, which is called, we have called it as a bit of GK. It is basically general knowledge or junk knowledge or whatever you call. So. No, no, it's not rapid, just hold on. As I told you, we are techno technologically highly behind this thing. All right, so he'll keep the timer that way. So moving on to the first question. Uh, this is a story of Bubble Boy. I mean, it's called as Bubble Boy and NASA story. It is linked to which disorder? Jo a, Job syndrome. B, Skid. C, Vishkos Aldit syndrome. D, Data to deficiency. Question number two, the cortisone, all of the following received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering the hormone cortisone in 1950 except 
Niels Jorn, Kendall, Richardson, Hench. Okay, you can read this. You can read this sequence. So this sequence is referred to by a specific term in English dictionary. So which of the genome editing techniques is in, in immunology uses this term? A fish, B CRISPR Cas9, C talon, D zinc finger nucleases, which is popularly known as Zen, ZFN. All right, so we move on to the second section, which is uh, follow the shadows. Basically, it is dealing with the imaging. So this is a case of 34-year-old male presented with pain and restriction of movement involving the left shoulder joint with a reduced sensation in hand. The duration was for one year. His x-ray of the joint is depicted here. What is the most likely investigation to fetch the underlying cause? Rheumatoid factor? CPPD calcium and phosphate levels in the blood, MRI cervical spine, nerve biopsy. Question number five. Identify the pathology. Severe back, this male presented with severe back pain and body pain uh, since three months. What is the most likely differential? A. Pagets. B, spondylarthritis, C, leukemia, sorry for the spelling mistake, D, osteomalacia. Question number six. 52-year-old gentleman with knee joint pain and leg pain. What is the most likely diagnosis? You can see the, uh, the clinical photograph as well as the radiology. A, osteomalacia, B, Paget's disease, C, wishman netter schulz syndrome, and D, congenital syphilis. These are very easy questions, so it is a rapid fire. Okay, so this is back to your yesterday's presentation. 65-year-old female presented with severe back pain. What is the most likely diagnosis for this patient? A, spondylarthritis, B, infective discitis, C, multiple myeloma, D, crystal arthropathy. How many of you were awake yesterday? All right, so moving on to next section, which is called as reading between lines. You will be given 40 seconds for these questions. So question number eight. This is a story of 38, uh, this is an MRI of 32-year-old male who was admitted with inflammatory type backache with tenderness at ASIS and PSIS region, and he also had heel pain. The evaluation revealed, you can read through that. His MRI is shown below, uh, which includes the T1, the T2, the T2 star images. So an ENT consultation actually clinched the diagnosis for this patient. What is the most probable diagnosis? A, multiple myeloma, B, oncogenic osteomalacia, C, spondylarthropathy, D, SED. You are quite audible. Question number nine. 14-year-old boy presented bearing a diagnosis of childhood psoriasis. He had history of high-grade fever, cough, respiratory distress, with negative SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR. He required hospitalization seven months ago. Ten, ten days after the admission, he developed the following lesions. What is the most probable pathway underlying this condition? IL-2317 axis, alternate complement pathway, type 1 interferon signaling, or mTOR signaling. Question 10, a 42-year-old male with progressive difficulty in walking since 1.5 years. He is known diabetic since 10 years with poorly controlled diabetic diabetes. On evaluation, he was detected to have a proximal muscle weakness of lower limb with CPK, which elevated CPK. He was treated with bethotrexate, steroids, to fascinate with suboptimal response. Based on the MRI of these thigh, his thigh is what's the most likely diagnosis.
Next. 20-year-old lady presented with progressive exertional dyspnea and cough for two years. The investigations for dyspnea revealed restrictive lung disease. She had nephrolithiasis. Her father had incidentally detected neuroendocrine tumor and emphysema. The blood investigation revealed rheumatoid factor, negative rheumatoid factor, MT, MPO, ANAs, ESR and CRP was normal. The chest X-ray is shown, a chest CT is shown below. So what is the most likely disorder in this patient? A 52-year-old male referred to rheumatology with a history of acute obstructive uropathy and admitted to urology department for bilateral uretric stent placement. On further probing, he had three months history of anorexia, generalized weakness, weight loss of more than 10 kg, and yellowish papillary lesions. CECT abdomen revealed retroperitoneal fibrosis with surrounding a small ball, cecum, lower abdomen, pelvic vasculature. This is the skeletal survey. Can you, what do you think is the biopsy of peritoneum likely to yield? You just have to be awake during the session. Next. All right, so this is a relatively easier session. You just have to keep your eyes open. Identify this condition. Scleroderma A, B, scleroderma, C, scleromyxedema, D, eosinophilic fasciitis. This is a intra-op finding of a 63-year-old male undergoing knee replacement. What is the most likely diagnosis? Question 15. So this is basically a 28-year-old 20 year female presenting with fever of three months with dyspnea on exertion. What does the fundus picture indicate? First benches, you're not PGs. Question 16. A 17 year old male presented with rashes and photosensitivity over the face, face since two years. Based on the clinical picture shown here, what is the most likely diagnosis? A. Euler Danlos, B. Lupus, C. Acne rosacea, D. Dermatomyositis. So this is question number 17. This is a patient, this is basically the histopathology of a patient with, who presented with muscle weakness developing over two weeks. The histopathological picture of muscle biopsy is suggestive of polymyositis, necrotizing myopathy, vacuola myopathy, or mitochondrial myopathy. All right, so these are just very direct questions which just test your memory, nothing else. No analytical questions here. So in sandwich ELISA technique, this is question 18. In order to stop the reaction between the enzyme and substrate, what process is needed? You have to incubate the sample for, at 100 degrees, add a strong acid to the sample, wash the sample with PBS tween, or add blocking solution to the sample. What, question number 90, what is the gene responsible for heritable osteonecrosis of hips?
Moving on to question 20. The Q fracture component, so uh, in the Q fracture component, which of the following is not a component of this risk assessment tool? Bone marrow density, history of falls, use of hormone replacement therapy, or chronic liver disease? Okay, so this is the last section, which is, what is new? This is new. This is still old, actually. All right, so question 21. Velobelumab, what is it? Is it a direct C5 complement 5A receptor inhibitor, which is used as a replacement of steroids and anchor vasculitis? Is it a direct C5A inhibitor used as a replacement of steroids and vasculitis? C, new interferon alpha inhibitor for treatment of refractory lupus nephritis. D, it's a new approved drug for management of extra renal lupus without steroids. Question 22. What, is the t what are the typical characteristics of cytokine storm in COVID-19 pneumonia? So all of them are the characteristics except for one. So you got to point out that. A, the magnitude of hyperferritinemia is lower than macrophage activation syndrome in autoimmune diseases. It is associated with pulmonary immunothrombosis. It is dominated by lung-centric macrophages or there is overwhelming elevation of concentrations of interleukin-6. Cytokine storm and COVID. Okay, next. So this is actually an electron microscopy image of podocyte in renal biopsy. What is your diagnosis? A, IgA nephritis, B, HCQ-induced nephropathy, C, C3 glomerular nephritis, D, idiopathic membranous nephropathy. Question 24, which one of it is not true regarding cutaneous T-cell lymphoma presenting as lupus profundus lesions? A, it is less likely to involve face. The gamma delta TCR type often warrants aggressive therapy, uh, chemotherapy. Alpha beta TCR type should be managed with aggressive chemotherapy. It's often a delayed diagnosis. The three questions are given Four marks each. So please choose, an, choose the appropriate answer. The phase three trial in lupus nephritis, which is a RORA1 trial, included the following interventions versus the control group. Is it voclosporin plus steroids versus placebo plus steroids? Voclosporin plus cyclos, uh, cyclophosphamide plus steroids versus placebo and cyclophosphamide? Voclosporin plus MMF versus placebo plus MMF or Voclosporin plus MMF and steroids along with placebo plus MMF and steroids. All right, so that concludes the quiz. Go to the next slide. Wasn't it very easy? Dr. Abhishek is like, the PGs will feel that we don't know anything. All the first benches actually may not. No. <laughs> can we exchange? All right, please stop writing and uh, can you please just exchange your, swap your answers. And while we take you through the answers, uh, you can evaluate your colleagues. I hope all of you have written your name and the center where you belong to, which you belong to. Because it was easy, so we had to be fast. Have we swapped? Yeah. Just need to wait that oh, after you have evaluated the questions, the evaluator, please write your name there. So, Dr. John, your answer should have somebody else's name down. Signature down, not the name. Is 
So have you all written your names first before answering? Yeah. Otherwise, it will the prize will go to someone else. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you all ready? Then we'll fire away the answers. Yep. So this case received a lot of media headlines in 1971. The bubble boy David. Sorry, David Better. Uh, so he was kept in a containment for nearly till 11 years. Then uh, he died of skid. Uh, actually, not died of skid, but uh, post HSCT, he developed a lymphoma and died. So the answer was skid. Answer number B. Answer so B. whatever marked in red will be the correct answer. So you can follow on the board also. Yeah. So cortisone discovery. So all of them were correct. B, C, D were the one who were involved in this uh, in 1950 except Mr. Niels Jain. Uh, but can you tell uh, what did he contribute, anyone? He also received a Nobel Prize in 1984. Uh, he was involved in monoclonal antibodies. He was the one who uh, led to the discovery of monoclonal antibodies. So this is, uh, as a tongue twister as it is, it's nothing but uh, palindrome. palindrome. So you all know the answer. I think this one, most of would have got it right, right? And uh, this case, uh, where a patient presenting, with, sorry, question four, patient presenting with a deforming arthritis of the left shoulder joint in a relatively young male patient with extensive calcification. So it's nothing but a neuropathic Charcot arthropathy, and most common cause you will find is uh, syrinx. So that's what's seen in the MRI of this patient. So the answer is uh, C, MRI cervical spine. So in this question uh, where we can question see, five. question five, uh, where answer we, is C. answer is C because it's a very dirty looking marrow everywhere. So it's uh, various hypo and hyper intensities typical of an infiltrative dis disorder. So again, this patient had leukemia. So the patient had leukemia. So this is a 52-year gentleman. As you can see, that there is a osteopetrotic. Uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, the uh, sorry. Okay. Moth eaten appearance. Mo appearance with a, a sheet of uh, uh, osteosclerosis as well as uh, you know osteopenia. So this is a very typical of Paget's disease. So answer, question number six, the answer is B, Paget's disease. And uh, this is a DEX scan. Uh, so a 65 year male, what you can see in the red uh, uh, and coloration everywhere is nothing but typical of a gout. So it's a crystal anthropathy. Answer is D, crystal arthropathy. And uh, this question eight, question eight a patient presented uh, with a pain over the pelvic region. And uh, we also gave a clue uh, with the low phosphate levels in the question. And uh, most of these patients have uh, head and neck benign tumors. So oncogenic osteomalacia, uh, it was a nasopharyngeal tumor. So it was a mesenchymal tumor, basically, of nasopharynx. Next is uh, 14. Question nine. Question nine. A 14-year uh, boy presenting with, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, something called uh, COVID tail, uh, COVID so this is basically COVID toe. COVID toe. COVID Predominantly in pediatric. So that is why. So this is basically a COVID talk, but it is highly controversial talk, and people are feeling that COVID toes may not actually be a COVID toe, it may be just a pair of children. So it's a controversial topic, but it is uh, quite a lot. And I think we have some case report or something from India as well. Uh, this is again a patient who presented question with uh, 10. question number 10. A patient presented with uh, very poorly controlled diabetes and uh, he was treated for proximal muscle weakness based on the MRI uh, with uh, uh, 
uh, immunosuppressives. There was no response actually worsened despite giving steroids. And what you can see is uh, a typical walled, uh, 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 you know, uh, in, uh, hyper intensities in a single group on a uh, fluid sensitive sequences, and uh, which is typical of muscle necrosis. There is no abscess here to call it as a pyonecrosis. It is bilateral. Uh, it can be unilateral and bilateral both. So answer is B, diabetic muscle necrosis. All the faculties, if they reply, they get a negative mark. And senior faculties get minus two. All right. So question 11, this is basically COPA syndrome. Anybody knows what is a COPA syndrome? It is basically a type 1 interferopathy. So the answer for question 11 is D. So what, can you see? What happens in COPA syndrome? I was told that I'm supposed to give a good learning experience for the PGs. So basically, COPA syndrome, it is uh, hyperactivation of type 1 interferon. And that is because there is something called a sting, which you all may be knowing. So it's a st stimulator of type 1, inter uh, sorry, interferon gamma signaling, uh, interferon gene signaling. So this sting basically has to translocate from endoplasmic reticulum to Golgi complexes. And from there, it is shed in as a vesicle. And then after that, it actually uh, leads to transcription and tra uh, of type 1 interferon. So where there is a molecule called as COPA, C-O-P-A. So basically, that is a coaptamer protein. And it ideally prevents the back translocation of the sting from the end, uh, Golgi apparatus to endoplasmic reticulum. Sorry, it, yeah. So ideally, if you have this sting going from endoplasmic reticulum to Golgi apparatus, it is, it will stimulate type 1 interferon. So body has a mechanism to prevent, to shuttle this uh, sting back from Golgi apparatus to endoplasmic reticulum. And when this doesn't happen, the sting will remain in Golgi apparatus and will cause downstream signaling. So when this coaptamer protein is deficient, this reshuttling of sting from Golgi apparatus to endoplasmic reticulum is prevented. Dr. Varun, it's correct, no? Okay. Yeah, you can understand how much of hard work we had to do to make the quiz a little more interesting. Yeah, actually, yes. So basically, this was adult COPA. So in adult COPA, what happens is, the, the generally, when it's, it's in a pediatric age group, so when you have a pediatric age group, uh, COPA syndrome, generally they present with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage with a family and skin lesions, carcinomas, skin cancers. Along with that, they will have this interstitial disease-like presentation. But when you have an adult COPA, they may not present with interstitial, uh, this diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, arthritis and all. And they may have a little subtle manifestation. So this case, actually, if anybody wants to read, I, have, I had referenced it. What happened to them? All right, so this is a case which is there and I'll, I'll send you the reference. So these references are, uh, I mean, this is a case which has been taken from one of the journals. So this is a case of an adult, 20 year old female who presented with these things and later on they found out that the, the, the index case's father was actually asymptomatic and on evaluation was found to have follicular bronchiolitis cystic lung lesions, along with a neuroendocrine tumor. And then further on, the patient's sibling at six was found to have a, a much more severe variety of COPA. And the patient's um, son or daughter, I don't remember, they were diagnosed to have COPA syndrome at one year of age, which was a very severe presentation. So this was a particular case. So COPA in adults, it's a little more subtle. And uh, I mean, a high index of suspicion is required. So what is this, except for SGPGI, uh, who presented the SGPGI group? IgG4 disease, is it IgG4 disease? This is Ardem Chester disease. 
uh, wherein the patients presented with retroperitoneal fibrosis. They had lymphoma-like presentation, but when you do the X-ray, you find diffuse osteosclerosis of the diaphysis as well as metaphysical region and sparing the epiphysis. And what do you get? Basically, what you get is fibrohistocytic cells with amphiphilic foamy cytoplasm. So they are kind of histocytes. All right. And another cell which is very pathognomonic of it is totem giant cells. All right. So the answer for question 12 is C. And uh, this patient presented, and again, she was a Bengali was treated with uh, uh, you know, as a scleroderma outside. Uh, but obviously, these waxy plaques, no Reynolds phenomena, and this is a typical of a scleromyxedema. She had an underlying monoclonal uh, disorder also. What is this back hole? called as I think par or thar uh, shar thai sign basically it's a fish with that kind of uh, scaly bo uh, skin uh, this one was relatively easy I think you can see that uh, this is ochronosis. Ochronosis. replacement had black pigmentation question number 14 ochronosis question number 14 answer is B this one we can't miss, uh, and a fundus should reveal this diagnosis. Uh, breathlessness, prolonged fever. This is nothing but rot spots. So whenever you see a rot spot, the first diagnosis you should always think of is infective endocarditis. Some other causes where rot spots can be found? Leukemias. So those two things we cannot miss with rot spots. So question 15, answer is A. And uh, this patient again uh, presented with uh, uh, erythema and uh, itching sensation, nothing else, no other symptoms was there. A young 17 year male patient. And uh, you can see his ear lobule, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if it's not, but uh, you can see it's sagging, his skin is uh, full of uh, saggy appearance. He had a mild itching, no other symptoms. And what is this? It's not very clear, but you get no, these kind clear. of things. I, I remember Dr. Danda having, Danda had actually taught, showed us this. So these are papyraceous uh, scars. Scar. Yeah, okay. Again, it's, he was again uh, treated uh, outside with uh, as SLE because there was some mild inflammation on the biopsy. But uh, he had that uh, joint hypermobility. I did not put the picture here because it was made it obvious. But <laughs> Sometimes, sir. And uh, this, was, this patient, uh, sir, would remember also, I sent him, uh, muscle weakness developing over two weeks. This was a male patient, and it's very characteristic on histopathology. What you can see is vacuoles. So this is a vacuolar myopathy. The underlying context is that he was a gout patient uh, who was with a CKD who was treated with uh, uh, loading doses of colchicine back when I was a resident. And uh, the biopsy gave the picture. It's a colchicine-induced myopathy. Question 17, answer is C. And uh, this, I think, most of you would have got it correctly. Uh, ELISA technique, you should be uh, thorough with all the steps. Uh, you, you know, you uh, whenever you put, uh, ELISA, you know, uh, you know, put any antibody into the well, you first need to block so that you you don't uh, have the uh, uh, antigens absorbing onto the unblocked area. So blocking is not done. Uh, blocking for blocking, you used. Uh, blocking solution. Then you uh, wash away the un unbound uh, elements uh, through PBS stain. Uh, actually, to stop the reaction between enzyme and substrate, you use a sulfuric acid or another strong acid. So this is the step. Uh, this is uh, just a question. Uh, I mean, the answer is collagen 2A1. Question 19 answer is A. I, 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 there's nothing to explain here. Q fracture component. Uh, uh, this is question 20. Question 20, Q fracture. So Q fracture is a purely clinical tool. Uh, you can get it online. It's for those patients where DEXA is not available for you. So it does not use DEXA. So it does not use bone marrow density. So it uses all the clinical fractures which are not covered in your uh, uh, routine DEXA scan. Question 21, it is uh, basically Willow Bell in mom. It is uh, a C5A inhibitor. So what is a C5A receptor inhibitor? Avacopan. 
So now this uh, Vilupeli map is actually, there is a uh, phase two trial has already been done and it was presented in the last week Franca Vasculitis conference. So uh, it, is, uh, it is supposedly uh, another alternative to avocapan. So, and it is used as a replacement of steroids in anca vasculitis. So, just like avocapan, but it is not a receptor blocker, it is a C5A inhibitor, and the trial program is known as exchange. E uh, 9 in uh, Roman and then change, exchange. So, what is this? What is the answer for this? Actually, when I put this answer, Abhishek said that everybody will know this. He said that everybody knows this. At least I know it very well. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know it, so I put it. So actually, there was a series of lectures on this in uh, current vasculitis conference. So the characteristic of cytokine storm in COVID-19 pneumonia is uh, they will not have that much of hyperferritinemia, what you get in macrophage activation syndrome. Then it is a very, it's an organ-specific finding. So that is why you will get this pulmonary immunothrombosis the macrophages will be activated, but the difference between macrophage activation syndrome classical and this is the macrophage in particular organs will be hyperactive. And, but, and generally when you see, you see that the concentration of IL-6 is not that high as what you see in macrophage activation syndrome. And that is why a part of them do not respond to tosils. <laughs> No, no, it, it is it is me, but he said it is very easy. So I was like, okay, I am outdated. <laughs> so question number 22, answer is D. So oh, this is a tough one, I felt. Electron microscope. This is electron microscopic finding, and these bodies are known as zebra bodies. These, can you just point? zebra bodies and it is, uh, is, it is basically HC, HCQ induced phospholipids leading on to HC nephropathy or podocytopathy. All right, this everybody should know because we had a very detailed discussion yesterday. Alpha, beta, TCR type may be managed with less aggressive therapy including cyclosporine, high dose methotrexate and so on and may not reply, uh, require CHOP. So question 24, answer is C. Into the last one. Sorry. What happened to it? So, no. Aurora trial, I think all PGs must have presented n number of times. So it is basically voclosporin, MMF, and steroids against MMF plus steroids. So use of voclosporin as an add-on agent to the standard of care in lupus. This is question 25. So that's it. I think all of them have marked. So you have the questions already? So what is this uh, going to come to you? Please hand over uh, No, no, please tally the marks. Tally the marks and put them down. All questions carry one mark each. All questions, one mark each. So, okay, uh, oh, they are collected, all right. So, please tally and ca uh, total the marks. Only after scoring your sheets, give it to the volunteers, please. While the scoring is, uh, and uh, while we are waiting for the scoring, I will start uh, giving the uh, trying to give the close closing remarks to save everybody's time here. Is that okay, Dr. Shika? Yeah, yeah.
I thank you all the faculty and delegates to make, you know, you're all making this conference so successful. Without your uh, active participation, it wouldn't have been uh, possible. So special thanks to all the, the moderators, panelists, and uh, the repetitors, and uh, all the uh, PGs who have sent their abstracts and other delegates. And I also thank our uh, MD, Dr. Bhaskar Rao, and CEO, Dr. Abhinay Bulineni, and uh, all, all the IRA, especially uh, Professor uh, Aman Shama and uh, Dr. Dharmanand, our president. And uh, special thanks to Professor Amita. She has been so cooperative all this, uh, all this time uh, to make it so successful. And uh, uh, Dr. Raj Kiran, um, he is my younger brother as a joint secretary for the conference. And my residents, Dr. Amrita, Harsha, Ramya, Pranavi, our consultants are Jugal Kishore, Datta Kumar, Dr. Shilpa, and uh, Dr. B. Srinivas Rao. Uh, he is our uh, research department uh, uh, scientist and editor who has been uh, helping me. You know, he helped a lot uh, to bring up this uh, souvenir to you. And my department team, Mr. Naveen, manager, and uh, my secretaries and physician assistants, Nagaraju and others. Branding team from, uh, from Kim's, Amit, Sujeta, purchase department, Mr. Kalyan. FNB team, they have provided wonderful uh, food for all of us. Housekeeping, IT department, transport and maintenance, front office people, and uh, security team, and account, accounts department, HOD, Mr. Rajender, and uh, uh, special thanks to all the sponsors. Uh, IPCA has been very supportive, followed by Hetero Group. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. Then other people like uh, other companies, Sun Pharma, JNJ, Novartis, Redis. Cipla, Pfizer, Vaso Organics, Torrent, and Amazon. So, once again, thank you all for uh, making this uh, CRC 22 very, very successful. And uh, you know, video link is shared with all of you. This will be available, available forever. As long as we are here, your presentations, whatever you are you are done. Everything will be in available on YouTube. You must have seen 2019 one is available, now 2022. Whatever work you have done here it, on this dais is available on the YouTube. Please share in your groups. Thank you. And also special thanks to media. They are not here now. But yesterday, they gave a good coverage in all the main newspapers. Sir, anyone um, from senior faculty would like to have a few words? Sir, I didn't complete. I wanted to say one more thing. Sharat. Since it is a CRC, oh, was eight minute delay. CRC, I think that this rapid fire thing, it was too rapid because we normally are very rapid also. So I think that instead of if you can replace that with uh, say something like a spotter kind of a picture with two questions and one small paragraph discussion, that will be good. The other thing is, you know, there's a tendency for diagnosing uh, cause-effect relationship very drastically. You know, if my refrigerator got spoiled after COVID or I, my mobile phone got spoiled after COVID vaccine, I will attribute that as a cause. That tendency is, is, is too much. So cause-effect relationship is not so simple and so straight like that. So that is something also to be... Otherwise, it's a very good, uh, very good exercise. It's a very good initiative. And I think with every time it passes, it improves with time. So 
I think your initiative, I wish all the success for future. Sharath, it was absolutely wonderful, I can tell you. Uh, all these two days, how they passed. An amazing energy you have. Your team, of course, you have team, but I am seeing you. We have all done this job, but you have a tremendous energy. And you are still smiling. Yes. And, uh, and keep accommodating our request for many things. Thank you so much. Fantastic conference. And I, especially for youngsters, I can tell you, probably it's not that I, when, when I made that video and I sent to you, it was from my heart. Actually, I, it was, I just got two minutes to make it in my office. So I have, this is the second time I am attending. So it's a great learning, not only for youngsters, for us also. And then we know how little we know sitting on the front seat. So it's a great learning. And probably this is the only clinical conference in the purely clinical conference in the uh, in the country great keep it up thank you sir now the uh, uh, ready uh, no, we have yeah, first and second you can announce for third we have a tie so only those uh, i will just give one question and uh, in that one question you are just whoever raises the hand first and answers correctly uh, we get the prize but if you answer wrong Prize man, then prize money will go to the disasters. No, 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 no. They tie up, tie, tie, tie break. Yes, both of you stand. Both of you. Okay, so all the Thai questions will be more or less will be those GK questions. Uh, you got to raise your hands. So this famous American singer, songwriter and act. Okay, Dr. Manikandan? Wrong. Disqualified. So she was actually diagnosed to have preclinical lupus. Where are my quotations gone in this? Okay, so she actually declared it like this. I do not have it, but I have been told that I have a tendency to, I mean, but I, something like that, she is not manifesting it. But she has been diagnosed with a condition and her grandmother died of renal lupus. Her mother died of renal lupus. So it's actually preclinical lupus is what we're talking about. All right. Okay. So Dr. Manikandan is disqualified. Now we have Dr. Monica who is not here. Dr. John and uh, Dr. Ashraya. Right. Second question. You want it to be a funny one? Okay, so this I think the faculty would be knowing because all of you have done very well, so that is why. Dr. Brooke Goldner is a doctor in US diagnosed with lupus. What is her recommendation to USDA for treatment of lupus? A. 10 hours of physical exercise, photo protection with SPF 50 sunscreens, plant based diet with avoidance of meat, eggs, and dairy, and treatment of preclinic disease. I think all the faculty know this. <laughs> It was forwarded by Dr. Arul and Dr. Padmanabha Shinoy and somebody else, Dr. Dharmanan sir. He, they... So to who? Question two. Three of them. Nobody is raising their hands. Yes. See. Ah, correct. So she is just keeping on advocating plant-based plant -based diet with avoidance of milk, eggs and dairy. And she is actually a patient who was diagnosed to have, I think, childhood lupus. And later on, she went on to develop, all, I mean, to do all medical school and then she is a doctor. And uh, she keeps on saying that she was having a very tough time, but after she shifted on to plant-based diet, 
she was absolutely normal. All right, you don't have to take that, but this is just a GK question. It was yesterday circulated in the faculty group, that's all. Okay, so we have the third prize for Dr. Aishwarya Ji. The winner of the... Aishwarya is third prize. Thank you, Dr. Ruchika. And, uh, yeah, Madam, just, Madam. So, winner, first winner. There. Correct, no? The winner, uh, the first prize goes to Ramya Sri. You have to run. The second prize goes to Chirag Rajkumar. And third prize, Dr. Aishwarya. To save the time, we'll take a one single photograph. I request senior faculty to come and encourage the, the winners, please. A quick photograph. Check me up. Congrats. I request all the former people, please join us for a quick photograph. Please call your colleagues, please. Naveen. A special thanks to volunteers uh, that are from Form D, finally students, please come on the dais, we'll have a quick photograph, then followed by my department, Navin.
वंदे राम के में ले ले ना फॉर्म दे ये फॉर्म दे मैं दे Yeah. 